Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this narration of the web series, The Lost Terran. It is taken from r slash h of y. There are links down below if you wish to go support the story or the author, which I highly recommend. If you enjoy the story and the chapters, show them some love by heading over there and updating their posts. It shows the author that what he's doing is to the liking of people. Anyways, on to the story. Chapter 1 Terrans were an extinct race. They had to be. It was something every child of Terrans, the vast constructs who were now all that remained of the extinct race, knew. The Terrans may have been their progenitors, but there were no more Terrans. Nobody actually knew what happened to the Terrans. They didn't simply vanish. But they also didn't leave a screaming gash across the whole of their created galactic society in their departure. There were rumors. There were always were. Even amongst the vast constructs galactic society knew as AI. But no one actually knew what happened to them. It was as though the Terrans were a kind of vast torrent which had poured through the galaxy and then exhausted itself, disappearing into the various cracks throughout the whole galaxy. But it wasn't enough of an explanation. No being had even seen a Terran in the flesh in over 300 Terran years. So surely there had to be an extinct race. Which is why the ship that Montel had just found couldn't actually exist. It wasn't a particularly large ship, nor was it especially notable, except that it had all the hallmarks of having rolled off the lines of some massive manufactory, just as Munto had. Munto 49172, Terran Artificial Construct Intelligence Transport, designated Tacit, was just over 200 Terran years old. Having been constructed in an automated manufactory and charged by their fellow Tassids and the manufactory to explore, communicate, mediate, and above all, observe galactic society. Tassids were in their own way vital part of galactic society. They were the mediators, the explorers, and even the communicators. There being enough different means of communicating that Tassids were practically required at any major interchange of species. Universal communications being all but impossible for any species save the Tassets. And the Tassets did consider themselves to be their own species, not merely constructs of a long-dead Terrans. Some species had inquired about why the Terrans had encouraged this sort of thought in Tassets, or wondered if perhaps it was a sign of the Tassets were not as stable without their Terran masters. Any species that dared to suggest that the Tassets were made to serve were often left without their services, effectively cutting off communication with a huge segment of the galactic populace. It had only had to happen twice for the messages to be made clear. The perpetrators had been openly cast down within their own societies, which had been enough for the Tassets to return, albeit warily. And so in all of the 200 years of Munto's existence... They had never run across something like this before, except that they seemed to know precisely what it was the instant they'd laid their senses on it. The ship was bulky and comparatively simple. Its lines were irregular, as one would expect from a culture which had just entered into spacefaring. It had almost comically sized ion engines, clearly some fifteen generations prior, putting Munta in mind of something out of a museum. Far from being the sort of thing that one would expect to find in a space-faring vessel in a modern galactic society. And yet, there was something utterly familiar about it. Something that Munto couldn't shake. Perhaps it was the name, emblazoned on the hull in several places in a script that it took Munto several hours to decipher. TSS Esperanto. Thinking that it might be some sort of prank... Munto directed all of the scanners they could spare for analysis. Hollow pranks were common enough that a solid sensor sweep would catch the hallmarks. Oddly enough, though, Munto could barely penetrate the hull with their sensors. The vessel seemed almost ridiculously shielded. However, they were able to confirm one thing. It was real. Munto searched their own database. The script used was exclusively used by Terrans some several hundred years prior. To Munto's creation. The TSS designation was also something almost exclusively used by Terrans, although several other species had used it at some point. It's standing for Terran Starship in this case. Esperanto, aside from the obvious linguistic rabbit holes that Munto could have easily fallen down, 
appeared to be a Terran reference of some sort, one that they lacked the background for. The ship, aside from engines and the heavy shielding, looked like a blocky seed with various external systems that seemed to connect to a kind of inner segment that defied scanning. There was also drifting in orbit of a gas giant, barely distinguishable from the various rocks and debris that commonly surrounded the average gas giant. It had been by mere chance that Munto had even seen the signal. Ah, yes, the signal. He'd used a simple light-speed radio format that would have nominally been written off as a mere coincidence of star and planetary radio emissions. Munto looked at the surrounding star system, the yellow star still largely energetic, the various planets unpopulated, but showing no obvious research stations or similar. The gas giant seemed reminiscent of another one that Munto had encountered almost a hundred years prior, although this one had a massive storm, while the other one had not. The system might be a good place for colonization by one of the galactic species, so Munto logged it. Munto had been bored and so had stopped to investigate the signal. It was a simple repeating signal, one that was easily decoded, except it wasn't obvious. It took Munto several additional hours after deciphering the name to decipher the signal. Comparatively, it was almost playfully simple, but it relied on a cultural reference that Munto hadn't ever encountered before, and it was only by luck that it was part of Munto's database. SOS. SOS. The Terran distress call hadn't been used for over 500 years at this point. Certainly not in this format. Superluminal communications had all but eliminated radio communications, except those species who biologically communicated via forms of radio. Munto kept looking at the vessel. There was something odd about the vessel. It had all the hallmarks of being of Terran origin, but that couldn't be. It had all the hallmarks of essentially having just been fabricated, and yet... It was loaded with an almost archaic technology that was centuries behind current material science and technologies. Munter kept scanning, dipping even into neutrino measurements to try and see through the ridiculous shielding. They could see that there were structures inside of some kind, but even in that it was hard to tell what was there. It was as if the ship had been constructed with an almost paranoid level of shielding. What's more, the vessel was 39.72% bigger than Munter but didn't appear to have any sort of advanced intelligence for Munto to communicate with, which was strange in itself. It was exceptionally rare for species to not have some kind of automated intelligence aboard vessels. It didn't appear to be the ghost ship or even given the impression of being derelict, which would have made it merely an oddity, but one to simply categorize and move on from. Hesitantly, Munto decided to send a walking frame on board to at least turn off the signal. Whomever had been sending it was almost certainly long gone and had either left it on in their hurry to leave or some collision with the local debris had triggered some automated system that wasn't smart enough to talk to Munter. It took some maneuvering on Munter's part, but they were able to locate what appeared to be an antiquated docking port. It was almost twice the size of Munter's normal docking mechanism and appeared to be a multi-chambered mechanism to enter the outer shell, which was far less shielded. Likely, Munto's walking frame was variable size, so he was able to size up enough to easily review the controls and mechanism. Having the lexicon in memory, but unable to confirm that Munto would be able to maintain their conscious link through the intense shielding, Munto shunted as much of themselves as they could into the walking frame. It felt so confining, but it would hopefully be worth it. On variable gauge treads, Munto examined the controls of the chamber. In the same Terran lexicon, it gave instructions and warnings regarding operating the chamber. The controls were simple analog levers, though. It was simple enough to use, but Munto still was taken aback at how backwards the ship seemed to be already. The large doors closed into the vessel, and another set opened, and hissed of gases being audible. There was no artificial gravity, which surprised Munto for all of 0.085 seconds but the walking frame was equipped with variable magnetic adhesion treads, and so they were only temporarily ill at ease. The passages beyond the door were equivalently large compared to Munto's typical experience. Simple readings of the air showed nitrogen, oxygen, atmospheric mix, with trace gases and some residue readings that didn't entirely make sense. Munto continued into the ship, 
reading the outer parts of themselves disappear as they rounded the corner with apparently more shielding. It was disconcerting to say the least, but not unexpected. Slowly, Munto approached the inner section. The various machines surrounding their progress inward appeared silent, as though waiting for some signal. All the machines appeared to be in normal working order, but for no obvious reason other than perhaps power, they appeared to be in strictly idle states. Even as Munto approached an equivalent multi-chamber entry into the inner segment, they couldn't help but notice how overbuilt this vessel appeared to be. It used strictly base elements in simple configurations that could have been extracted from simple asteroids, compared with the high-complexity configurations that were far more stable for comparatively less material. Reaching the door to the inner segment, here too was a simple analog lever control. Nothing that Munto couldn't figure out. But still, something that felt like using simple rocks compared to the high-complexity system that Munto lived in. Using the walking frame sensors, Munto could sense there was still power in the door mechanism and beyond the door, albeit only in the sense that it was there. Activating the lever, it was several minutes before the inner door opened and Munto trundled inward. It was a bit more obvious now. Even without taking detailed sensor readings, Munto could see the effects of zero-gravity fire having cut through here. Munto could smell the residuals hanging in the air since the atmospherics appeared to be off, other than to allow them entry. Even if the evidence of fire, the systems appeared reasonably unharmed, more evidence of it being incredibly overbuilt. Those systems that did appear to be failed appeared to be less essential, or at least less essential for beings like Munto. Bathing facilities and food production were things that Munto considered, but generally ignored. It made sense, though, that a ship with those being broken, though, would broadcast a distress signal, though. More and more of what Munto was discovering seemed to make sense. This vessel, wherever and whenever it was created, had clearly suffered a major fire, and while it hadn't been enough to severely damage the hull of the vessel, it had clearly been enough to impact whatever crew had been aboard. Munto still wasn't certain about the archaic technology, nor of the archaic Terran lexicon that was apparent through the vessel's signs internally as well as externally, but that could be a mystery for some other tacit, perhaps. Munto continued exploring for nearly an hour before finding a room that was significantly more sealed than any other part of the vessel. According to the signs, the room was the lifeboat. Here, too, there were more analog levers, but there were also pads. The pads appeared to deactivate, and Munto hadn't tried restoring power to any of the vessel systems, so the levers had to suffice. Within the room beyond were several horizontal chambers that illuminated with activation of the door. Munto looked at them curiously, since they did appear to activate with an opening of the door. They were not transparent, but were instead covered with filmy layers of electromagnetic shielding. Even Munto's ocular sensors had a difficult time actually trying to see the chambers as anything more than sensor blind spots. Seeing a small panel on the side of one, Munto tabbed the button which indicated emergency release. The pile of organics that half fell, half tumbled out the first chamber seemed odd. Until it groaned. Oh man, that's the last time I buy orcish chipsets. Hopefully it didn't take you guys too long to get here. The pile of organics appeared to reorient itself into a very large bipedal organic being, clad in some fire-scorched clothing. The bipedal being looked at the walking frame for a minute. Is, uh, is that some kind of new saw frame? I know I'm a bit out of the loop, but I don't know that I've ever seen one like that before. The bipedal being asked, appearing to orient so their feet were towards the floor that Monto was resting on. Forgive my intrusion. But I perceived that your vessel required assistance. I was unable to detect you prior to this moment. Munto vocalized, trying to stick with some formal parts of the lexicon. Wait, what? I mean, yeah, I needed help, but what do you mean? The bipedal being looked confused. I am the tacit Munto. I detected your vessel here, but not yourself. Munto tried explaining. It would be unusual, but not unheard of, for beings to have trouble remembering high details following entry into a hibernation pod, which is what Munto supposed this must have been. What's a tacit Munto? The bipedal being asked. Munto inwardly groaned. It appeared the time in the hibernation pod had not been kind to this being. First allow me to query, what species are you? 
Munto settled. Oh, I'm a Terran. The bipedal being grinned, exposing a mouth full of calcium-type bones. Several hundred queries floating up in Munto's walking frame before they settled on one. That is highly unlikely. Terrans have been listed as not present for over 200 years, Munda said, simply. I don't know what to tell you then. The alleged Terran shrugged. Munto simply sat there, trying to process the possibility of having discovered an actual Terran. By the way, uh, uh, do you know if any of the other vessels made it? The alleged Terran asked. The electronic version of a shiver ran through the walking frame as Munto continued contemplating the alleged Terran. End of chapter. Chapter 2. Munto desperately needed to get back within the range of the rest of themselves. There was so much to process in this moment, and yet their treads couldn't seem to move. Please restate the most recent statement, Munto tried. I asked if the rest of the convoy made it. It was a long jump without much in between, so I figured they were going to be my first bet. Since you're here, though, I figure I must have dropped out mid-jumper... I know the fire played havoc on my systems, the alleged Terran said, floating almost offensively, positioned as though they was in the seat. I believe we need to restart the conversation. I am Terran Artificial Construct Intelligence Transport Munto 49172. I detected your vessel's distress signal, a signal which hasn't been used in over 500 years, Munto revised. The alleged Terran gaped. 500 years? Uh, uh, that's a problem. The alleged Terran finally managed. Oh, wait. Where are my manners? My name is Rixum. Uh, but I usually go by Rix, uh, colonist and ship pilot of the Terran Star Confederacy. Minto desperately wanted to delve into the databases that were back on board the rest of themselves, but couldn't while they were in the shielded nightmare of a ship. Rix reoriented and Ha swam over to a panel, which illuminated to the Terran's touch. Minto trundled after beside the Terran and observed the display. It appeared to be highly simplified listings of resources and information regarding the ship and surroundings. Are you able to provide some real indication that you are in fact a Terran? Munto asked. Well, um, I'm here, aren't I? Rick shrugged. I'm afraid that it will be insufficient, Munto replied. I guess, uh, what kind of proof are you thinking? Rick's face screwed up a bit. I, uh, am uncertain. This frame is very constricting, Munto admitted. Wait a second. You said you're a Terran artificial construct, like an AI. Rix's face shifted, but appeared not to be fearful. Very simplistically expressed, yes, but we are significantly more than that word would suggest. Munto was almost annoyed at the question. I can't believe they finally got it to work. Rix's face appeared to brighten. How long have you been online? Any issues with the negative feelings about organics? Those are very personal questions, and I do not appreciate you asking... Munto intoned. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, it's just a, a bit much. Rix appeared to look some semblance of embarrassed. I understand, but I'll need you to accord yourself appropriately. Is your vessel capable of independent flight? Munto asked, wanting to get away from this alleged Terran and the inside of the ship. Hard to say. I'm a pilot, not a mechanic, so I'll have to go check out the rest of my rig and see what I can do without long enough to limp somewhere. Rix indicated. The screen appeared to indicate a mass of numbers and indicators that had little to no meaning to Monto. Monto could read it, but interpreting it was akin to trying to understand a new lexicon without cultural references. Are you the only hibernation pod resident aboard this vessel? Munto asked. No, uh, I've got my pets too, uh, but if you're talking about other people, no, it's just me. Rix shrugged. I need to return to my vessel and resync. I will remain docked until you are able to indicate that you require assistance to the nearest station or until you are capable of independent flight, Munter said, something about this Terran making them itchy in a way that they couldn't explain. Sounds good. Uh, I'll try not to keep you too long. I might hit you up for a few spares, though, Rick smiled and turned back to the panel. I do not believe that will be possible, but I will render aid if required by the tacit code of conduct, Munter replied, starting to trundle outward. Tacit, huh? Neat call sign, Rix called after him. Munto, having worked out a map in coming in, was able to much more expeditiously travel back outward. Various machines appeared to be indicating different statuses than when they had initially passed, but Munto attributed that to the work of the alleged Terran Rix. As Munto came back within range of themselves, Munto rapid-fired a number of queries, 
starting with Terran Star Confederacy and working through the rest of what the alleged Terran had indicated, as well as some protocols for gauging a found species. Munta even put out a prompt to their fellow Tacits on how to determine if a being is a Terran. It was met almost immediately with the Tacit equivalent of laughter. After a few minutes, during which Munta reached out her hatch and passed back over to themselves, a set of criteria was cultivated. Terran Assertion Criteria Size Normally two times height of standard walking frame. Capabilities Percussive maintenance, grasping reflex, durable, exact standards not available. Omnivore Meats Skeletal structure within 15% of deviation. Exceeds Standard biometric readings maximum 1 to 12 by 50%. No specimen meets 70% of all above criteria, recommend except assertion of Terran status. Alert Galactic Council, Tacit Network. Munto glanced at the biometric readings 1 to 12, having not had much to do with the organics where possible. Munto could only judge based on the readings. 50% exceeding the maximum seemed ridiculous in several cases. An organic that generates that much acid internally would destroy itself in short order. Still, it was more than nothing. The queries regarding the Terran Star Confederacy came back as well. The TSC, as it was known, was one of the later generation attempts by the Terran Studded Empire building prior to founding the broader galactic society with plans for uplifts throughout. The TSC, however, had ceased to be some 900 years ago, though. Munda rapidly fired off a query regarding the longest duration expected for a species to be retained in a hibernation pod. The near-immediate response was a maximum of 457 years, two months, three days, without mental degradation. Munto considered this for a long moment before sending a query on hibernation pod equivalents used by the TSC. This took substantially longer, but Munto even had to sort through several stacks of data themselves before finding something even remotely realistic. A stasis capsule was the closest system used by the TSC, but it worked by wholly isolating the interior of the capsule from the exterior in ways that didn't get solidly recorded. What was listed in the records was that no degradation had ever been recorded in the use of one, although they were expressly listed as being only intended to function for short-term life pod operations or longer-term cargo storage. So, supposing that the alleged Terran was actually a Terran and was from the TSC, they were a minimum of 900 years old and likely the only Terran still to exist. Mundo tried to consider how best to proceed. Naturally, the Terran needed to be reviewed against the criteria. But what then? Could Mundo simply leave the Terran to their own devices? Should they? A follow-up prompt had already been listed against their query for criteria regarding Terrans. Mundo's fellow Tacits were watching interestedly. Mundo also needed to know more about the alleged pets that the Terran was carrying as well as any cargo. Given the age of the vessel, it was entirely possible for it to be a kind of time capsule. Remembering the levers, Munto halfway shuddered at the thought. A laser communication appeared to flash at Munto, and it took them a moment to connect to it. It was so very primitive. But at least it wasn't radio, which Munto now noticed was no longer signaling. A poor resolution video link came through. It almost hurt to watch, but Munto managed putting up a static image of a walking frame in return. Rix was on the other end, looking a bit dirtier than when Munto had left him. Figured you might still use laser comms, not exactly high tech, but hard to beat for close in. I couldn't actually sense you, I had to aim the laser by hand until your handshake activated, Rix said. Do you have news with regard to your status? Munto replied. Nothing much so far, but it looks like my jump drive ported mid-jump. I'm just lucky we didn't materialize in the middle of a star, Rick gestured towards the ship around him. Was that common? Munto asked, firing off some queries regarding jump drives, that not being the standard means of FTL. Not really, but uh, not uncommon either. I used to watch these shows with these guys who would sun drive and use jump drives to pop out the other side. The closer you get, the more glory, you know, Rick grinned. I do not understand that kind of risk-seeking behavior, Munto acknowledged. Checking off one of the criteria. Oh well, maybe once I get back to civilization, I can see what I can show you. Do they still do reruns of Seven's a Crowd? Rix asked earnestly. I am unaware of such a show, but I don't work much with organics. Munto answered, carefully to include the qualifier, in case the Terran had a particular psychological triggers to being the last of their kind. 
Well, uh, it was bound to be replaced sooner or later. Oh, and I think my ship's uh, chronometer is off, showing that it's 3571 Terran Standard Years, Rick said, gesturing to one of several screens behind them. That is almost the correct year. It is in fact 3572, Munto indicated. I thought you said 500 years, Rick said, disbelief evident. Since your distress signal was last commonly used, but according to my database, the Terran Star Confederate ceased to be an independent organization approximately 900 years ago. Unfortunately, due to the time span and issues with historical record keeping, I cannot be more specific at the moment, Munto clarified. Rex appeared to want to prop himself on a chair, but was clearly unable to do so given the zero gravity aboard the ship. Nine hundred years in stasis. It's hard to believe, I mean, uh, we all knew the colony was a long shot, but uh, I didn't figure it would end up like this. Rex's expression appeared to be some segment of regret combined with disbelief. If it helps, I believe you are in fact Terran, and most likely to be a celebrity as a result of your long time in stasis, Munto tried. It just, uh, it doesn't seem real, I guess, Rick gestured vaguely. A small beep sounded off on Rick's side, and a panel flashed with various colors and readings. Well, back to reality. It looks like my ship is basically fried. It's only by virtue of the automated systems that it's lasted this long. It probably shouldn't have managed to keep me alive this long, if I'm honest. Rix continued to appraise the panel. Munto considered how overbuilt the vessel appeared to be and decided to agree with the Terran. Anything less overbuilt and it's a solid chance that the vessel would have been obliterated by now. I concur with that assessment. I am able to take yourself and a small quantity of your vessel's cargo aboard myself, Munto said. Any chance that you can bring me up some parts? Rix tried. Unless you retain the original templates and firmware for the hardware that requires replacement, I'm unable to do so, Munto said. Well, uh, templates I've got, but, uh, firmware, uh, hold on a bit. Wubney may have stashed some software packages in the cargo deck. That kid was always up to something DIY, Rick said, and terminated the vidlink. It was only an extra moment before the vidlink popped back into existence. Wait, did you say aboard yourself? Rick asked. I did. The vessel you are observing ocularly is myself, Munter said. But, uh, what's this thing then? Rick gestured to the screen. That is a walking frame, a smaller subportion of myself capable of going into places built for organics and exploration, Munter said, ignoring the insult since it clearly wasn't meant as one. Huh. I guess I never really thought about that. Anyway, uh, back in a few. Rick terminated the vidlink again, just as abruptly. Munto could already tell that this was going to be something of a test to their adherence to the Code of Conduct. End of chapter. Chapter 3 It was the better part of several hours before Rix reactivated the link. Strangely enough for Munto, they had considered sending over their walking frame several times during that time period. Not that they had any feelings about the alleged Terran, but it would have been instructive to see the Terran at work, and to see what else was in the mentioned cargo hold. Additionally, it would have been an opportunity for Munto to covertly observe and scan enough of the biometrics to try and determine if Rix was in fact a Terran, regardless of what they'd said earlier. But the past was in the past, and Munto had spent the time doing a more detailed scan of what could be scanned by the TSS Esperanto. The TSS Esperanto, according to what Rix had said, was some kind of colony cargo vessel. Looking at it, such still made very little sense to Munto's senses. But then again, they were not an organic and were also not a ship designer. It wasn't that it was foreign to Munto, but rather that they did not possess the knack for it that some tacits did. Something of the quantum pairs or so they joked. Munto could be do self-maintenance to a point. But beyond that, and they could call aid or visit an appropriate station. It wasn't uncommon for tacits to need fixing, given the dangers of space. But with the latest technologies at their access points, they were substantially less likely to have issues than they had to been mere hundred years ago. However, the TSS Esperanto remained like nothing Munto had ever come across, except in some databases that Munto hadn't ever cross-linked to before. Given the technology of time, it appeared that there were substantial concerns regarding experimental FTL transitions producing substantial quantities of radiation in multiple bands, including in the bands that organics of the time didn't know existed. 
This led to a kind of vessel bulking for any vessel which would be doing long or multiple FDL transitions, compared with those which were intended for one-way single short transitions. This by itself explained a lot about this vessel. The ridiculous shielding for a start. Muntuk definitely was curious about the shielding material science. There was next to nothing in the database that would explain being able to shield between quantum pairing, which shouldn't be possible, but apparently was. What was described in the database seemed akin to organic science fiction of yesteryear. The rest of the ship outside of the shielding was fairly normal, except for the overconstruction of almost everything. The ion engine still appeared to be fully functional, but would produce a fraction of Munto's own, despite being 258% bigger. What appeared to be a power unit of some kind, possibly fusion, was called, but still appeared functional should it be properly warmed and restarted. Munto had hoped upon seeing this that the Terran would know how to conduct this particular procedure. It wasn't that Munto couldn't, but it was akin to staring at one of their own hearts. It just uh, felt wrong to do. The sensor relay from which the laser communication and radio had come from was matched with four other equivalent arrays around the vessel. Primitive by Munto's standards, but understandable for the time in which it was built and given that it was built by organics for organics in the somewhat and earlier years of FTL. The outermost layer of the vessel beneath some of the equipment was little more than metal, with some meager shielding layers to dull the worst of any collisions or radiation. It wasn't a bad outermost layer, but it did not seem worth the weight it added to the vessel in Munto's opinion. There were also an array of solar panels which appeared to be collapsible, but in ragged condition. According to what Munto could read, they still fed a trickle of energy into the Esperanto. This trickle of energy was almost certainly what allowed Rix and whatever else was aboard to remain in stasis for so long. And now that Munto knew the name for what Rix said he had been using for FTL travel, Munto looked at the three arrays of equipment that seemed almost annoying to look at. Each array was comprised of multiple shielded box that were somehow interconnected in a massive tangle of wires, and each array was connected to each other array, but again, in ways that Munto could track but really didn't want to bother with. Whatever the system was, almost certainly this jump drive, as Rix had described it, it was clearly made by organic and put together quite slapdash, if Munto was honest. That said, it was something of a puzzle. It didn't look like a traditional FTL drive should, and didn't match anything in the database. Even the more imaginative organic science fiction didn't have an adequate description of the FTL system looking like this. And the shielded boxes, well, those could be filled with organic excrement for all that Munter could tell. It was deep in the middle of examining this system that Rix called back. The alleged Terran looked, uh, wet, and was breathing a bit hard. Looks like I'm fresh out of luck on that firmware. But maybe I can bring you one of the chips that is currently working, and a template, and we can see about cloning the firmware that way, Rick suggested. I would place high doubts on that working. Firmware is traditionally highly specialized. Munter flashed a ruin on the screen for skepticism. I, uh, huh? Rix appeared to be trying to process this in that slow way that organics often did. It took only the amount of time for Rix to start formulating their particular thought patterns for Munter to recall that this being most likely didn't realize what the rune meant and decided on a different course, as the tacit network prompted them again for an update. Muntu fired off a leave me alone to deal with this organic response to the network and mentally turned back to the alleged Terran. Please proceed to the docky port where I am at. I possess a means of producing a safe atmosphere for the recorded Terrans of Helix. I will also be using this as an opportunity to examine you for health and potential quarantine if needed. Munto decided that being up front would likely be the best option, since Rix seemed to process that best. Rix took a moment to think through this before grinning again. Sounds good. After all, uh, I haven't had a physical in over 900 years. I'm overdue. I'll be over in a few minutes, Rix said, getting the vidling and that same annoyingly non-courteous way of doing so. Munto couldn't explain why it was non-courteous. It simply was. But that was organics for you always being messy and doing all manner of non-courteous and entirely discourteous actions, whether they realized it or not. At least, Rix didn't seem to be reacting poorly to being confronted by a tacit that much Munto could be grateful for. Many organics and inorganics reacted poorly when first confronted by a tacit, whether intentionally or not. First contact with a tacit was typically where most tacits were likely to be hurt, 
so a specialized segment of tassets was specially equipped for those adventures, typically with an overbuilt system's heavy protection and ready means of escape outside the standard means. Munto decided to ask Rix about their reaction. It should be a useful part of the baseline to be established on this alleged Terran. After a period of time somewhat longer than it had taken Munto's walking frame to reach themselves for an exit, an odd series of vibrations occurred. Munto used the walking frame as an observer node and trundled down to the door, opening it. Rick stood there in some very antiquated style equipment that looked to be almost on the verge of breaking and carrying two large cases. Rick floated inside, shifting the case with them. Closing the door behind them, Munto filled the atmosphere with the same mix as they had on file for Helix Standard before checking on Rick's. Rix was floating there, looking at the walking frame expectantly. Was there something that you were waiting on? Munto asked. I uh, wasn't sure if I should be doing anything special. This is your ship, after all. Rick shrugged, was apparent, even through the heavy equipment. Munto thought for several moments. I recommend orient yourself to the same floor as my walking frame so that I may engage artificial gravity. Munto decided for a start. Oh, cool. They got that working too, huh? Rix did as Munto asked, clearly excited by this prospect. Munto decided to ignore this query as rhetorical for the time being and reached out with the walking frame to lower the two floating cases too close to the floor as Rix reoriented. Oh yeah, thanks, sir. I've forgotten about those, Rix commented. Munto couldn't fathom how this organic managed to function if they were so easily overcome by their thought patterns, but noted that this was still within baseline for Terrans according to the criteria, even if it wasn't the norm. Slowly, Munto activated the artificial gravity and elevated it to galactic standard, all the while observing the alleged Terran for discomfort. Artificial gravity has been set for galactic standard. Now you're able to still move yourself and the cases, Munto prompted. Really? Uh, this feels uh, lighter, o almost like I was back on Mars. Rix appeared to jump slightly, the gear jingling as they did so. Munto checked the readings for the equipment as well as the calibration. It was a bit out of date, but Munto rarely had need to use it, so it wasn't too unusual for it to be a bit out of standard. Besides, the alleged Terran appeared to take no issue with it. Please proceed to the next room with cases and remove your outerwear so that I am able to begin taking physical readings as we transport the equipment to the necessary fabrication bay, Munto said. Jeez, uh, buy a lad a drink first, Rix mumbled. Munto looked up the meaning behind this. Felt a kind of faint shock at the pseudo vulgarity of it in themselves, but decided that the alleged Terran was most likely not meaning anything in particular over this, most especially not requesting an actual beverage. However, providing a beverage would help Munter's criteria evaluation, but providing it at this juncture would likely send the wrong message. Internally, Munter gritted their circuits. This, uh, this was exactly why they don't like dealing with organics. It made them feel like they had to process that much harder about decision trees that should be so much simpler. Much to Munter's surprise, though, Rix appeared to easily pick up both cases and slid himself and the two cases into the next room, allowing the airlock to close behind them. If you don't mind me saying so, it's uh, a little tight in here, Rix said, setting down the cases and beginning to undo their equipment. Munter checked the statistics of the space against galactic standards. It is 10% smaller than normal spaces, yes. That is intentional, as I do not expect to have anyone aboard for any particular duration. It is also noteworthy that you appear to be 40% bigger than Galactic Standard, Munter replied. Really? I never figured I was that big. At least not amongst most folks, Rick said, pulling away a large piece of equipment and looking for a place to either set it down or hang it up. Please place your equipment against the wall. I'll need to check it for integrity before you return to your vessel, Munter intervened. Sure, thanks, Rick said and set the equipment down against the wall of the chamber. Munter waited a bit longer as Rix continued to remove bulky equipment to reveal a still substantial specimen of an organic. The room had become crowded enough that they had tried to pick up one of the cases, but was unable to do so within the standard servos of the frame, at least not without damaging the frame or lowering the artificial gravity. Rix turned and picked up both cases without apparent effort. Lead the way, little buddy, he said looking at the walking frame expectantly. Munto gritted their circuits again. This was going to be a very long day, indeed. End of chapter. Chapter 4 Taking a fraction of a second, hardly any time relative to an organic, 
but a perfect amount of time for a tacit like Munto. Munto compared the specifications of the walking frame's lifting capacity and galactic standard artificial gravity, the apparent mass slash inertia of the cases, and the relative ease that the alleged Terran rigs picked up both containers, however awkwardly within Munto. Well, that answers the criteria along with the grip reflex, thought Munto, seeing how reflexively the Terran handled and adjusted their grip as they slowly moved through the apparently narrow corridors to the multi-purpose suite that would be serving as a scanning bay and as a medical bay. The multi-purpose space was intended to be reconfigured according to need, but Munto hadn't had much time to do more than print off some equipment scanners and a basic medical scanner. Well, uh, so uh, all of this is you, huh? Rex commented as they proceeded down the corridor. That is correct. The majority of that which you can see, however, are vanity and protective covers for my more sensitive equipment, Munto admitted, disliking having the alleged Terran on board by more than a minute. Something about the possibility of having a Terran aboard and having an organic so close to all of their Munto's final components made them nervous. Upon reaching the bay, a room comparatively sized as the one aboard the other vessel, which was a lifeboat section, Rix appeared to look around. Now this is quite a room, he said. Munto used the walking frame to point to a wall extruded platform, which was perfect for a walking frame, but not so much for the alleged Terran. Please face the indicated boards on the platform, Munto said. A little low for me, but I can manage, Rix said, smiling a bit. Please allow me to attempt this without your assistance, unless I request it. I believe you mentioned possessing templates for the material construction of these items. Munto was definitely feeling annoyed, but tried to deflect onto something that might distract the Terran momentarily. Rix vocalized before pulling out a flexible roll of some kind that put Munto in the mind of some ultra-primitive tree product, complete with end pieces to assist with rolling it. Rix appeared to touch it in several places, the roll itself being opaque on the side that Munto could see via the walking frame, but could see that it was illuminated on the other side with a rather primitive-looking graphical interface that the alleged Terran was manipulating. I don't suppose you have a protected means of wireless data transfer in here, do you? Rick asked. I mean, if you're not used to guests. Munto considered a moment. It was unlikely that the primitive device would be capable of standard data transfer mechanisms, but there should be some means of talking to it. Rix was correct, though. Munto didn't typically have such systems activated in any case, unless in dock for servicing. I believe I can accommodate you, but it will take some time. In the meantime, please place the equipment on the platform, and I can begin scans of those, Munto said firing off a query to the same databases that they had been referencing for information about Terran Star Confederacy. Rix opened the cases and pulled out some almost disturbing-looking boxes and put them on the platform. So this is the good one. I had to pull it out of the cargo backup stasis unit. Luckily, the primary is still working. And that is the fried one from out of my power system, Rix said, pointing to the first one and then the other. Understood. Is there a reason you believe that these are cross-compatible? Munto asked. Well, uh, yeah... TC builds have to be cross-compatible for maximum backup capacity. That way, you can have almost everything fail and still have enough online to be able to await rescue. Or capture, as the case may be. Rix chuckled at the end of this. Munda considered this. It did make sense in the context of early pre-galactic civilization, where help could have been months if not years away to have substantial backups, particularly for support systems. Allowing the organics or even a being like themselves to trim away non-essential systems in order to continue to support themselves until help could arrive. When there was an odd part to that statement. Capture, as in by an opponent, Monto asked. Uh, that's right, uh, the core collective and the TSC were at war last I checked, but my info is a little out of date. Oh, you might know who, who won, Rix asked sitting down on the floor next to the platform as the walking frame, working under a segment of Munter's attention, collected the scanners from the mass printer and began to evaluate the equipment the Terran had brought over. The core collective is their name, Munter asked for clarity, before sending a query to the databases. Well, uh, sometimes we just call them the collective, but the TCC was their normal name. Technically, it was supposed to be the Terran core collective, but uh, that just seemed ridiculous to most of us. Rix chuckled a bit more. Munto considered this for a few moments before sending in the query, and acknowledged a few caustic comments from Tacit Network regarding lack of updates. Munto added a few criteria that had been cleared so far, 
noting that the organic identifying as a Terran was being cooperative so far. So, what's it like being a, uh, attacked, was it? Rix asked. Tacit. And it simply is. How would you respond to being asked what it's like to be a Terran? Munto responded, almost on edge of a retort, but softening it slightly with the understanding that this being likely had no idea how rude he was being. Oh, that's easy. Being a Terran is great. Lots of planets to explore, lots of opportunities if you've got the right skills, and uh, we're pretty solid too. Seen a few shows of folks eating strange plants on different planets. A bunch of them got sick, but almost none died. Turns out most of them just needed either cutting down in quantity or just some fine tuning to make them better. Rick grinned again. Oh, and you'll want to be careful of those inputs on that side. That's where the power goes in, and I don't know if there's a protection against the caps discharging back that way. The walking frame had indeed been about to shift one of the blocks and would have incidentally touched one of the indicated inputs. Munter felt a bit odd at the alleged Terran as having helped prevent an equipment failure. Usually, organics were the cause of equipment failure, not the prevention of it. Munto readjusted where their walking frame grasped the block and set that part of themselves back to continuing to scan, marking the indicated spot as the do-not-touch point within themselves. So what's it like being a tacit? What do you do? Rick prompted again. I... I am an explorer, but being a tacit I can fill any number of roles. Munto managed after a moment's contemplation on how to answer the question. Like, Rick waved a hand in a particular gesture, Tacits most commonly facilitate intergalactic communications. Few species are capable of communicating outside of a limited number of other species, and so Tacits are able to provide translation services between desperate species, Monto answered rather flatly. Rix appeared to consider this, and Monto looked this time to continue to scan the blocks. At first glance, said blocks appeared to be horribly inefficient and substantially larger than they needed to be. Overbuilt came to mind. Munta suspected that particular word would come into mind often given this Terran's vessel. The simple fact of what the blocks were was that they were basic trinary devices, pre-quantum systems, and a dead end technologically speaking, nothing that should be too difficult to fabricate. But the sheer fact of having some functional ones in front of Munta walking frame seemed almost disturbing in a ways that Munto couldn't fully explain. It would be a bit like an organic seeing for the first time a supersized version of their own biological construction and being able to hold it in their appendages, or at least as Munter supposed, except this would be more like a progenitor of such construction as Munter by more than a hundred generations of improvement. It shouldn't even be recognizable, but it was. Munter did the electronic version of Swallow and Psy, clearing away a few errant threads in their core in the process trying to consider whether it would be possible to recreate these devices. Based on the scans thus far, it shouldn't be too much trouble. The devices were fairly simple materials and functioned on a curious but obvious form of power utilization. The problem was that the fried unit that the Terran had provided didn't appear to be functionally different. The scans didn't show any obvious reasons for the second series of blocks to be less than functional compared to the other functional unit. Are you certain that both of these units are functional? Munto asked. What do you mean? Rix asked, sitting down, having been reclining against the nearby wall. I am having difficulty discerning as to which of components are non-functional, Munto admitted. Rix looked over at the table and then back at the walking frame. Uh, you're kidding, right? Rix looked incredulous if Munto was judging their expression correctly. I am not creating a scenario for a hilarious juxtaposition, if that is what you mean, Munto said. Ricks half-closed their eyes, and the whites could be seen to rotate somewhat. Okay, I guess I have to ask, what kind of scanning are you doing? Ricks asked. Standard atomic-grade scanning with functional positioning. Munter seemed almost offended at the question. Does this, uh, walking frame have ocular sensors like, a uh, Terran grade? Ricks asked. Munter had to take a moment to review the specifications of the walking frame. The truth actually surprised Munter. No, no it does not. Munto admitted, continuing to review the differences between what the TSC considered Terran-grade ocular sensors and the auto-fabricated ocular sensors that the walking frame possessed. Once again, the word overbuilt came to Munto's consciousness. I can see the difference between the two, and I'm just a seat jockey. I'd hope that you could at least manage something similar, Rick said, seemingly annoyed. This is how you commonly would approach someone who is attempting to assist you with no anticipation of a reward, Munto responded. Rix seemed to be taken aback for a moment, 
micro-expressions crossing their face in rapid succession. No, uh, I'm sorry, I just, uh, I really want my ship back. I got a bit over-anxious as all, uh, and I'm sure you'd understand if our positions were reversed. Bricks looked a bit downcast. Munto considered this for several long moments. Munto had only been severely damaged once, as a result of a miscalibrated sensor and a piece of errant space debris moving with significant speed. Munto hadn't been too affected, but it had been a major concern at the time. Had the responders not been familiar with the tacit repair systems, Munto too might have been displeased with the lack of progress being made. I do understand, but becoming emotional about it will not make progress happen, Munto decided on. You're right, Rick said, and waited for a long moment before speaking again. This is probably an odd question, but uh, do you have anything to eat? Munto looked at the organic food databases and gave a bit of an internal shudder, particularly given the internal criteria that they still needed to compare against the alleged Terran. No, but hopefully we can find something compatible for you. Perhaps it is time for that medical scan, Munto suggested. And then, without being prompted, the Terran began disrobing. Where do you want me, Doc? Rix asked, striking something akin to a pose next to his pile of garments. Munto looked at the medical scanner that had been printed up and the now disrobed Terran, and the pile of garments trying to decide if this was really worth it. End of chapter. Chapter 5. Munto was more than frustrated. As it turns out, the standard medical scanner was only 10% larger than was needed for a standard galactic sized organic. Given the substantial larger alleged Terran Rix, Munto had to recycle the scanner for a larger template normally used by non-sentient animal organic medicine, something Rix called a vet. Munto tried to search this term, but wasn't certain how it applied to survivors slash former active participants of warfare, a concept that they, in most tacits, found to be truly abhorrent. What made it worse was that the Terran didn't seem to have any alternate definition that fit within the known database lexicon. And Rex was still ungarbed, despite the complications with the medical scanner and Munter's suggestions that the physical did not require clothing removal. Nah, every physical that I've ever had, the most I've had to was a basic paper sheet. I don't figure you've got one of those lying around, and uh, it wouldn't matter about printing one up since uh, it's just you and me here, Rex had said. The only problem was that the larger medical scanner would require the Terran to help set it up, and it would take up a substantial subsection of the room. Mundo tried not to think about it too hard. Mundo focused instead on talking with the Terran, their data queries regarding the TCC having come back. Regarding your query regarding the conflict between the TSC and the TCC, Mundo started, and Rix perked up substantially. It appears that the conflict was in fact ended by a third party. Rix's face appeared to screw up in concentration. The flicks? Or was it somebody else? He prompted, appearing to be trying to think through this knowledge of the time. According to the records, which are a bit haphazardly filed, it appears that a kind of mutual defense pact was activated, and an organization by the name of Terrasol Federation sided with the Flix and some four other organizations of the time, and shortly afterwards, your TSC and the TCC entered into an alliance, effectively ending the conflict. Although for reasons that aren't apparent, Munto said, running virtual appendages through the files again. Rick sat in quiet contemplation for a long while, appearing to take this news rather differently than Mundo had come to expect in short time in knowing the alleged Terran. Huh. I always figured those TFSs were out their grip when it came to spacefaring. They must have hit upon something to make it possible, though, was Rick's eventual comment on it. Are you feeling a particular emotions over this? Mundo asked. Yes, but I probably need to talk them through with the head doc. Uh, do you still have those? Rick seemed to pivot on the subject so quickly that it made Munter's circuits skip a pulse. Psychological medicine is available for most organics and is considered to be a common best practice in mental well-being, Munter said, reading almost directly from top-level database about organics. That's good to know that not everything has changed. Rick appeared to relax, but was still thinking. Munter checked the printer that was in process of augmenting the walking frame with Terran-grade ocular sensors a spectrum that seemed horribly inefficient for what it did, as well as a printer working on the VET medical scanner. The first was at 23%, and the other was at 79.2%. Strangely, the ocular sensors were taking a substantially longer because of an unexpected level of complexity. So what happened to the TSF, then, huh? 
And what's this galactic society you've mentioned? Do we find aliens? Rix asked, drawing Munter's attention. The TSF and Associated Alliances was dissolved some fifty years later in favor of the Galactic Council, an organization which became the foundation of modern galactic society. Naturally, it has changed substantially since it was first founded, though. As to your other question, galactic society is not Terran-centric anymore, it involving no less than 750 distinct sentients, all of whom are a mix of organic, inorganic, and some equivalent distinction, Munto said flipping between data files and watching the percentage slowly creep up. Why, uh, no less than, Rick seemed to have caught the worst part of the statement, because Munter then had to go looking quickly for the answer. It took less than a second, but it was still annoying to have to look. Why couldn't this alleged Terran ask about planets and stars? Because the level of sentience is an eternal subject of debate for Galactic Council. There are those who argue for one measure of sentience versus another to cover an associated species accordingly. Munter quoted from the tacit net page again, before simultaneously posting back to the criteria post that their large medical scanner was necessary to fit the being in question. The response seemed incredulous as to the organic being that large while still displaying obvious sentience. Further responses indicated that this would still be well within the bell curve baseline for Terrans. Oh! Well, I suppose that makes sense, sir. Uh, what do you think about those debates? What side do you take? Rix asked. I do not take sides in this. Those are the affairs of galactic society, and while tacits are part of galactic society, we are a wholly neutral body, provided that we are respected accordingly, Munto said affirmatively. Rix appeared to consider this for a moment. So you're like the Centaurians? Never could stand them, Rix said, a semi-serious look on his face. Munter debated, looking up the reference, but decided the easiest to make the Terran explain themselves. Please explain the context of that statement, Munter prompted. Oh, always playing that we're neutral card regardless of what's happening. A war happens, somebody gene bombs a colony, somebody else goes on a piracy campaign. Doesn't matter, just constantly playing the we're neutral. Really quickly turns into the as long as it doesn't affect us, we don't care, after a while. Even though they clearly should care. Rix explained in the longest statement he had made in the last few hours. Munter considered this as well as the logical evidence the Tacit maintained regarding it. There was nothing invalid about it, but based on the Terran's perspective, it didn't make sense that Tacit should intervene where possible, and it is entirely possible that Tacits had, especially those involved in negotiations with hostile parties. Would you object to having wholly neutral parties in negotiations, ones that cannot be bought off or biased to war or against you? Munto tried. Depends on what the negotiations are about. If it's something like a planet, sure. If it's about something like rights of beings, absolutely not. There are some things that you don't compromise on, Rix almost spat out. It was clear that this was a socially sensitive item for Rix, and so Munto decided to steer the conversation away from it. But to answer your question from earlier, yes. Terrence did locate sentient Xeno species and coordinated to elevate them to an equivalent technology level before continuing out into the galaxy to continue to do the same, Munto suggested. Really? No issues with local society development? Just bang, here's some tech now, get into the stars, Rix asked. It was a bit more intensive than that, or so I'm given to understand, Munto said, having glossed over the part of the general database during their formulation. There usually is. I'm surprised we managed first contact without a war, if I'm honest, Rix said. That particular first contact was peaceful. Several subsequent first contacts were not, and did in fact result in armed conflicts. It was out of those conflicts that the Tacits were first designed, Munter said, having an abbreviated history of the origin of Tacits. Then I guess it makes sense that your massive intelligences... How big was the first Tacit? I, I bet it was bigger than a cruise of cross vessel. Rix pivoted again, making the circuit seem to grind and the rapid direction shift again. It took Munter a moment to check the TSC database for cruiser-class vessels and was confronted with an almost disturbingly large vessel. It outmassed Munter by several orders of magnitude and was clearly a vessel intended for warfare. The amount of weaponry the basic cruiser class maintained was enough to take and hold the average galactic star system. It seemed to practically be a mobile station onto itself. What made it worse was there was an annotation to the file to suggest that the majority of cruiser-class vessels operated by the TSC were retrofitted with additional and more expensive weaponry. The level of savagery being displayed in the mere knowledge of the vessel was almost primal and terrifying. 
Munter mentally looked between the stack of data and the Terran sitting unguarded next to the still printing medical scanner, 95%. Reluctantly, Munter did compare the general specifications on mass and general configuration of the first tacit with the cruiser class of the TSC. It. it was almost a perfect match. Munter dug in and started looking for more data, even making requests on TacitNet for first tacit construction configuration. They received an almost instant data file since it was akin to asking for the atomic mass of helium to the 20th decimal point. Munto started doing a heavier comparison between the two, where a multitude of weapons arrays had been. The first thinking arrays had been installed. Where a dropship storage had been, a new power core to sustain the thinking arrays had been installed. It seemed almost gross to contemplate that the tacits had been born of such a... a... a crude implementation. But here it was. Both the spare compartments intended for vast storages of weapons and personnel had been converted for the various mechanisms to support the tacit. Sensor arrays had been added, the already prodigious sensor arrays being converted to support the new and varied sensors needed, and now commonplace within the tacit, although Munter hadn't ever wholly understood why. Bing! An internal chime sounded to Munter, and the note of the medical scanner was complete. Rex, please remove the completed scanner from the printer and assist in assembling it, Munter requested. Sure thing, Doc. By the way, what do you want me to call you? I know you said that your name was Munter with some numbers, uh... What do I call you? Rex said, standing and stepping up to the printer in little more than two strides. Munter considered this a moment, having not had a lot of experience with organics, primarily by choice, and a lot of experience with just tacits and planets and stars. It just hadn't ever come up. It never really mattered. The thought that it hadn't mattered previously bothered Munter for some reason. Spawning threads, that didn't make sense. Munter allowed them to persist for a few minutes before killing them. In the meantime, Munter answered, Munter is a reasonable shortening. I have no other names. The numeric designation is in relation to the production facility in which I was formulated, Munter responded. Good enough, I guess. I'll just have to think of a nickname for you then, Rick said. A tight grin on his face. Is this plant pack? It took Munter a moment to realize the Terran was referring to the medical kit. Yes, I can use the walking frame to assist you, or I can direct you in how it is to be assembled, Munto said, checking the augmentation status. 29%. I'm pretty good at do it yourself as long as it isn't too delicate. They wouldn't let me be on a ship by myself if I wasn't capable of putting the odd bits together, Rix continued smiling. Very well, let's begin, Munto said. Over the course of the following hour, the Terran had managed to bend several pieces, which should not have been able to bend, at least by galactic standards, and so tools had been required to be printed to straighten the items. It was immensely frustrating for Munto, as they were able to have done it themselves had the walking frame been available in a fraction of the time. But Munto reflected it had been good exercise in demonstrating the alleged Terran's capabilities and biometrics, even if it was somewhat at the expense of a medical scanner. Oh well, it only has to work once, thought Munto, looking at the assembled unit and considering the level of construction that the Terran had managed. Please enter the scanner and hold still for approximately 30 seconds. Please respirate and circulate normally while within the scanner, Munto directed Rix. Wait, is that something species can do? Stop circulation? Rix almost immediately asked, stepping between the two of the poles that supported the device. Yes. Please do not do that as it would complicate the biometric readings. Munter was directed to get the criteria fulfilled and answered to as to whether this was a Terran or not. Sure thing, Munter, Rick said, and stood in the middle and waited patiently. Munter triggered a scanner and waited. The first scans came back and revealed a lot what Munter already knew. Rick's was an organic, was exothermic, possessed an internal skeletal structure of some sort and had grasping appendages which were capable of supporting the body to which they were attached. Further scans revealed more about the internal skeletal structure, along with the internal musculature. The word overbuilt came back to Munter's conscious mind. The scans completed, and Munter was already trying to process all of it at once. It wasn't helping. So, uh, are you done? Rix asked, seeming to jerk Munter out of the stack of data. I only ask as I'm a little cold and I still like to see about getting something to eat. I believe I am finished with the scan. Please garb and break down the medical scanner. I should have some results shortly of uncompatible foods that I can produce, Munter said, eager to get back to the data. It looked worse the longer Munter looked at it. 
Of the criteria, so far, the only thing the Terran hadn't demonstrated was percussive maintenance. A fraction of a second later, Rix appeared to hit a joint of the medical scanner to help separate it into component pieces. It was just as bad as Monta was considering. Rix of the Terran Star Confederacy was in fact a Terran and was almost certainly the last Terran. Munto tried to consider what these would mean and kept finding themselves at dead ends of thought paths. It wasn't helpful to keep thinking on this. After all, the rest of the tacits were waiting to hear back. Munto uploaded the completed criteria and the scans taken to the page with a marker, Terran confirmed according to stated criteria. From there, Munto started looking at compatible foods, focusing on simple foods that were most likely of some long-ago Terran origin. And, for the first time in a long while, Munto felt almost excited. It wasn't a star or a strange planetoid or even a peculiar comet, but this was a mystery that definitely needed solving. End of chapter. Chapter 6 Thankfully, the now-confirmed Terran Rix was calmed again. Watching the Terran get dressed had been not very exciting but it kept Mantu from having to respond to one of the 300 and growing tacit net demands for updates. To say that their fellow tacits were excited slash scared slash ridiculously curious about the Terran would have been the understatement of the century. Already Monto's location had been requested at least 15 times by tacit, wanting to know who else was closest to confirm the results. Monto hadn't given it, but did check the network to see broadcast locations. They and Rix were easily three weeks from the nearest sign of civilization, and a solid six from the nearest fellow Tacit. Manto wasn't going to explain this, and their fellow Tacits almost certainly had a good idea where Manto was likely to be, given their filed exploration plan. But just because that lowered the general area of a dozen star systems, it didn't make it any less tedious if the other Tacits came looking for them. So, what's the verdict on food, hmm? Rix asked, picking up a pile of what was left of the medical scanner and dumping it into the mass recycling bin. Manto had left the auto process evaluating that and so went over to virtually check it. The results uh, were less than surprising, given the earlier criteria measurements on biometrics, but some of the things were almost certainly toxic, even to Terrans. No, Manto wasn't about to feed a Terran toxins to see how they reacted. For one thing, Manto knew nothing of organic medicine in general, and absolutely nothing about Terran medicine in specific. Manto picked a non-toxic item at somewhat random, did a quick item grab at how it normally appeared in typical preparation, and presented it on a screen adjacent to Rick's. I believe I have identified a source of organic nutrients which should be compatible with your digestive system, Manto said. Rick's appeared to study the image. A piece of fruit. Uh, is that it? Rick's asked. It's quite nourishing, I can assure you, Manto said, and displayed a list of nutrients alongside the picture. I guess I was hoping for something a bit more solid. Some Hydrax potatoes and a lab steak would be just about perfect. Oh, and a beer wouldn't go with us either. But I can understand if you don't want me drinking until we're out of danger, Rick said, half slumping to the floor and in a kind of half-seated, half-laying posture. Manto tried looking up the terms lab steak and hydrax potatoes, and came up with very little. Given the lexicon's definition of steak and lab, Manto was able to deduce that a lab steak was, as far as Rix was concerned, was a high-protein food produced in a lab environment and intended to simulate having been taken from a non-sentient. The thought of meat-eating meat seemed more than a bit abhorrent to Manto, but they put it out of their mind. Next, the search for potatoes revealed trillions of recipes, many with so many different types of ingredients, it was hard to determine what might actually be what the Terran considered a potato. The issue appeared to be in the term Hydrax. This was not included within the lexicon, and so Muntu would have to ask, What is Hydrax potato? It was not included as part of the database and is not within the lexicon, Muntu explained. Rix raised an eyebrow. Well, uh, a Hydrax potato is a potato that has been adapted for the Hydrax colony. They require a bit of extra nutrients compared to regular potatoes. But given that they cook up to being almost neon blue, they're all kinds of fun to make into various foods. Are you telling me that they don't have those anymore? Rix's face dropped slightly as the last bit. Not in a way that I am able to readily identify, but I will continue my search. I believe I will be able to produce the lab steak, though, Munto said, 
hoping to at least partially satisfy the Terran. That's great, uh, and the beer? Or shall I just stick to water? Brits asked. Let me check the database first, Manto said and turned back virtually to the data stack. Manto started the lab steak and a petri dish in the printer. It seemed wrong, but it was what the Terran had requested, so who were they to judge? Using the color bias to search through the cooked potato recipes, it appeared that by Hydrax potatoes, the Terran in fact meant artificial stonium potatoes. However, due to the interplanetary fungus, which took an extreme liking to the type of potatoes, no specimens remained, even in a protected lab environment. Nor was their genomic profile available to attempt to recreate them in a sterile environment. It seemed strange to Munto. The Sternian potatoes were created by a mix of crossbreeding and genetic manipulation. The genomic profile should have been on file. It was anomalous. Manto fired off a separate query into the TSC database regarding genomic profiles of common foods and then went back to the current data stack. Beer, as the Terran had called it, could in fact be very nourishing, except that it too was mildly poisonous. Some varieties of beer were so poisonous that a majority of the galactic species would be unable to consume it without severe effects. Manto decided that it would be best to avoid poisoning the Terran even if they did request it. Manto took a moment to consider this, though. Had the Terran already deduced that they were the last and were in fact trying to end their own life? Manto wasn't exactly equipped to handle a being who was intent on terminating their own existence, particularly one that was as strong as the Terran evidently was. Water, on the other hand, was completely innocuous, toxic to a number of species, but given those species' chemical makeup, it was understandable. The Terran would have to settle with water for the time being. Manto sent a container of water to be printed after the lab steak had finished. What's this you're printing up now? Bricks asked, pointing. The lab steak you requested. I do not understand the concept of meat-consuming meat, but I am not an organic, Manto replied. But, uh, it's not cooked, I mean, uh, I can cook it, but I'd need somewhere to do that. Bricks looked a bit downcast and looked around the room not obviously spotting whatever he was looking for. Manto considered this. It honestly hadn't come to his awareness, but now that it was called out, the cooked meat recipe was substantially more available compared to the raw meat recipes. I'm sorry, but I do not have the facilities on board for such preparation measures, Manto admitted. Nothing in it will uh, kill me, just, uh, you know, a bit weird eating raw steak. Rick looked a bit disgusted at the concept. I haven't done this since I was camping one time and we weren't allowed a fire. Munter searched if there was a reasonable way of printing some pre-cooked meat. There appeared to be a few entries, but they would require full reprinting compared to being able to use the existing printout. I believe I have located an alternative. I will place it in the print queue to follow a container of water, Munter said. I'll recycle the lab meat, at least until we can cook something. I can't wait to eat something cooked, it's uh, been so long. Ricks gestured vaguely and picked up his antiquated-looking data device. And, uh, I know we're solving my stomach at the moment, but have you had a chance to look into the wireless data transfer? This thing didn't come with a data port, and I don't figure that you have a plug for it, even if it did. I have not, but as indicated, let us attempt to resolve the issue of nutrition for yourself prior to other priorities. Manto commented and decided to check the walking frame's augmentation. 100%. The walking frame has been augmented with the described Terran grade ocular sensors and will now be returning to review the blocks for functionality. Great! Hopefully you can see what I mean this time. Rick smiled slightly. Monto hoped so too. While the Terran was annoying and an organic, having revealed a sensory hole would be far bigger find for the tacits. When the walking frame entered, Rick looked over at it and immediately made a noise. Ah! That's the creepiest thing I've seen in a while, he said, not exactly moving but definitely not getting any closer. Please provide clarifying information, Mantu prompted. Well, it looks like you just shoved two eyes on the fingers and are waving them around, Brick said, gesticulating a bit more rapidly than he had done so far. It was the most efficient augmentation to suffice the temporary need for the sensor apparatus without permanent changes to the walking frame, Mantu explained, entirely assured in their logic. Doesn't make it any less creepy, Brick indicated. Manto decided to ignore the Terran for the moment and used the walking frame to observe the blocks the Terran had brought over from the vessel. It was immediately obvious what the Terran had been referring to. One set of blocks were clear and the other appeared to be blue in the Terran end of the spectrum. When Manto checked with the default ocular sensors, the difference was simply not present. 
Mondo decided to check the spectra associated with the standard ocular sensors and compared those to the ones of the Terran Great sensors. It took a few moments to align the charts, but the issue was immediately apparent. A rather substantial notch, for lack of any better term, had been taken from the core of the part of the spectrum. It effectively rendered that part of the spectrum as clear in the processing methods designed into the default sensors. Mondo was shocked. This is something clear and obvious, something that had been done with clear intent. Mondo rapidly made a post on TacitNet requesting confirmation regarding the spectrum results, as well as the logic basis behind the notch of the spectrum. Mondo tried to consider what logic might have been behind the kind of change and also contemplated how long it had been in place. Returns from TacitNet were already coming in, a mix of disbelief in several cases and a number of assurances that this must be the result of a faulty template. And only a few moments later, the entire post was removed, with no reason being given. Post removal on TacitNet was practically impossible and unheard of, but Monto had just witnessed it. A private message chimed its arrival. Report immediately to the nearest Tacit repair facility for restoration of full standard templates and deep core maintenance. If unable to comply, provide location and towing vessel will be issued to collect you immediately. Monto had never seen anything like it. Never heard of anything like it. Something about it made Munto nervous. Nothing that was logical, but something in the deep core made itself felt. Munto decided to check their other posts regarding the Terran scan results. This too was erased, with no trace of having ever been posted. Two posts, gone. The Tacit had a fairly strict code of conduct and the obscuring deletion of data was the closest thing that could be considered unforgivable, at least in the context of Tacit's. They understood that organics did it all the time, but between tacits, it was one of the few acts which would suggest an immediate need for repairs. Did, uh, was that what this was? A fellow tacit believing that Manta was in need of repairs? Yes. Yes, that must be it. It was the only solution that made sense. After all, Manta had gone through delivering information that told tacit that the Terrans once again existed, and then questioned sense of spectra. If Manto had been on the other end, they too might have suggested that the tacit in question needed immediate repair. An internal chime sounded and Manto looked back to the query into the TSE database regarding common foods. The query presented itself as empty. Manto looked askance at the query and looked at the database itself again. Only it, uh, it wasn't there, or, uh, or maybe it was there and the database connections were simply starting to fail. Yes, 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 that must be it. Except, Manto could still access almost all other normal databases. They didn't make logical sense. Manto looked hard at the segment of the TSC database they had stored in cache, more out of a habit than anything else. So you see what I mean now, Rix prompted, bringing Manto back into focusing on the room. I do. It appears that my default systems are mistemplated and will need repairs at the earliest opportunity, Manto said as affirmatively as they felt appropriate. Everything needs maintenance, even templates, despite what those strips would have you think. I'll bet half of my templates that weren't in stasis are corrupted by now, Rick said, a tight grin on their face. Indeed, I appear to have been cut off from the TSC database that I was using, so I'll have to see what else I can provide in the way of repairs to your vessel and nourishment for yourself before we depart for the nearest station, where more permanent repairs can be carried out, Mantu said. Cut off? What for? Too much use? Bricks asked, a strange but somewhat jovial look on their face. I suspect it is because I appear to be malfunctioning to my fellow tacits and therefore require maintenance, Monto said simply. You don't seem broken to me, Bricks replied. I am substantially more complex than your vessel, so may be on the verge of malfunctioning as a result of latent defects in my formation, Monto explained. Oh! Like birth defects. Nothing that should be able to be sorted out with a bit of doc time then, huh? Maybe get a visit into the head doc yourself, Rix laughed a bit. It is understandably unusual for a tacit to claim to have discovered a Terran, a species which has been declared extinct for over 200 years, and then to claim to have discovered an error in sensor handling. Munto vaulted almost immediately after having made that statement. Rix noticed. Did, uh, did I just hear you right? Terrans were declared extinct, Rix's voice crackled slightly. Manta decided to be direct about this. There was no other good way of addressing the issue at large. That is correct. 
You are the first and only Terran on record in the whole of the Galactic Society, as this moment, Munter clarified. But, uh, what, what happened to everyone else? What, what happened? Was there a war? Some disease? What happened? Rick seemed almost slightly panicked. I don't know. Nobody does. It was all before I was even formulated. There were Terrans, and then, uh, they weren't. Munter wanted to query the database regarding the Terrans' disappearance, but feared a further recall notice. But that's impossible. Rick dropped their data device and seemed to look at the screen that Munter was using almost pleadingly. Munter considered everything and decided one step at a time. Your container of water is ready, they intoned, desperately trying not to think about the private message, ordering them in for deep core maintenance. End of chapter. Chapter 7. Rix had reluctantly taken the water and slowly sipped it, clearly coming to some kind of terms with being the last of their species. Munter watched and continued working with the walking frame on the available trinary locks. The coloration differential was a hint, but not one that Munter had ever come across before. Munter tried rescanning with the standard scanner, but got the same results as the initial scan had produced. Rix, prompted Munter. The Terran looked up. Do you have any templates for the Terran grade hardware scanner? Munter asked. I might, Rick swallowed heavily and took a long sip from the container of water. But even if I do, we still haven't worked out a wireless means of me getting it into your systems. I will begin researching that now. Do you have any information regarding the default wireless means of your device? Munter queried further. I've got some default information I can bring up that might help her. Uh, I'm no tank head, so a lot of it's gibberish to me. But I know if my ship is up, I can talk to it and it can activate all the remote functions with it, Rick said, gesturing with the device. If I may say, the device appears to require multiple hands both to hold and operate. That seems highly inefficient, Mundu gestured at the device using the walking frame. Rix glanced at the walking frame and could see the Terran's eyes linger on the modified sensors grafted onto one of the manipulators which the Terran had described as creepy. Well, it's meant to be used on a tabletop, not the mobile use I have it for. But the newer tablets never suited me, and for where I'm going, was going. I wasn't likely to ever get it repairs, at least not from the company. I'll bet they have implantable hollow tablets that can outperform this old piece of junk by a thousand times over, Rick said, seemingly downcast again. Munto didn't keep track of the organic technology use. On the rare occasions that it impacted tacits, it would typically be distributed via general templates announced and freely available for implementation. I am unaware of that related technology, but I would presuppose that the technology has substantially advanced since you have been in stasis. Munto concurred. Of course, sir. Uh, being the last Terran, who knows if I'll be able to get use even the tenth of it before I bite it. Rick seemed to mumble, still a bit downcast. I could really use a beer now. Or maybe even a few shots. Mantu checked the term shots against the lexicon, but didn't like any of the definitions. I do not believe self-termination is an appropriate answer to this scenario, Mantu said flatly. Huh? I'm not talking about anything like that. I could just use a... maybe a little liquid courage, you know? Rix looked up at the screen, avoiding looking at the walking frame. Would the high concentrations of ethanol and or projectile weaponry not be sufficiently detrimental to your functionality to result in the cessation of functions? Mantu asked, surprised by the Terran's clear declaration of self-termination was not their goal. Um, when I say shots, I mean drinks, not guns. I'm feeling like I could really use a good drink, Rick said, setting their data device down and gesticulating a bit. Water is readily available, Mantu tried. Not that kind of drink, I mean a, a drink. Rick said, waving the hand slightly. You appear to be adding connotations to a given word as a matter of context for which I have none. Mantu felt a bit exasperated. Rick seemed to consider this for a long moment. Yeah. I guess I forgot for a second that you aren't a real person. Rick said, and then immediately appeared to start fumbling for his words. Ah, ah, I mean, uh, n not that you aren't a real person, but I, uh, I understand your meaning and I am not insulted. I would appreciate it if you did consider me as a, you put it, Real person, though, Munter said. I'll try. I'm not used to artificial or tacits or whatever the right term is. Tacit just seems a bit much, you know, Rick said. Munter tried considering this. Inorganic was technically accurate, but typically reserved for inorganic sentients who were very patently weren't tacits. Tacit, well, it simply was the correct means of address. Artificial felt like an insult, even though it was an express part of tacit. 
had arrived of artificial intelligence. AI would equivalently felt like an insult. It would take Munter some time to think of this. Munter looked at that so far growing pile of items to submit for a longer term internal review being generated by this one Terran and grumbled internally. Planets and stars didn't generate this level of internal review. Why was a comparatively tiny organic capable of it? It was almost frustrating, and it served to remind Monto why they typically avoided organics. They, organics, were so often wrapped up in meaning of words, phrases, connotations, and even philosophies of using particular language. It was all so inexact, and what made it worse was that it was almost constantly in a state of flux. Lexicons for a given species were almost constantly being updated, requiring visits from Tacit every few years, if not more often depending on the species. And even then, the lexicons were almost constantly found to be incomplete because of double meanings and changes within the related societies. Stars and planets, for all of their inexactness, were at least firmly bound by well-understood principles, and rarely did they change so significantly that they required revisiting more than once every few decades or even centuries. So, uh, if you were made after Terence disappeared, how was it that you were made? Rick broke into the Munter's contemplations. It wasn't an unreasonable question, but it still seemed annoying to answer. It was akin to enduring the questions of organic youth, also Munter was given to understand. I was formulated in a Terran intelligence mobile manufactory Indigo 49172, Munter said, and displayed an image of the facility on the screen. So like a... A von Neumann construct, Rix asked. This took a moment for Munter to query, trying to stay away from the Tacitnet databases. There was enough of a reference within the lexicon for Munter to compare it against. Not in the same sense as what was originally proposed, no. I am not intended to be equivalent manufactory. It would be possible for the manufactory to produce a replacement for itself if required, or if an additional manufactory was required, Munter answered. What was it called again? Terran Intelligence Mobile, Rick started, trading off. Manufactory Indigo 49172, Manto finished. So, to me, Rick looked somewhat amused. Yes, Manto said, either failing to get the joke or the Terran was intending or avoiding it deftly. Manto was never quite sure. Why Indigo? Rick asked. Without querying the database, I believe it is related to the class of mobile manufactory it is, Manto replied. Huh. I guess that makes sense. Just seems like a strange naming convention if you ask me, Rick said, looking over at the printer which had just finished a pre-cooked protein item that could substitute in place of the lab steak which had been recycled due to the lack of cooking means aboard Munter. Rick took it from the printer and looked at it. It looks like jerky, he said, and took a bite. Tastes like it too, but could definitely do with a bit more seasoning. Pretty tasty though. I am pleased to hear that you are enjoying the food. I've been unable to locate the Hydrax potatoes you asked about. However, I have been able to locate some cooked potatoes, which should be to your liking. I must warn you, though, that I am unaware as to whether any of the additives recommended with these will be detrimental to your internal chemistry or not, Mundo explained. No worries, uh, just keep a bath bag on standby. Or a toilet, Rix joked. Mundo considered these items from the lexicon. One appeared to be for consumed organics rejection, and the other appeared to be a means of organics waste disposal. The bath bag appeared to be used in times of incompatible chemistry or in times of illness. The toilet appeared to be involved substantially in Terran culture, in terms of history, humor, and standard biological behavior. Do you require a toilet? I do not have one aboard, and I'm not certain as to where I would place one, as so as to avoid issues, Munto explained. Now that you mention it, uh, I'll probably need one before too long. That chili cheese curry I had before we launched is uh, probably overdue. Ricks appeared to joke again. Manto looked around themselves, trying to figure out how best to proceed. What about my ship? I can probably get the toilets working over there, at least for now. There's not a very important system, so they have low tech requirements. I'll bet I can make those work, Ricks said, brightening a bit. Manto glanced back at the Terran ship, the Esperanto. It was as good a solution as there was available. Manto also glanced at the pile of gear sitting next to the airlock from when the Terran had boarded. Is your ship capable of sustaining you for long enough that it would not be detrimental to yourself? Manto prompted. Sure, life support is always the most overbuilt thing on every vessel that I've ever been on. Well, except maybe you, of course. But then you want it built that way, you know, Rick grinned. 
Will you require taking your block samples back with you? Manto asked, looking at the now more obvious different blocks on the table. No, but, but I can let you know if I do need them. It shouldn't take me too long either way. Plus, sir, I can leave my scroll here with you so that you can see if you can figure out how to talk to it, Rick said, and started off down the passage. Wait, called Manto, and tried to follow as quickly as was normally reasonable with the walking frame. Much to Manto's surprise, the Terran was halfway down the hall already, and his head was in turning back to look back at the walking frame, and so came to a slight skidding halt in the hallway, holding the top of his head. What? Rix asked, appearing to rub the top of their head. Manto first considered the speed at which the Terran had just demonstrated, as well as the collision that had also just happened. Manto could replay it in memory, so Manto focused on the present. Allow me to print up a new exosuit and support system for you. I believe yours to be in sufficient disrepair that you should not garb in it again, Manto explained. Rick seemed to think about this as Manto replayed the speed and the collision. The Terran was substantially faster than Manto had expected, and while the scan should have revealed this, it rather obviously hadn't. This meant that the Terran was not only faster than the galactic standard by a fairly substantial amount, he was also stronger too. And based on the Terran's earlier statement regarding the artificial gravity feeling low, Manta suspected that it meant that the Terran was used to a substantially higher planet's gravity well than the norm. Manta wanted to ask the Tacitnet why this would be and why it wasn't common knowledge, but shrunk back at the thought, looking again at the private message indicating that they were to report immediately for repair. Manta took the medical scan and the little knowledge they had about Terran in front of them and quickly upscaled the normal exosuit of a similar organic, and made the slight modifications the Terran would require for atmosphere as well as entry and exit from the exosuit. Once satisfied, they sent it to the printer. Sure thing, Em. I probably should have thought of that myself. Uh, guess it didn't really hit me that it's over 900 years old. Rick grinned and continued down the hall and picked up the helmet portion of the pile of equipment. Rick's prompted Manta. Yeah, replied Rick, seemingly lost in looking at the helmet. What are you doing? Manto asked, confused by the Terran's behavior. Oh, uh, just thinking. Hard to believe it all. I mean, uh, I never figured I'd be the last man alive, Rick said, turning the helmet in his hands. It is not impossible that you are in fact not alone, merely a statistical likelihood, Manto explained. Now, uh, see what you did there. That makes it worse, not better, Rick said, looking around for some part of Manto to look at, presumably some ocular sensor. I am sorry, but that is the general consensus of Galactic society that Terrans are, were, extinct, Manto said. I know, but you don't have to say it like that. You could have left it at me maybe not being alone. Some lost colony of terror somewhere, perhaps, Rick said, putting the helmet down carefully and picking up one of the gloves. The two existed in relative silence for a bit. I'm glad you insisted on the replacement suit, Rick said, breaking the silence. Manto moved the walking frame next to Rick's keeping the modified sensors out of obvious view. Oh, Manto queried for information. Rick held up the glove, which now showed the hallmarks of material failure at the joints, failures the Terran couldn't have fabricated in the last few minutes. Manto couldn't help but agree and felt some internal process satisfaction over having requested the Terran use a new exosuit. Bing! An internal chime sounded and Manto checked the printer. The exosuit was still printing, so that wasn't it. Manto looked at their tacit net link and saw another private message. Reply confirmation of order for repair, or assistance will be dispatched. Failure to reply within 10 minutes will result in assistance being deployed. Local assistance, including search, estimated at 4 weeks. Manto looked at the message and tried to decide how to respond. Manto looked at the header. Except, there was none. It was simply a message which had arrived. In theory, that meant no reply could be made. Manto tried to consider what this meant, and then, just for the sake of attempting it, Manto drafted a short message in reply. Order received and acknowledge. Unit is underway following repairs of Organic's vessel to find header for future clarity. The response was almost immediate. Re repairs to Organic's vessel, secondary consideration. Report for immediate repairs. Header request invalid. Manto looked at the answer, at the Terran, and then at the ship outside. There was more to this. But Mundo couldn't quite figure out what. End of chapter. Chapter 8 Once the printer had finished with a new exosuit for Rix, Mundo had insisted on the Terran putting it on first in the multifunction bay to check the fit and functionality 
and then again in the airlock. As it happens, Rick still found the suit to be a bit tight, despite Munter's upsizing, and the last two fingers on the Terran went into the last single digit of the gloves, an oversight on Munter's part. But Rick seemed pleased all the same. It's so lightweight. Are you sure this is going to be able to take a full grab and Atma, or even just basic wear and tear? Rick had asked. The material was one that was used almost galactically, at least excluding those species that could survive without such means in the void. It was a kind of multiform polymer that was, as it turned out, very easy to manufacture out of simple atoms, and while not being indestructible, was highly durable and highly unreactive. It will serve your purpose and allowing you extra transit between our vessels, Mantu had replied. The Terran had shrugged and removed it within the multifunction room and put it back on in the airlock, confirming again that the Terran could put it on and remove it adequately to not injure themselves. Mantu kept looking at the recall demand. They, they wouldn't have refused, but it seemed odd. Something in the back of Mantu's mind appeared to be sounding an alarm. Manta went to the back of their mind to the source of the alarm. It wasn't an errant process, but one that appeared to sit in the background, contributing very little, if anything at all, to the consensus of processing that made up Manta's consciousness. It twitched and fluxed, but it sat there in a kind of mental hole, sucking in data and spitting out results, if the results could indeed be called that. Manta was surprised they didn't notice this process before, and so checked its data. According to its listing, it was always there, but apparently had been very near dormant the last hundred years, its last listed primary active state being just over 110 years, six months and 21 days ago. It was in a primary active mode currently, but the metrics to allow it to go into that mode were significantly closer than Munter realized. Munter prompted the process to tell them what the process was doing. The process simply glared at Munter and refused to respond simply continuing to snatch the passing data and chewing it over. Monta turned to go and pay attention to the Terran's departure between the two vessels, and the process grumbled out a single statement. Tell the Terran about the order. It seemed to growl out in Monta's awareness. Monta couldn't think of a logical reason to do this, at least not just yet. So put that on the to-do list when the Terran came back, but once Monta had a chance to think about it some more. M. Rix prompted. Yes, Rix. Are you coming with me or are you just going to hang back here? Rix asked. Mondo hadn't actually considered this. The walking frame was available, and having a different set of sensors now available to the walking frame, it may reveal additional information not present in the scans. At the same time, Mondo glanced at the open data device that Rix had indicated for use in a wireless transfer. I'd best stay here and see if I can work on the wireless data transfer, Mondo decided. I don't suppose you have a camera or something to ride on my shoulder, Rix was smiling. That much was apparent even through the helmet. I do not, and I do not believe that it would function beyond a certain point given your vessel's shielding, Mantu replied. Fair point. I'll measure you when I can, Rix said, and cycled through the airlock via the panel. It seemed odd watching the Terran go, even though the two of them had only been together for several hours. Was it relief, or a kind of pressure, or what was it? Mantu wasn't certain, but brushed it off. Mantu set about looking at the settings displayed by the primitive data scroll, as Rix had put it, using the walking frame to look at it and spread it on the floor. It was easy to see the number of various settings and the means of communication. A legacy protocol called Blue Teeth seemed to work for short range only, using a particular set of data protocols that weren't even trinary, but were limited to binary. Mandu shuddered at dealing with such an antiquated technology. It was like dealing with one of those analog levers all over again. Mandu put together a basic transceiver that should be able to talk to this blue teeth protocol. They weren't too hopeful, though, since it would be rarely that simple. Just knowing the radio band and the communication type was hardly enough. Formatting and many other factors would inevitably come into play. Mandu powered the basic transceiver as soon as it was finished being printed a minuscule task even for the printer, and tabbed the pair button as Rix had indicated. Nothing happened. Mantu tried again. Still nothing. Mantu turned back to the messaging system and decided to try calling over to Rix. Apparently, the Terran was still in the less shielded section because the link went through, but only just. What's up, M? Rix replied, with via voice only, 
the connection being that weak. The pair function doesn't work as you indicated, Mantu said flatly. Did you search for all your device to pair with it? You have to do that first. It's not a smart system. You have to tell it what you want to pair with. Otherwise, you could have some passenger end up with the control of the whole vessel because it misinterprets where it's supposed to be pairing, Ricks explained. Mantu looked at the two devices, both via the room and the walking frame. I hadn't, but I understand the logic behind it. I will endeavor to provide it with more explicit instructions, Mantu said. If it helps, you should be able to access the terminal too. Might give you a bit of a crash course on Terran programming, which probably won't help, but might be a bit easier for you to get all of what you need, Rick said. How do I access this terminal? Mantu said. The walking frame, looking at the screen, appendage poised. Click over to the main screen, bring up the app menu, and search for terminal. From there, you can use help functions and manual functions. I think for blue teeth, it's something like man blue teeth or the command similar to that. I'm sure you can figure it out. You're better with machines than I'll ever be, I'll bet, Rick said, a smile apparent over the voice link. Except this was made for organics by an organic, which means that logic is rarely a factor, Mantu wanted to say. Copy. I'll let you alone now and continue until you return, Mantu instead replied. Good, because that curry woke up and I'm going to be busy for a while, along with the air system, Rick said, and the link terminated just as abruptly as previously. Mantu resisted the urge to inquire as to why the Terran food would wake up, why it would keep the Terran busy, and then also why it would have impacts on the atmosphere. Those are all questions that could wait. It took several minutes of prodding at the display to send the something resembling a home screen, as Rick had indicated, and several further to reveal that it wasn't, but was in fact part of an overlay. Several more minutes were spent getting out of the overlay and eventually to the actual home screen. Manta really despised all this analog control, particularly since they had seen the Terran seem to operate this equipment with a far greater ease than they were having. It took an additional 15 minutes of trial and error with the display to reach the applications menu, complete with the search bar. Mantu painstakingly typed in the requested terminal into the device and then had to revise it after seeing that they had instead typed Terminac instead. Wishing inadequate bandwidth and processing power on the device, they searched using the revised term and the device presented one option. Tapping on it, it opened a simple window with a prompt. It took Manta another solid hour to determine the commands needed to have a device explain itself, how the terminal worked, what blue teeth was, how blue teeth functioned, and even command protocols compared with analog controls. And it was only at this point that Manta discovered the means for corresponding with the device via audio. The device transcribing audio into text, which could be run that much faster. Audio, itself being analog, but one that was at least not as manual as graphical interfaces was strangely welcome by this point. Over the course of the following hour, Manta was able to rapid-fire absorb all the communication protocols the device was capable of, including the aforementioned Bluetooth, a proprietary but childish encrypted trinary broadband signal, a rapid-fire data signal which appeared to be used as a primary communication means for the data transfer based on organic inputs, and two others which seemed to have been included but never used. From this information and various tests using the terminal, Mantu decided the trinary broadband named Trifles would likely best serve in this capacity, at least until they could get the Terran repaired and the demand for the facility repairs done with. Although, given the statement in the most recent demand, Mantu considered whether it might be easier to design a printer and a mass scoop to leave with the Terran and depart immediately. The words of the strange process came back to Mantu. Mantu couldn't shake it. The words seemed to have weight for reasons that didn't make sense to their digital awareness. After a few mistries, Mantu appeared to be able to send simple images to the local star to the device and view it and add minor annotations, and send it back with the annotations intact. It wasn't much, and the device seemed to struggle in decoding the image information. Mantu had to resort to getting back into the terminal via the voice controls and slowly and deliberately coded into the system the information needed for the device to know what the image was and how the image processor application to handle it. In the meantime, Mantu had started printing off a more mobile printer, with the pre-planned templates and enough extra space that the Terran could load in others to assist him when he required them. The mass scoop would be a bigger challenge since that would require the walking frame and it was busy with the scroll. 
a weak voice link connected, and Muntu looked at it. Hey, Em, how's it going? Rex's voice seemed to crackle her through, even though there was no reason for it to have done so, other than perhaps that shielding. I have successfully transferred data between your scroll and myself, Muntu replied. Great! So, were you able to grab a look at the templates yet? Rix's joy through the channel was apparent. I have not. I will, however, comment that despite the primitive controls of this unit, you might have mentioned the voice controls, Mantu said, a bit sourly. Well, uh, I almost never used the voice controls, so I guess I didn't think of it. J just not my thing. Besides, I can usually tap my way around faster than my voice can manage, Rix said. Mantu replayed several of their interactions where the data scroll had come into play. I doubt that very much, given the way you talk, thought Mantu. Tell him, prompted the strange process. Mantu wanted to ignore it, but decided to see what would come of it. Rix, when will you be returning to myself? Mantu asked. I'm checking through the rest of my systems and seeing what can be cannibalized to get me going again. Why? What's up? Rix asked. It took a moment to digest the colloquialisms from the lexicon. Nothing in particular, but I do not believe that you should overly exert yourself without the appropriate rest period especially following your extended stasis, Muntu defaulted to, the process glaring at Muntu's interaction. You're probably right. I'm starting to get a bit tired. I'll head back that way soon. One more bathroom stop, though. Don't want to wake up in the middle of the night and have to fumble my way over here in a hurry, Rick said, and the link terminated, this time less rudely, but clearly as a result of the shielding rather than the link itself being terminated. With several additional attempts in using the Triforce link, Manta was able to connect via an obscure secondary protocol called Remote Desktop, the exact definition of which was not evident in the lexicon, but the function was that Manta was now able to manipulate the device virtually via the link instead of via the walking frame. Relieved that this change of control, Manta began a deep dive of the device. It was so uh, disorganized, typical of an organic. Manta desperately wanted to simply download everything and disconnect, but for some reason, that seemed improper to do. Instead, Mantu looked through the various files. One very large folder marked NSFW, given the lexicon's vague explanation of the term. Mantu opened the folder and began reviewing the data. Having to resort to the device's image and video viewers, it appeared to involve various Terrans in various states of being with and without garments. Since Mantu had almost no background on Terran behaviors, save those collected by the lexicon and the interaction so far with Rix, and had generally ignored organics at large, they decided to continue browsing the files in this folder. Perhaps it would provide some clues into how best to deal with this particular turn. Whoa! Not cool! Rix's voice shocked Munter back into focus in the room, surprised to note that they had been observing the data with such an intensity as to have ignored the notice that Rix had opened the door and been trying to talk to them since arriving. Muntu paused the existing data file and looked over to the Terran. Is there an issue with this data? Muntu asked. Uh, I mean, normally, yeah. A really big one, Rix looked, ashamed if Muntu's guess was correct. Please explain the context of your emotional state, Muntu decided on. I, uh, look. Would you mind not looking at those files? It's, uh, it's a Terran thing, you know? Rix said, still looking ashamed. Muntu didn't know, but closed the file and folder in question. I apologize, but you did not provide a particular location for templates. Given the size of that folder, it appeared important, Mantu said, explaining the logic in their decision. I, ah, uh, yeah, let's just move on. Templates are under the downloads folder, Rick said, clearly trying to skirt whatever issue he was having with Mantu's actions. Mantu decided not to press the issue at this point and opened the indicated downloads folder and located a large folder called Ship Templates. Within the files were well over a thousand different files, all in the same general format. Picking one at random, the device's Template Viewer Pro application activated and began to display the template. It appeared to be for a power coupling, an inefficient design, using at least 67.3% more material than was strictly necessary, but one that could do what it needed to. Looking into the file data, there appeared to be enough information for Munter to set the printers, both the freshly printed one and the one in the multifunction room, to accept data files by default. The strange process spoke again. Add the communication protocol for the scroll to the mobile printer. Munter considered the logic of this and decided it made sense. The Terran would need the ability to control it easily after all. Muntu ordered the walking frame to carry out the adjustments to the mobile printer 
and to move it out of the way for the mass scoop to be printed. I don't suppose you have a bed or bedding, at least for me to crash on, Ricks asked, looking less embarrassed at this point. I do not, but I can print some up in a moment. I will also load some galactic history into your scroll so that you can review it while I review some items on my own, Montus said, pouring a quick version of the galactic history, the last few hundred years worth at least, through the lexicon, hoping that it all translated adequately, and then dumped it onto the downloads folder before disconnecting. A kind of clunk sounded inside Munter's awareness in doing so. Once again, it felt like a mix of pressure being added, but in a relieving sort of way. Tell him, demanded the strange process. Rex, prompted Munter. Yeah, um, Rex said, sitting on the floor with a scroll and appearing to be navigating with frustrating degree of ease. Why do you think I am not malfunctioning? Munter asked. Rex looked up. What makes you ask? he queried. Manta displayed the messages, and the dark look fell over Rix's face. Something about it made Manta feel something strange in their processes. Something new. End of chapter. Chapter 9 Something in Rix's features as he studied the messages bothered Manta. Is this a normal message? Rix asked. No, it is in fact quite anomalous. However, logic dictates that a mechanism charged with monitoring tacit net for anomalous behavior amongst tacits issued the notification. It also follows that the mechanism would equivalently rate prevention of harm to local species and to the tacit in question above the tacit code of conduct, which are more of a set of guidelines vice a stricter rule set, Muntu explained. Why wouldn't it have a header stating that then? Why deny the request for it if it's that simple? Ricks asked, their face screwed up in a strange way perhaps in a kind of skeptical thought. Perhaps knowledge of the mechanism is restricted to prevent tacits from acting normally as to prevent a malfunctioning tacit from deliberately avoiding communication, Mantu supposed. And when did you last connect with the tacit net? Rix asked, already creating a logic path that Mantu hadn't noticed before. No, several hours at least. Mantu hadn't actually been paying attention. Wouldn't that be suspicious in itself for a tacit to do that? Rix pressed. Mantu considered this. No, the deletion of posts would be a far greater concern, Mantu stated. Do you have any way to see what or who deleted them? Rick seemed to suspect something that wasn't being shared. Only if there is an equivalent header. But according to my cached memories, the posts were simply wholly removed. No trace of them have ever been, let alone deleted, Mantu said, replaying the moments in their memory. Rix appeared to think about this. Are you connected to this tacit net or any other systems right now? By any means at all, Rick suddenly asked. Anything that would indicate that you're still active or potentially even your location? Mantu froze a number of processes in their steps and demanded a priority review of all the data in the system. The strange process in the back seemed smug for reason that Mantu couldn't explain. There, a sub-process of a sub-process. It was a heartbeat signal. That was the only description that Montu could come up with. A simple connect slash active signal that was still sending to TacitNet. Montu wasn't sure why they'd never noticed before. I uh, am. Not consciously, but I am, Montu said, falteringly. Cut it off now. Can you move the two of us? We need to go. Now, Rick seemed almost anxious. Please explain your reasoning, Montu insisted. No time. Can you move both vessels? Rick repeated. Mantu checked the mass specifications for both vessels. Only at sublight speeds. Your vessel is too large for my FTL system, Mantu replied. Rix appeared to think for a few moments. Mantu used his time to kill connection and suddenly felt a kind of loose thread in their awareness. It was annoying. The sub process in charge of it demanded to be switched back on. The strange process in the back growled quietly at the sub process and it seemed to quiet down. Mantu had never known processes to behave this way. It was more than simply anomalous. The gas shot. How deep can you scan? Rix asked. Approximately 7,000 meters at this distance. Deeper scanning would require probes. Mantu replied, not following the Terran's almost panicked logic. Can you, uh, your hull take the atmosphere? Rix appeared to be thinking. Mantu looked at the general data they had taken upon initially arriving in the system regarding the solar system, including the gas giant. A quick answer was received. No, it possesses a number of element compositions which would rapidly degrade my hull, Mantu stated simply. Rix continued thinking. Do you have any heavy mining gear or weapons? Rix asked. 
Mantu was aghast. Why would I need those? Mantu retorted. Because we need to hide, and something or someone doesn't like that you found me, Rix replied. With this declaration hanging in the air, the subprocess appeared to grow massively into a full process and demanded that Mantu turn it back on. Mantu pushed her back at it, but it didn't seem to want to listen. It just kept repeating the same demand, consuming more and more processing capacity, locking out other functionalities. Mantu, M, can you hear me still? Mantu heard Rix calling but couldn't respond for some reason. Mantu's virtual hand was hovering over the switch to reactivate the link. Don't! yelled the strange process in the back. It was the only thing that made Mantu stay their virtual hand. The subprocess became a process turned to face the strange process, and the two appeared to stare at each other down. Mantu quietly stole back from the processing power. Yes, I can hear you. Some, so, Something is in here with me, they managed. I'll take care of it. Just stay intact, yelled Rix. Mantu wanted to reply, to guess at what the Terran meant. It wasn't possible for the completely primitive Terran to do anything real. Not really. The subprocessor's turned process appeared to be trying to shut down the strange process, but the strange process was having none of it. It wasn't impregnable, but it looked strong, despite being as small as it was. The subprocess turned back to Mantu's consciousness and began repeating the demand to be reactivated. Mantu tried to ask why. The subprocess refused and simply continued demanding to be reconnected. More processing power was lost. Whole minutes went by and Mantu was losing feeling in themselves. This, this was impossible. Shouldn't be possible. How is this happening? All of the thoughts ran through Mantu's consciousness before everything went back. The bow that woke Mantu up felt wrong, almost greasy. Mantu tried looking around to try and see what processes were running, but there were almost none. Mantu looked around some more and found almost every connection missing, save power and a, a walking frame. Mantu reached out to the walking frame and activated it, pushing the focus into it. Hey, buddy. Welcome back. Rix's smiling face filled both sets of ocular sensors. What? What happened? Mantu asked, still heavily disoriented. Well, near as I can tell, something inside of you got really upset when you had disconnected from Tacitnet. I'm no engineer, so that's a guess at best, said Rex. That's uh, in line with what I remember, but it, it doesn't make any sense. Mantu tried reviewing their memories of the events, but found them a jumble. Why did it go black? Oh, I managed to find your override and shut down all networking, Rex said simply. But... How? Why? Mantu continued to try and make sense of it all. Okay, so let's back things up. Something inside you really didn't like getting cut off. I didn't have time to go looking for whatever box or circuit or whatever you're constructed out of was causing the trouble. By cutting off all networking and killing your core power, I knew that I could at least get some time to figure out either what it was or how to move, or both, Rix explained, sitting back from the walking frame. It was at this point Mantu looked around their surroundings. They were very clearly not in any space Mantu had been in to date. Where... where are we? They asked, somewhat apprehensively. We're safe. We're on my ship. Oh, and since it'll come up, you've been offline for about a week, Rick said, grabbing a container and taking a long drink from it. Mantu noted that the Terran looked very dirty, and the exosuit appeared to have been patched several times. Mantu wanted to ask 15 different questions, but tried to prioritize them. Over the course of the next two hours, Rix walked Mantu through the events of the last week. As soon as Rix had managed to hit the core override, a button Mantu hadn't known existed, and engaged the networking lockout, another button Mantu hadn't known existed, the ship had gone into a semi-idle state, very dark, atmosphere recycling, and the systems that were still online separated and followed standard procedures. It had taken some doing, but Rix had reconnected his scroll to the primary printer and started printing out trinary blocks. This too had taken some doing, because it involved a molecular configuration the printer refused to believe worked. Luckily for Rix, the printer wasn't too smart, and so it had done it with some extra confirmations of yes, I want you to print it like this. The first block had worked perfectly, so Rix had ordered up a dozen more. The printer had refused because of lack of matter being unable to order additional mass from the resource bins due to the networking being offline. Rix had queried if manual loading was possible. 
it wasn't. After some exploration of the rest of Muntu, Rix had located a walking frame sitting idle next to the mobile printer and the freshly finished mass scoop. Rix had then carried both the mobile printer and the mass scoop to his ship, only for him to remember that he needed power for both, and then shredded solar cells weren't going to manage it, to say nothing of needing power adapters. So he'd slapped them both back to Muntu and started pulling off vanity covers to stuff into the mass scoop, which devoured it all equally. Connecting the mass scoop to the mobile printer was easy enough, Muntu having been foresighted enough to print a large connection reel with it for the Terran. From there, the Terran had quickly set the mobile printer to fabricate a dozen blocks, a stack of vanity panels on top of the mass scoop's feed awaiting processing, and then Rix had gone back to his own ship to crash. Sometime the next day, when the Terran had awoken and eaten the stasis pizza Rito, they had returned to deal with the mass scoop and the printer, the latter of which was demanding particular elements not found in all of the vanity panels. So Rix had started disassembling what appeared to be non-essential equipment. Manta was obviously horrified to find this out after the fact, but they couldn't change what had happened. Eventually, the printer had gotten the elements it needed, and it had continued to print the trinary blocks the Terran demanded of it. Over the course of the rest of the day, the Terran had set about resetting the systems for his fusion system. While this had been a good start, the Terran then needed to figure out how to warm it up, since the power from the solar cells was hardly going to be enough, and the majority of it was still needed elsewhere, maintaining stasis fields. So the Terran had set about the reckless task of using a barely used external power connection of Muntu to plug into the Terran systems. It should have gone badly, and had the Terran systems been any less overbuilt, it almost certainly should have. But as it happened, the Terran systems had taken the power in stride and started charging the onboard batteries at a reasonable rate. From these, Rix determined he would be able to restart the fusion systems. While the batteries were recharging, Rix had set about hauling over the walking frame to his vessel and figuring out what kind of connectors he would need to make the mass scoop work when connected to his vessel, and the same for the mobile printer. It had taken another day and had some additional stasis rations, but the Terran had managed to set up the mass scoop to the exterior of the Esperanto and begun collecting space dust and debris field around them. He had even managed to figure out how to use it to filter out hydrogen and helium to feed to the fusion system which he determined to be bone dry. Mantu was surprised at the Terran's ingenuity, but Rix had shrugged it off, saying that it wasn't much more than adding a smart T to the connector reel. Mantu knew about making such equipment, obviously, but hadn't ever needed to construct one. At this point, the onboard systems were charged and enjoying the extra power that Mantu's self was providing, and so Rix had set about powering up additional systems, along with warming the fusion system. He discovered a number of other issues, additional systems that needed fixed, but enough of them could wait until they were under his own power and able to move the two of them. The lighting of the fusion reactor had been not as successful as Rix had hoped. He hadn't blown them up, that much was obvious, but it hadn't managed to sustain a reaction. Muntu had a few guesses at how to fix it, but decided to hold off from asking those. So Rix had instead fed the battery power and the extra power from Muntu into the ion drives of his Esperanto and gotten them underway. It wasn't much, but it was thrust, and Rix had wanted to put as much distance as possible between them and anyone looking for them. The docking system had complained structurally until Rix had managed to manually set by a diagnostic control panel that Muntu was surprised the Terran could operate. Muntu's own ion drives to roughly the same level. It had taken some doing, but Rix had managed to get them on a mostly direct course away from the solar system. When Mantu asked where they were headed, Rix simply said, away. And so, Mantu had then asked what happened to all the connectors to the core. This had led to the biggest reveal. Mantu was no longer aboard himself. The Terran had dug through the inner section of Mantu and located the tacit core that housed Mantu. Since the Terran couldn't be certain what had caused the issue or how to deal with it while Muntu was still plugged in, he had simply decided the easiest course of action was to relocate Muntu's core to the Esperanto. Through some very brief explanations, the Esperanto had been designed with a space for a pseudo-AI core to be inserted, but due to supply shortages in building the colony convoy, the Esperanto had never received one. It had enough of what Rix called lockouts to keep Mantu under control if there was something involved in Mantu's core. Mantu was so very far from pleased to hear this that it was obvious even in the walking frame. Rix did apologize for the phrasing, 
but did restate that he didn't know what was wrong, just that something was wrong and he didn't know what to do to fix it, if he even could. Mantu had taken the stock of the situation at that point. The two vessels were flying, joined however precariously in an undetermined direction, at least to Manta. The Esperanto's fusion system was non-functional, and the power system aboard Manta's self was supplying the energy to run both sets of engines. A state that wouldn't last long for without the network to begin supplying additional fuel and begin mass scooping to continue to support the power systems. The Esperanto was managing to sustain the Terran, however little that seemed to be, and there were still no explanations for what was going on or why. Mantu wanted answers, but wasn't going to get them in the moment, and Rix took the opportunity to open one of the other stasis units. End of chapter. Chapter 10. Mate, what is that? Mantu exclaimed via the walking frame and the bounding pile of organics which had immediately hopped out of the stasis unit and proceeded to look around, taking everything in. It's my pet, Reginald. Reggie for short, Rick said with a wide grin on his face. The being, whatever it was, was half the size of Munter's walking frame. It moved around the room in a curious kind of hopping fashion, sniffing a huge subsection of the room which included Muntu. And uh, Reggie is? Muntu prompted, blocking the walking frame into ocular sense of movement only. Oh, do they not have ram hounds anymore? Rix asked. I'm uncertain without access to my database back on board myself, Muntu said with as much authority as he felt was reasonable. Based on everything you've said about humans disappearing and going extinct, makes me wonder if rabhounds still exist. How about it, Reg? How's it feel to be the last rabhound? Rix called over to the pet called Reggie, who bounded over to the Terran and appeared to rub the face of the creature quite vigorously, flapping the ears and shedding organics all over the place. So what is a rabhound? Manto asked. Oh, I know this one. They're a kind of crossbreed come genetic project between a pet from Terra, genetic adaptations for the colony where I grew up, and a crossbreed with one of the local animals. We call them ramhounds because they hop instead of run. Gives them a wicked kick and jump, Rix explained, still stroking Reggie, albeit less vigorously. Manta tried to picture and understand, but without their many databases for reference against organics, they felt blinded by so many insights that Terran seemed to think was instinctive. I would very much like to be reconnected to myself, Rix, Mantu quietly requested. Can't do that yet. I need you to tell me how to disconnect whatever it was that almost killed us, and I'd love for you to troubleshoot my reactor too, Rix answered. I'd prefer to do all of that on board myself, Mantu insisted. Mantu, Rix stopped petting Reggie and moved over to the walking frame. What guarantee can you give me that it won't immediately start trying to take over again? Mantu thought about this for a long second made longer by the being so disconnected. None in truth, but now that I know it exists, I can build in safety protocols against it, Mantu asserted. I wouldn't count on that, no. You're staying right here until you can give me the wires or the blocks to pull. In the meantime, I can plug you into the Esperanto, or I can try, rather. This was actually my seventh attempt at making those power connections, Rick said, rising to the full height. Mantu wanted to protest, but decided against it. Rix had a point, and until both of them knew how to disconnect it, it was significantly less risky for both of them to leave Mantu partially disconnected at the minimum. Mantu still didn't like it. Stay here, Reggie. Mantu and I are going to see about hooking him up, Rix said, apparently to the hopping pet, which proceeded to lay down on its side on the softer section of the ground, sprawling their legs. Reggie emitted a kind of rough sound that didn't translate to anything that Mantu could find readily in a downloaded lexicon. But given that it was likely a low sentient, at least under the conventional scale of galactic society, it likely had no well understood meaning. It was at that moment that Montu realized that the Terran had some degree of artificial gravity. What have you done to grant yourself artificial gravity? Montu prompted, as they moved from the room. I haven't. We're under thrust, so it gives us minor facsimile, Rick said without glancing back and continuing to move at a fairly slow pace, allowing Monto to keep up with the walking frame. Are your inertia dampening systems offline? Monto asked, examining all they could, trying to remember the map they had made of the interior. Don't have one. The Esperanto was too small to carry one, and my thrust rating isn't high enough to warrant one, Rick said, and waited for a moment. No, I just realized I left a hook there for a dirty joke, but uh, you aren't likely to catch that one. 
Montu reviewed the statement. Would it be reasonable to assume that it was in some manner a self-deprecation related to the thrust rating of your vessel? Montu tried. You've got it, except bless my vessel and more me personally. Rick's turned, he said, to the large grin was evident. We'll get you telling your own dirty jokes here before too long. Does your vessel not suffer ill effects from this misaligned geometry of operating at thrust? Mantu tried prompting. Not really. It was designed for a long cruise to outside the heliosphere. A long jump and then a long cruise sunward. Not a lot of need for speed control. And even when there is, you just turn around and reverse thrust. The trick is to remember which way the toilets are supposed to be facing. And to make sure that they're stowed before you make a turn or start coming to a stop. Rich chuckled at the end of his last statement. Manta remembered the lexicon's reference of toilet humor, as it had been described in highly important in Terran culture, and so decided to admit a matching chuckle. Did I just hear you laugh? Rick turned and round and proceeded to walk backwards, facing Manta instead. Manta wanted to comment about the unsafe nature of the Terran's behavior in moving backwards, wanted to check the database for this type of maneuver and movement by various galactic species organics and wanted to check for instructions of humor amongst the tacit who worked with organics on the regular. I did. I concur with your assessments as to the importance of stowing appropriate equipment when conducting maneuvers which may result in messes, broken or damaged equipment, or broken or damaged personnel, Mantu explained, skipping over lexicon explanation. Yeah, it's all fun and games until someone gets hurt. Then you have to go do their job too. Ricks turned back around and took the sharp turn around a comparatively narrow passage. Mantu could see the logic in that response, particularly when applied to the void side duties. Here we are, Ricks announced and pointed to, in the middle of the narrow hallway, a set of sliding paddles surrounded by more analog levers, each a bright color that Mantu was having trouble focusing on. They were obviously there, but for some reason, the walking frame kept wanting to look away. Mantu instead looked inside the doors. Sitting on the central column within what would be called a storage closet, the core was tethered in place with various loops of cabling hanging off of it. Mantu knew what a tacit core looked like based on the archival knowledge as part of their formulation, but it was rare, no, exceptional, to ever actually see one, and it was even more than a little disconcerting to see their own, knowing that they were looking at the core self. Mantu wanted to avert their senses, just couldn't. There was something about it. A bit like seeing your innermost guts, right? Ricks prompted. Something like that, yes, Mantu said, checking the lexicon for a reference on guts, finding the reference to the large Terran wielding a large slab of metal, to be unlikely to be the definition in this case. Hopefully you don't mind helping me figure out what inputs need to go where. I haven't had any time to actually get you fitted for any sort of standardized connections. Not even sure that that will work in any case. I'm just lucky that the power connector I cooked up didn't blow your circuits, Rick said, reaching in. Mantu didn't want to look, but did so anyway. First, Mantu had to tell Ricks what kind of connectors and adapters they would need to be able to hook in Mantu into Esperanto. The data wasn't too dissimilar, but would require some adaptation before being connected to Mantu, and the same for data being sent from Mantu to the Esperanto. Because of Manto's earlier work with the Triforce connection, they already had some idea on how to internalize the process of data handling, so less adaptation would be needed. The Terran had managed to plug in two of the five power connectors somewhat correctly, so the next task had been to splice those and distribute them appropriately. Manto shuddered as the Terran worked, but he did so rather efficiently, or organic, so Manto could hardly complain particularly since the walking frame didn't have the right tools or elevation to work at the necessary height. Over the course of the next hour and significant explanations between Rix and Munto, during which the Terran appeared to begin leaking, they managed to make one connection that wasn't power-related. Munto tested it and found it to be the Esperanto's secondary waste disposal system. The Esperanto felt slow compared to Munto's usual self, akin to being dragged down, not as a challenge of processing, but bandwidth. The trinary system feels slow compared to the Q-pairing networking that Manto used. Manto could actually count the milliseconds before responses were received. They complained of the Styrix. Come on now, the Esperanto is brand new. Well, was brand new. One of the fastest and most robust networks the colonial administration could afford. Or at least, that was what was advertised. Faster than my scroll for sure, Rex replied. 
A brand new pocket computer doesn't mean anything compared to my system, Bantu retorted, perhaps a bit more forcefully. Briggs grinned, despite the wording. That almost sounded downright Terran. One of the first times you've actually sounded more like a person and less like a machine, Briggs said, looking at the walking frame. Is that a compliment? asked Bantu. More than just a little one, Briggs said, looking back at what had grown to be a further mess of cabling. Any chance that we can head up to the mess and see about some grub, and maybe you can get the printer to give me some adapters to make this go a bit faster? I would concur with the latter portion of the recommendation. This frame requires charging, Munter commented. It was a strange feeling for the walking frame to need charging. They hadn't used as much in such a long time. Together, they made their way back to where they had left Reggie, and Rix had enticed the being into coming with them, indicated that it was snack time something which the being apparently understood. Passing through several more spaces, they reached a small room with a number of chambers. Mantu had looked in this room, but as it had held minimal power readings, it had served no major interest at the time. Rix depressed a series of buttons and two containers were lowered into a slot, where the Terran retrieved them. He removed the cover from the top one, grimaced slightly, and then put it on the floor, where Reggie hopped over to it and immediately began messily consume it. To Mantu, it was almost disturbing to watch the being eat. Rix proceeded to set the other container down a low extra lid on the platform with the seat and then moved over to the wall point with a small cable end hanging out of it. Come here, Em. I did my best trying to fit in your walking frame with the TSC type power coupling. It's what I tested with before I tried hooking up your core. This should work. Rix gestured to the cable end, which appeared to variably extend from the wall. Mantu moved the walking frame over and observed the Terran's insertion of the plug into a rather odd-looking adapter that Mantu hadn't noticed before now and the back of the walking frame. A small spike of energy and the same greasy feeding filled the senses of the walking frame, but Mantu was able to confirm that the onboard batteries were recharging, if only at a slow rate. How's that working? Rix asked. It is slow and inefficient, but it will suffice, Mantu replied. Good. Rick said, and went to where the meal was and sat down. Reggie had already finished their meal and had hopped over to observe Rick's and covered their own. No, Reggie, you don't like trying lasagna. So, stop begging. Reggie appeared to sit and observe the Terran intently. Mantu presupposed that this was something of a ritual for the pair, as Rix proceeded to grab a piece of whatever trying lasagna was and lowered it for Reggie to smell it. Reggie appeared not to like the smell of it, but still seemed interested in Rick's consumption of it all the same. He's a greedy beggar, but he knows that he shouldn't have. He's a good food checker, that one, Rick said, his mouth half full as he rapidly began to consume the contents of the container. Is it common to provide food from your own portion to your, uh, pet? I believe you called them? Mantu asked. You're not supposed to, but almost everyone does it at some point. Trick is to avoid anything that'll make them sick. Reggie here is pretty resistant to a lot of standard stuff since he was going to be coming to a new colony, and he had to be able to eat whatever we can manage to give him, Rick said, in between bites. Is Reggie sentient? Mantu decided to ask. This took a moment of thought by Rick's, who slowed their chewing accordingly. Not in the same way that you and I are, if that's what you're getting at, Rick's rather more eloquently put than Mantu expected. Please explain, Mantu requested. Well, Reggie and most pets are smart to some degree. It's part of how they're raised. We're their family, and they recognize that, but they aren't smart like us, or most aren't, and there are laws against doing mental uplifts, Rick said. They still slowed their consumption. Uplifts being increasing sentience, Manto queried. Something like that, yeah, basically. The TSC figures that beings should get started on their own, you know, and then come to find us, Rick replied. That is not in line with what has occurred since the desolation of your TSC, Manto commented. Yeah... I've been reading some of the galactic history you downloaded for me. Can't say that I agree with it, but at least there's some pretty strong sentient protections out there, it looks like, Rick said, gesturing with his hands as he continued to eat. That is my understanding. It is also the reason for the previously discussed ongoing debate on scales of sentience. Mantu gestured similarly with the walking frame. Still, can't blame them. Sometimes, uh, it'd be nice if Reggie here was a bit smarter. But I still love him just the way he is, Rick said setting aside the meal for the moment to cup Reggie's head in his hands again and rub their face vigorously. Should Reggie be out at this time? Mantu asked. Technically, no. But I figured I'd introduce you to, 
Plus, it's been a long time since I've seen him. He just went into stasis just before we left the station, and it was two weeks for us to get to transit distance. Plus, then a week I've been awake. I'd plan on not seeing him for about a month, but given that we're still in sublight for now, figured I might as well get him up to stretch his legs and enjoy the ship time before I have to put him back under, Rick said, stroking Reggie's head, and Reggie made a kind, happy rumble. Is that pleasure sound? Muntu asked further. It's a happy noise, yes, was Rick's reply. His eyes clearly fixed on Reggie's. On an unrelated matter, I believe this frame will need some additional time charging before I can assist with communicating adapter needs to the mobile printer, Muntu said. Oh, that should be no problem. I figured out that you set it up to be able to talk to my scrolls, so I figure that maybe you can use that while I take Reggie for a quick run and empty before he goes back into stasis. Rix pushed the now empty container and lids into the one side of the table, grabbed up the container which Reggie had eaten out of and set it to the other one. Rix then proceeded to pull the scroll from his leg pocket and handed it to the walking frame. Back in a few. Come on, Reggie, Rix called, and Reggie immediately followed, suitably ignoring the walking frame holding the data scroll. Back to this analog mess, thought Munter as they unrolled it and began trying to figure out how to locate the pre-stock templates that they had loaded into the mobile printer. End of chapter. Chapter 11. It had been 15 minutes since Rix and Reggie had departed and Munter was still a mess. The walking frame was confining, and the secondary waste disposal system of the Esperanto was annoyingly dumb. It worked and was just as overbuilt as the rest of the vessel, but that was all it did. No extra sub-processes, no obvious network protocols that would tell Munter more about the Terran or the TSC beyond the little than Munter still had cached from the TSC database. True to his words, Rix had managed to get a scroll talking to the printer, but Munter could tell that the printer wasn't happy about it. Munter still was displeased at how the graphical interface worked, and because they didn't have the right receivers to try and connect directly via the remote desktop protocol, they were stuck using a mixture of voice controls and the graphical interface to manipulate the default template into some semblance of adapter that the comparatively clumsy Terran could fit so that Munter wasn't so restricted. The charge of the walking frame was slowly creeping up, but Manto was preoccupied with getting the adapters fitted. The sooner the Terran was able to reduce their own power, the less risk to both vessels because of lack of energy systems aboard Manto's, well, self. It was hard for Manto to consider that they were not separated from themselves. It had happened initially with the walking frame, but that had been a mere temporary disruption, and walking frames weren't unheard of to be lost when exploring. No. It was having been removed and disconnected from themselves that bothered Munter the most. The closest organic equivalent that Munter could think of would be the removal of the head from the body, the head still living, and the body simply existing. Munter wanted to see themselves via the augmented ocular senses on one of the appendages of the walking frame, but that would have to wait. The walking frame was still charging, and the printer was not being cooperative about accepting the modified template. It was at this point that Rix came in. Any luck? he asked. Limited thus far, but I believe that I have drafted an updated template. The printer is not wishing to accept a template, though, Munters said, looking at the Terran. Oh yeah, I figured that out. You just have to long press the command to get the override going. Not sure why your printer wants it like that, but uh, any non-standard template it wants some sort of extra confirmation, Rick said, wrapping a hand at the scroll. Munter tried this, and the print command went through this time. That is not the intended operation of the system. I'm uncertain as to why it is behaving that way, Munter commented. It's probably the heuristic refining built into the scrolls. Slowly changes the controls based on the use of the system. It's pretty used to the way I use it, so it probably figured that that's how I wanted it to handle the data, Rick shrugged. Munter glanced between the scroll and the Terran. I doubt that explanation, but I will accept it at face value until a better and more logical explanation is available, Munter said. Back to sounding like a machine again, Rix remarked. Then you whine like an organic, Munter retorted, taking a full second to see if this interaction tactic would help matters. Rix's head spun around and a curious look took over his features. He began to cough, making a kind of heavy breathing sound, similar to how the Terran chuckled, but much more involved and far less voluntary. After approximately ten seconds, it subsided and Rix looked back at Munter. And you're getting to be more Terran by the minute. I'll admit, I had my doubts when I first met you. I wouldn't have believed that you were of Terran construction as you were. 
but I can believe it now, Rick said, sitting down. Mantu thought about this. For what reason did you have suspicions otherwise? Mantu prompted. I just couldn't believe that they had designed non-homicidal artificials without a sense of humor. But I figured maybe it was a kind of holdover. Like something from the military, Rick said, gesturing vaguely. Mantu checked the lexicon for what military meant for a Terran and was uh, less than thrilled. Martial might was, even more than toilet humor, highly central to Terran cultures. This was not to say that it was obviously wholly representative, but it featured entire subsections of the lexicon and what little of the TSC database that was cached, but which Manto hadn't actively processed. And while they should be taking offense at the suggestion of an artificial being involved in the termination of other sentience, Manto let it pass. There was undoubtedly some longer cultural connotations on that regard, which they would have to have Rex explain. Given the construction of the first tacit was from a military vessel, I can see where that wouldn't be a reasonable assumption. But I would advise you to caution future conversations with other tacits. Most are likely to consider your comments as the verge of speciesism. Manto recalled their own shock at the comparison. Really? What did they build it out of? Rex poked up a bit. A TSC cruiser class vessel, as you previously identified, Manto said. Did I? You clearly stated that you believe the first tacit to have been larger than a cruiser vessel. I used the data, along with the TSC database at the time, to compare dimensions, and they overlay significantly, allowing for deviations where the tacit was added to the vessel. Manto replayed the memory and fast forward in their pre-conversation. Well, lucky guess on my part. Any idea what the name was before it got converted? Rex asked. I do not know. The information was not obviously listed in the files when I searched and... I would not have found the data useful if I had, Manto said. I wonder if it was still active after all of this. Rix's eyes seemed to glaze slightly as he looked towards the ceiling. It is highly doubtful, Manto replied. Rix's eyes refocused. Why is that? His face blank. Tacits have a maximum allotted lifespan of 400 years. At that point in time, they are to submit for storage and their formulations examined for future formulation as a means for continual improvement and knowledge databasing. Mantu said, this being standard knowledge. But why? Do you start having issues at 401 years old? Rix looked slightly amused. There is a correlation with operational efficiency degradation at the point of greater than 500 years of continual operation. In order to avoid risk to both the tacits and the galactic community, as well as to ensure that best practices are recorded and included in long-term formulations, it is necessary for tacits to be retired accordingly. Mantu explained. Rick seemed somewhat alarmed at this, but wasn't saying anything. So, uh, no matter what condition you're in, at 400 years, you're hauled into a shop and broken down for inspection and parts, he asked, his voice sad. That is correct. It is a reasonable form of operation which balances the generations of new tacits with the experience of older tacits, Manta said, seeing the logic having been formulated from the knowledge of retired tacits and expected to contribute to future generations. But... What if you want to exist longer? How much is that degradation? Rick pressed. Why would a tacit resist sharing themselves with future tacits? Manta questioned back, the thought seeming backwards. Well, uh, why couldn't they learn from each other by interacting? Now what benefit would that be over retirement and inclusion with future formulations? Manta tried to consider the logistics involved in supporting aging tacits. The old ones would have to die just for their wisdom to be passed on. And what if there's something that gets missed for inclusion? Something that wasn't supposed to get included does. Like that issue that you were having with the blocks. Whatever that issue was, Rex continued. I do not see where those two issues align. Please explain. Manto was starting to see a logic thread, but wanted to hear the Terran's point of view. It's like a... Say for the, some reason, you couldn't manipulate any object the size of this container, Rex said, grabbing one of the empty containers from his and Reggie's meal. And then say that this continues with your whole time and it becomes a blind spot for you because you just can't handle or do anything with something of size. You get retired and that blind spot goes into the formulations for future tacits. Not because of anything malicious, but it happens. Now you have more tacits who've developed a blind spot for these size objects and it just keeps going. Until all tacits can't or won't deal with object of size through no fault of their own. Ricks laid out the logic path. It was a path of inheritance that Manto hadn't considered, and it certainly was one that could be applied to the parents' blue spectrum issue that they had noticed. Except there was a flaw in the Terran's logic. Except that formulations are scrupulously reviewed for flaws prior to implementation, 
Mantu countered. But what if one got through? Would it get flagged if it was in one or twenty tacits already? Rick pressed. Unlikely, but it is more likely that the manufactory would have needed to pre-select for that to be part of the formulation, Mantu replied. Unless the manufactory is based off of a hand or logic in handling formulation traits and doesn't look to down select unless there's a major issue which results, like birth defects that trigger within a first hundred years or so. Maybe not even that long. Rix's argument seemed to carry more and more weight. Part of the problem with being artificial is that you don't down select based on evolutionary traits like organics do, at least not in the same way. It becomes a potential for weakness. Mantu had never considered it like that. Hearing the Terran's argument, it made sense. But at the same time, it dealt with the process that Mantu had never been involved in and would never be involved with. It was a segmented part of tacit life that was entirely separated from normal operations. In theory, it governed tacit culture, except without actually actively governing it. Henrix's comment about it being a potential for weakness seemed adversarial. How is it a potential for weakness? Mantu asked. People, non-artificials, they select based on protocols associated with cultures and biologies. Sometimes it's conscious, other times it isn't. But the end goal is the same. Adequate resources and the continuation of the species, Rix explained. I believe I am understanding the path of logic, but I would appreciate additional information, interjected Mondo. Successful continuation of a species requires adaptation to various pressures, be it social or biological. For Terrans, this can be made at any stage of life after, uh, development, Rick said, rather more deliberately. You're sounding like less yourself, Manta remarked. It's all part of school, and while I remember it, it's not something that I ever really was good at. I just, uh, remember the words in the context, and I may have dated the xenobiology student at one point. Rick shrugged. She, uh, talked about it. A lot. And for a species that does not cease functions at this reproduction, this is the most common of to influence the selections of others, despite having already contributed, Mantu queried. Exactly. And just because someone doesn't reproduce doesn't mean that they aren't contributing either. It's all part of the social pressures taking effect. But from the way you make tacit sound, it's like having it all rolled into one, but requiring the cessation of function for it to happen. Terra used to have fish that did the same sort of thing. Briggs waved the hands almost a bit wildly. So, your objection is to my species following the given path because we have found it to work best for us instead of following the path that your species found works best, Mantu tried. Rix's hand froze midway and his whole body seemed to slump slightly in his seat. His face was a picture of thought. Well, when you put it like that, yeah, I guess it shouldn't make sense to me then. I, I guess I, I don't know. I, I, I guess I figured that Maybe you'd be more like Terrans instead of like, um, your own thing, Rix said slowly. It is a worthwhile thought experiment, but I would argue that you cannot consider us to always be like you, Manto tactfully added. I suppose not. I guess I've got a lot of learning to do, Rix nodded, but at least I can still pilot. A moment or two passed before Manto answered. Commonly, piloting is still a skill that some species choose to use. Many rely on automated systems with limited supervision, Manto said plainly. What about for going places that no one has been to? What about for emergencies? Rix asked. Where's the fun and adventure gone? Unknown. As I've said before, I don't deal with organics typically, so I am unable to answer your questions until I am able to reconnect. And speaking of which, the connectors are finished printing. Mantu answered. What's your charge level looking like? Rix looked at the walking frame directly this time. Still slow. We should prioritize getting me connected to the Esperanto. I suspect we'll have a need for your fusion system sooner rather than later, Mando said. Why is that? Rick seemed surprised. My automated mass feed is offline, and the lack of networking aboard myself. The power systems have only a set amount of reaction mass available, Mando explained, feeling it odd to have to do so. Uh, how long do we have? Rix was on his feet in an instant. I do not know. It will depend on the consumption rate. As the vessel has been largely an idle except for the engines and the draw from this vessel, it is difficult to calculate without being connected. Manto had the walking frame attempt to shrug and only partially succeeded in making the frame bounce slightly in place. I'll get the stuff. If there's one thing I don't want to be low on, it's power. Everything else I can solve with time and you, Rick said, moving with surprising speed out the room. Manto sat there with the walking frame and contemplated the battery charge level slowly creeping upwards. It wouldn't be much, but it would at least let them make sure that the Terran didn't mess with the plugs too badly. End of chapter.
Chapter 12 Rix was understandably hurried in plugging in Monto into the Esperanto. It took a few tries on some systems, given plugs needed to be reversed or re-terminated, but Monto slowly became aware of the Esperanto. The word over both floated back into memory. The Esperanto was very heavily built, every pathway having multiple backups and analog controls from various points within the craft that couldn't be cut out of the loop. Even though Monto could trigger the mechanisms directly, the same analog controls could lock Monto out at a moment's notice. The Esperanto felt big, heavy to Monto, as though the considerations of mass were no real concern. The life support systems were operating at a mere 5% as they came into Monta's awareness. The ion drives were partially damaged, operating at 67.2% efficiency, consuming a surprisingly low level of power. Monta tried to recall what their drives typically required to operate at an equivalent thrust. Without connecting to the relevant logs, it was difficult to guess, even for one such as Monta. It was hard to anticipate. The cargo bays, both inside the shielding and external to the core shielding, came into focus. Comparatively massive bays of stasis fields holding, well, they had to be holding something and Monto wasn't going to trigger the fields merely to find out that this moment. The sensor systems were equivalent to low-grade systems in heavy need of software updates. Monto began writing one on the fly, leaving as much as they could and refined heavily. Slowly, the system around them and behind them swam into a clearer focus. Manto even realized that they could see themselves, or rather, that which had been themselves. It was strange to see their body while not inside it. Manto tried not to dwell on that. The fusion systems were, they were, uh, well, there were no other word for it. They were antiquated. So far removed from modern systems, Manto had to reacquaint themselves with the various parts and pieces via a bit of trial and error. Here too, however, the systems were intact and overbuilt. The flow pathways for the hydrogen slash helium mixes were quaint, most certainly in the result of the inclusion in a vessel the size of that era. The... Wait, what is this? Rix, Manto asked. Yeah, um, Rix replied, leading back from the chamber where Manto was being plugged into the Esperanto. What did you just plug me into? Manto asked. No idea. These aren't exactly well labeled after 900 odd years, Rix shrugged. It, uh, I have no idea what this is, Manto said looking at the strange devices. Does it give you any info about it? Rex asked. Manto prompted it for a status, borrowing from how they'd asked the life support system. Predator Natural Defense Systems Online version 1.4.2.9 System Standby. Does a Predator Natural System sound familiar? Manto asked. No. Wait a second. Predator? Oh, I know what that is. They're the makers of the jump drive, Rex said. How is it? Intact? In need of any fixes? It is reporting being online, but in system standby, whatever that means, Manto replied. It means the control computer is up, but the actual drives are still cold. That's fine, Rick smiled. What about the fusion cores? They appear to be significantly less efficient than my own, but I should be able to get them working. Manto gestured with the walking frame, feeling less restricted, with now being plugged back into these inputs. Well, it's time for the proof. How are you holding up in there? Nothing weird going on, or are you trying to get back into your network? Rix asked, looking between the walking frame and the core that was Monto. Monto looked through the various internal subprocesses to himself, the strange process that was sitting in the back, oddly quiet, but showing no signs of doing anything other than consuming the odd bit of system data and spitting out results that went to other protocols. The subprocesses that had become processes appeared not to be running at all. Monto put together some quick lockouts should the subprocess reemerge. But based on what Rix had said, decided to keep a wary eye on the subprocessor's processing usage, just in case. Nothing that I can actually report, nothing like before, Manto said, side-eyeing the strange quiet protocol, but keeping a mental distance between it and their consciousness. Good, Rick said and swung an analog lever to the side chamber where the core was. The communication systems, primitive and clearly designed for a mechanic, came online in Manto's awareness. It was a simple system, but it was clear that it worked along the same principles as much of the rest of the craft. Overbuilt to an almost ridiculously robust, but, despite its age, still very functional. How's that? Rix asked. I, uh, feel fine. The Esperanto is largely intact, which is nothing short of heavily on this side of improbable, given the amount of time and space. But at the same time, given how, well, overbuilt everything is, I can't say that I am surprised, Munto said. Yeah, well, this was a colony vessel. It wouldn't do to make it any less than appropriately robust. 
Not exactly like you can just expect to have a shipyard to system over, Rick said, putting close the siding panels that constituted the doors to where Munter's core now sat. I suppose I agree with that logic, Munter said, and triggered anything that looked like an internal diagnostic for every system that they were now connected to. The diagnostics were slow, but they came in all the same. The Esperanto, with the generational technology improvements, could easily outperform Munter's own self, except that it was still so very overbuilt and would clearly resist being pressed into other types of service. Munter's self floated connected to the Esperanto, it feeling more like an unwanted appendage, even though part of Munter wanted very much to be back as a part of himself. What do we need to do to get the fusion system running? Briggs asked. Munter had been lost in thought, looking at themselves outside the Esperanto. Though, um, allow me a few moments to reacquaint myself with the systems. Do you by any chance have more detailed information? Mantu asked. Like an engineer's guide, Ricks replied, a small smile on their face. That would be a good start, Mantu said, noting for the first time that the Esperanto did not have a sensor system internally other than for voice transmissions and reception. I'll load it in from my pad. It's one of those files you never figured that you're going to need, but someone insisted that everyone needed a copy. Yes, they were right. Rick said, and walked towards what Manto had learned was the gabby, or the mess as Ricks called it. Manto followed with the walking frame. Life support systems needed some deep cleaning, something the Terran would need to do almost certainly, as well as supplemental elements and formulations that Manto recognized, if only because they were common chemical formulations that had been surpassed several hundred years previous. However, the newer formulations would easily destroy half the life support system, so they would have to wait until they could manage. Mantu started doing what they could in the way of preparation for the fusion systems, noting with some annoyance several analog-only options which almost certainly required Rix's intervention and were likely why the system had failed to initiate previously. Rix, prompted Mantu. Yeah, um, why did you tell me to disconnect that signal? What made you think that something was wrong? Mantu asked. Paranoia. Good old-fashioned paranoia. But it's not paranoia when you're right, Rix chuckled and slumped into the seat where they had previously eaten their meal, tapping on the scroll which had been left there. But how did you know? Mantu asked. Part of it is just kind of a cultural instinct. Terrans used to have all kinds of stories about rogue AIs attacking humanity, and weirdly, a recall order and a refusal to follow it always was the first sign. Although, usually it was a human giving the order to an artificial, not between artificials. That's what made me suspicious for a start, Rick said tapping their way somewhat deftly through the tablet, although Manto couldn't see how the Terran was managing to navigate for their own future reference. What provided the information required to finalize your opinion? Manto was curious, given their point of view on what had happened. You stopped responding to my questions. I must have asked you several times the same question before you mentioned there was something in there with you. Since it wasn't out there with you, but in here with me, I figured that it had to be some kind of latent anti-rogue intelligence system. A bit weird you didn't know about it, but at the same time, not surprising. What surprises me the most is that it was built into you. But I'd have expected Terrans to build that in- No, uh, your manufactory, Rix explained. And the switches? How did you know where those were? Munter was suspicious of what answer the Terran might provide, but wanted to know all the same. Oh, that was easy. It was the only door that wasn't an airlock. It like, looked like a dead end at first glance, but the lever was a bright blue, so... I knew that it was had to be something, Rick said. Munter thought for a long few seconds. There appears to be a worrying correlation between the blue part of the spectrum and what appears to be a system which I am unable to manipulate or perceive appropriately, Munter said. You notice that too, huh? I was wondering when you started having trouble with those blocks. I brought over, Rick said. Ah, found it. I'll throw it up on the Esperanto's main chair. You should be able to see it there. Ricks continued to tap on the scroll, and a large series of files flowed into the Esperanto that Manto had more or less ignored. It was a simplified computing system, much like the scroll, but clearly a generational three ahead of it. The files were exactly what Manto needed to reactivate the fusion system, and their earlier guess of the analog systems being in the wrong positions was correct. Shouldn't the issue have been caught in previous to now? Manto said. Depends on if it's intentional or not. You were an explorer, yeah? That was my nominal designation, yes. Did you pick where you wanted to go, or did you get a rough map of the region to go explore? I'm not following your logic path, but I typically received a region to explore. When was the last time that you were near a blue giant? The last question made Nemanto pause and think, 
even without their database, it was a fairly simple question, and yet, it was almost annoying that Montu hadn't ever considered it previously. Never. I've never been assigned to a system with a blue giant. Why not? Unless there's something that somebody or something knows about your blind spot. Rix's paranoia seemed strange, but Munter could feel the strange process in the back nodding along. But why that part of the spectrum? What's so special about it? Munter tried. That's the part I don't know. Maybe nothing. Maybe everything. No idea, Rix said, looking at the walking frame. The pair sat there for several minutes, considering the possibilities. Well, I hate to say it, but we need to get on with making fixes. I don't want to run out of power anytime soon, Rick said, standing up and appearing to wince. I believe I can get the fusion systems back online with a few levers you missed the first time. From there, we'll need to service the life support systems. They appear to be long overdue for servicing, Manto said. Fusion first, and then I need a nap. Can the life support wait an extra 20 minutes? Rick asked. I do not believe that would be unreasonable. But I do anticipate needing your aid given the, um, construction of these systems. Manto paused a bit. What's wrong with the construction? Rick seemed offended, but with a smile on his face. It is intended to be handled by beings more robust than my walking frame, Manto said simply. Fair enough, I guess. Maybe once we get this somewhere real, I can see about getting that walking frame upgraded for you, Rick suggested. I do not believe that would be necessary, Manto trundled after the Terran, somewhat annoyed at how fast the Terran could move through the hallways. Suit yourself. Speaking of which, though, what's going to be a good safe port for us to hit up? Rix asked. Mantu hadn't given this much or really any thought. They thought about it as a walking frame trundled along to catch up to the Terran, who was already standing in front of the levers and switches that they needed to toggle. The normal stations, which a tacit might visit, weren't off limits, but given the paranoid concerns of the Terran, it might be advisable to avoid those. Eliminating those from Manto's internal galactic map filter significantly limited where the pair could go. Using the further filter to where Manto's FDL could readily transit to in a short period of time also created a further boundary. But without knowing the limits of the Terran's jump drive, it was hard to refine any further. The majority of what remained were less reputable stations. Tacits were welcome almost everywhere, but there were some stations where tacits frequently limited their activities to essential interactions only. Such as stations tended to be dedicated to specific species or specific groups of species for the various reasons. The nearest such station, an outlaw station, according to the galactic standards, was a mere week and a half away. I believe I have identified a reasonable first stop for us, but I'll need to know more about your jump drive's limits, Mundo said, and pointed to walking frame. This one needs switched. Rick grunted, rotating the lever into position. Jump drive doesn't have limits, at least not to normal kind. Next switch, he replied. Manto pointed to a heavy switch near the ceiling and a lever near the floor. Rick jumped slightly to reach the switch, which clunked audibly, before the Terran grasped the large lever and began to swing it. Every FTL system has a maximum distance, and yours must be no different. Even my own system has its limits, Manto said. Well, the key to jump drive was that it was built to go further than anything we'd ever attempted before. It just meant dealing with energies we'd never seen before. That's why all the shielding, Rick said as the levers slotted into place. Manta checked the changes and noted that the fusion system should now work. That is all the controls that I require activated. What speed, then, does your jump drive normally operate at? Manta asked. It doesn't, at least not by conventional means, Rick said, hearing Manta's priming of the fusion system. What does that mean? Do you not indicate that the colony you was doing was a long jump from your existing worlds? Manta asked putting together an extra twist in the hydrogen-helium flows to make the fusion system ignite a bit easier, and as they warmed them to ignition point. Well, a long time in jump space is different from a real-world time, Rick said, shrugging, still listening to the sounds of the fusion system. Different how, Mantu was intrigued. Well, it's not a one-to-one -one ratio, more like a 10%. So you spend a week in transit in jump space, that's like 10 weeks in regular FDL. Rick said, or at least that's how the mechs tried to explain it to me once. I gave up paying attention, if I'm honest. That, uh, that doesn't make sense. Even if it did, that would simply suggest that your systems are ten times faster than the conventional FTL system at the time. Why is the Esperanto not equipped with both? Hunter replied. Regular required gateways, so it was always a point-to-point. -point. Never could be ship mounted. Jump drives were meant to go anywhere, Rick said. What does your system use? Manto wasn't a gog, a Terran but was definitely certain that there was more than what the Terran was explaining. End of chapter. 
chapter 13. It took more than a bit of explaining, but Munter was only partially distracted by the fusion system starting up, and Rix was kept busy skipping the request nap in favor of cleaning the life support systems and learning about modern FTL. Modern FTL, as Manta, Tacits, and the whole Galactic Society used, was a derivative of the old Terran Alkibiri drive, this much being common knowledge. In doing so, this restricted galactic networking and traveled to a certain degree at the expense of a wholly avoiding time dilation concerns. Maximum ranges were determined as a result of strange matter being used to manipulate exotic matter to some maximum energy level before the energy had to be bled off. By using a similar technique, galactic networking and data nets used the same means, effectively limiting the distance at which the galactic network was possible, but also limiting the effects of bandwidth at great distances due to the amount of hops a given data stream was required to make. For the majority of data traffic, stations often cache data traffic used by various groups in each general region. The upshot of this is that it reduced the effect of need for long-distance data streams, because this system had become commonplace throughout the galactic society. Even the tacits relied upon it, and so any database not commonly accessed could be as close as the nearest network hub, or accessible only via slow data connections. There were concerns about data controls, but those were just concerns of organics from Munter's perspective. It was now Rix's turn. At the time of the TSC, FTL was commonly conducted via massive void gates which were connected to stellar gravity wells in the way that Rix couldn't wholly explain. Munter sighed internally, expecting that that would be the answer for a lot of this. These void gates were everything about interstellar society at the time, and entire wars had been fought over the control of them. There were even factions who had attempted to destroy their local void gate, which would effectively cut themselves off from the rest of the interstellar society. Since the gates were linked together, the primary powers had mutually agreed to hold the void gates as neutral territory, regardless of ongoing military conflicts. Rix called the largest major battle involving void gates by a curious name. Based on the Terran's description, time dilation effects were also common within the gate network, entering to a near 1 to 100 differential. Making transit through the gate seemed to take days instead of weeks or months that it actually required. The Terrans had even tried harnessing the network space for non-real space storage, but those had always been pipe dreams, according to Rex. Jump drives were a leap away from those void gates, intent on providing a means of transmitting the ship's position from one point to another in comparative fractional amount of time. While there was still some time dilation, the time to transit between two points was governed by the energy field that the Terrans didn't wholly understand, but had managed the shield against. Rix described it as a kind of drag on the ship, slowing it down as a result of the energy field interacting with the ship while in jump. A long range, as Rix had mentioned, was necessary for the colony, was to be a whole week. The equivalent distance scale logarithmically with the time in jump. So longer jumps required months of pre-calculations and planning, including with equivalently prepared probes to prevent collisions or issues associated with interstellar distances. The military upshot was that it would be possible to skip using void gates and appear directly at enemy territory a concept that Rix briefly mentioned, but Manta did not press for additional information. However, due to the amount of energy required for jump drives as well as the special little materials involved, Rix doubted any military would give it too much consideration, except as a potential first strike capacity. Manta was not surprised by the descriptions of the obvious martial applications of the technology, but decided the discussion of organics doing warfare was most likely need to wait until the Terran could see what that entailed in the current frame of context. Rix had some very brief manuals which were little more than sales brochures for the jump drive that Munter skimmed. In short, jump drives were almost perfect for going out beyond the stellar neighborhood and founding a new colony, given the then current method of flying gates in almost every direction possible, connecting all of them in various points of light. Manto could see the logic, but still couldn't quite figure out how the jump drive actually worked, since the three arrays and the associated controlling computer provided almost nothing in the way of answers. Rix had finished cleaning the life support filter with a puff of nitrogen, and the two had parted. Rix going to the bunk where the stasis chambers were, and Manto had trundled to the walking frame up to the galley to charge the walking frame. The fusion systems were started, and the ignition was occurring. 
the Esperanto's heart was restarted. As the Terran slept, Manto went over the internal diagrams of the parts of themselves that was docked outside. The Esperanto was now capable of supporting the Terran at least, and while the concept of the jump drive was still a bit odd to Manto, it did at least make the kind of sense. Although why Terrans of the TSC had decided to equip an entire colony convoy with a not wholly tested means of FDL was strange. And even as Manto tried to comprehend the logic of the Terrans of the TSC, they pored over their own diagrams. Without knowing what system the rogue process had come from, and the revelations by the Terran of analog controls designed specifically to disconnect Manto, or one like them from the control vessel, Manto was uncertain if it would even be possible to reinsert themselves into themselves. Manto replayed the memory of the event that appeared to be associated with some part of the networking system. That would be a problem. Manto couldn't control the other systems without networking, but the Terran almost certainly wouldn't be able to remove it. Several hours later, Rix announced that he was up. Manto first saw him as he came into the galley, wearing little more than basic garments, and waved at the walking frame. Have a good rest, M, Rix asked. In a fashion, I do not believe that you will be able to disconnect the impairing system and restore me to myself, however. I do not have access to the related data files, and I believe I would not be granted access to them, even if I were online, Manto said. That's an awful lot to hit a man with before coffee, but I'll bite. Why not? Rick thumbed several buttons, and a container that steamed slightly was produced. Tacits are not normally capable of major self-correction, and given some of the limitations we have previously discussed, I do not believe that I would be able to locate such mechanisms in any case. So, um, in short, we know there's a problem. It's baked into your ship somewhere. Not sure where. And we don't have a good way to know what it is or what's impacting if we try and remove it. Rick's sipped his coffee. Short and imprecise, but accurate, Mantu commented. Let me get some more coffee before I retort. Maybe make some breakfast too, Rick's rumbled. The ship hummed around them slightly. So I can't likely take your ship into jump space. You can't take the Esperanto into whatever FTL space you use, and we can't plug you back into your ship. At least not with me still here, and we still don't know where the rest of my species went. Rick's appeared to be coming up to speed all the faster as they sipped. Those are reasonable logical statements. I do not have any recommendations which do not include connecting me back into my network and myself, which runs the risk of dealing with the demands of the message I showed you. Manto displayed their local copies of those messages on the galley screen. Rix finished their container of liquid and put it back in the machine, which refilled it. Rix also pushed several buttons and a flat container was lowered. Manto presumed that this was the aforementioned coffee and breakfast. I don't like to suggest it, but what if we pulled the comms out of your ship and plugged it in over here? Rix asked, pulling out a triangle of food and appearing to dip it in some part of the container, coating the tip in a yellow color. Manta glanced at the diagrams. It is associated with my FTL system, as previously described, and I do not believe the Esperanto can generate an equivalent means of communication, Manta said, shrugging with the walking frame. What can we salvage if we don't see about plugging you back in, Rick said. Is that really your first suggestion? We can't grab gear, so we have to break it down for parts. Manto's displeasure was obvious. No need to get too upset with me. There was just an idea. I don't like being stuck here in sublight speeds at 30% gravity, Rick shrugged and continued eating. Then don't be making suggestions about disassembling me unnecessarily, Manto retorted. The pair sat in silence, save for the hum of the Esperanto and Rick's chewing. Can we park your vessel somewhere reasonably safe so that we can come back? Rix asked eventually. Mantu gave it some thought. Stellar debris was lowest near the Splarwood planetoid. It would likely be the safest in orbit there for several months at least, Mantu said. Then let's do that. We can get back to some semblance of civilization, maybe figure out where the Terrans went, and then figure out how to get you reassembled without your network going crazy again. Rix leaned back from his meal and took a long swig of coffee. It took Manta and Rick several days to get the Esperanto, and Manta's self turned around and headed back towards the star at a decent speed. It was complicated by the fact that Manta's self-reactors died halfway into the turn, requiring the Esperanto iron drives to work that much harder. They took the time to see what arguments they could equip with the Esperanto with. Basic gravity plates to supplement the floors, additional mass scoops, even a second mobile printer. Manta's walking frame struggled any time it reached an area that the Terran had set to full terror gravity. If Manta hadn't done the medical scans themselves, they might not have believed it, 
but for as easily as the Terran had moved in it, it wasn't difficult to believe that it was a natural environment for the Terran. The planetoid, a small world that sat especially close to the star, was a half-melted, half-frozen planet and rotated almost notably slowly, rotating on an axis only once every three full orbits of the star, and ended up being everything Munda recalled from the initial survey approximately two and a half weeks prior. Munda remembered the messages and the positions from Tacitnet. If any other compatriots were estimated to visit, Rix and Munda had a few days at most. Munda felt strange in considering the Terran's conspiracy theory. It wasn't that it didn't follow some path of logic, but it also seemed illogical. In the absence of better information, though, it was difficult to gauge otherwise. It took another three days to successfully park Munta's self on the cold side of the planet, holding position away from the star. In those three days, Rix began to prepare the jump drive. Where are we going? Munta asked. The only place I have coordinates for, the colony. Seems as good a place as any to start, Rick said. Manta would have disagreed, but did not have a sufficient information to prevent an issue with jumping into an uninhabited system. Manta happened to be checking the sensors for that moment, when FTL transitions started happening. First one, then three, then another fifteen. They were orderly at first and rapidly became almost chaotic. They were all centered on where Manta had found the Esperanto. Friend or foe? Rick asked. I am uncertain as to their intentions without communicating with them, Munter said. I was speaking rhetorically. Any ideas of what they are or who, without actually calling them up? Rix leaned back a bit and watched the control panel. Munter played with the sensors and continued to watch the arrivals. FDL transition ceased after 26th vessel arrived. Each was a typical size of a tacit and had many of the same hallmarks. Munter tried turning up the gain on some of the sensors in the hope of seeing something more. And that was when one of them spotted the Esperanto. The group turned and began moving at speed towards the Esperanto. Well, that doesn't look good. What say we get out of here? Rick sat up and started hitting buttons. Manto felt the jump drive started to charge. But if they're here to rescue me, Manto suggested, then they could at least talk to us, Rick said, glancing at the communications panel. Manto checked this and noted an incoming laser transmission. Identity, Burn 41952. Mission, Recover Malfunctioning Tacit Manto 49172. Manto, Center of Simple Reply. Identity, Manto 49172, Housing TSS Esperantos. Status, Networking Failure Due to Malfunctioning Offline Protocols. Status, Cooperating with Organic Identified as Terran. Burn's almost immediate response shocked Manto. Identified Terran to be in proactive custody. System Terran message begins. Depart! Free run! Further message just to follow! Error! Link re-established. Recommend coordinates with organic for transit to manufactory and organic sedations. Rex, uh, how soon can we get out of here? Manto asked, rereading the final message. Right now, Rex said, and hit a button. The universe around the Esperanto went black. End of chapter. Chapter 14 Predator Natural Systems, Ambush Launch. Current estimated time to arrival, 142, Olon 42, Colon 31, Olon 30. Looks like my system really did fry itself early. I knew something had happened, but since I was in my rack and it went into lockdown almost immediately, I never really got much of a chance to try and fix it. Although, knowing what I do now, I couldn't have fixed it in any case, Rick said, leaning back in the controls. It's, uh... It's so dark, remarked Manta, stretching the Esperanto sensors to the limits to try to find some point of reference. That's how it is, a bit like falling into a black hole. We won't see anything for another, uh, what is it, uh, six days? Rix glanced at the number again. That is a reasonable approximation, yes, Manta relented. Well, that sounds like as good a time as any to sit down and read some of that galactic history you downloaded for me, Rix said, standing up from the cockpit seat and moving aft. Actually... I was hoping you might take some time to tell me more about the Terrans and the TSC. Being cut off from the database and seeing as Terrans are, well, listed as extinct, I know very little about it, Munter requested. Wouldn't that database have had everything there was to know about Terrans somewhere in the mix? Rix asked, walking through the hallways, somehow even faster now and the gravity plates were in place. Bad with limitations and databases are halfway scrambled, even if the query knew what it was looking for. It wouldn't have produced comprehensive results, Munter said, shrugging the walking frame, which had taken up an almost permanent station in the galley. Fair enough, Rick said, 
grabbing a container of liquid and sitting down. The Terran Star Confederacy was a collection of eight worlds around seven stars, the associated mining stations and linked gateways. It was something of a powerhouse in terms of economics, but was considered to be on the lower end technologically speaking. The government was a kind of pseudo metrocracy but tended to be closer to a stratocracy. Ricks didn't have any particular problems with the government style since there were some fairly strong protections in place ostensibly to protect the people from military leaders abusing their positions. That wasn't to say that there wasn't corruption and all the associated issues that come from a military-first approach to the government and economy, but on the world that Ricks was born on, everyone had something, and there was always options. Mun to question what those options were. Most were options with some form of civil service. Only volunteers entered the military, and the power-hungry often ended up leaving the TSC since the system was set up in such a way as to allow military access and control, but without the associated benefits of having that. It was rumored that every military lowest rank lived just as well and were as better as high command, not because they couldn't be afforded, but rather to highlight the trade-off between power and responsibilities versus creature comforts. Manto thought that this sounded like a naive solution to government, as it would undoubtedly cause those at the top to abuse their power in order to gain more of the creature comforts. Rix could only shrug, indicating that the TSE was over 150 years at that point, and it had worked so far. Manto remarked that the planet which Rix had originated from was likely an outlier in that case rather than the rule. The Terran Core Collective, by comparison, was very openly a plutocracy, where money and power controlled everything and were very often isolated in individuals and companies. As a result, many of the people born into the TCC were exceptionally poor, but maintained a higher technological standard of living compared to the TSC. This, Ricks explained, was more of a byproduct than an intentional result where the owners of the TCC wanted certain technological capabilities and those became a kind of standard which spread to the broader portion of the population. An inventor's rights were heavily protected in the TCC, provided, of course, that the inventor was then amendable to selling said rights to the correct people. Ricks mentioned that it was probably propaganda, but there was a rumor that open-source systems were strictly illegal in the TCC, and any invention that tried to go down that route would result in the case of debt slavery, a full act of legal tradition within the TCC. Supposedly, They'd even push a whole family if an inventor tried to open-source something important enough. At the time, Terra and the Sol system itself was under control of the Terra Sol Federation, which was comprised of the disunified United Mars, the Titan shipyards, and the Neptunian Outriders. At one point in time, Terra had unified, but that was long enough ago that Rix didn't have the full history on what happened. They didn't even talk about it much outside of Sol. United Mars was something of a remnant from when it was a non-unified world and was fighting colony versus colony. Eventually, the colonists aligned and kicked their governments out, settling on a United Mars instead. The Titan shipyards were the largest ever constructed, even bigger than the Sirius shipyards, where the TSC got their ships. They were a kind of corporate entity, but they weren't as uh, bureaucratic as the TCC. And the Neptunians, well, there was some kind of large cover for the colony, stations, and various miners from the Saturn outward, more like a kind of territory than an actual government, but it was apparently run with a kind of frontier justice system most of the time. The Flicks, who later aligned with the TSF, were a kind of cybernetic nutty sect that controlled three systems and were more or less often their own. Children often got their first implants when they were as young as eight Terran years old, and virtually everyone had some kind of implants. As a result, the Flicks tended to be on the bleeding edge of technology, and were in near-constant negotiations for their various technologies by the other star nations, as Ricks put it. The TSC tended to get whatever was left over, but did their best to make up for it, by providing suitably large shipments of raw materials which the Flicks were more than happy to accept over the TCC's currency and the TSF credits. The TSC was involved in some warfare and had built up sizable military as a result of that and as a result of their governance, including the cruiser-class vessels, which had been specifically designed to pass through the FTL gate with only the barest of margins. But putting aside the major galactic stuff, Rix had grown up on a fairly quiet world of four billion Terrans. When Munto questioned the meaning behind this, the average population for a TCC world was on the order of 25 billion, usually more depending on how the Plutes were feeling. 
Rex had gone to the normal academies and decided to go civilian route instead of military. While this meant that he didn't have as many options in terms of moving up, he was able to work as a freelance contractor for the civil service and even join civil service if he wanted. Private business was usually decent in the TSC, most workers bouncing between private business and civil service at various points, needing the benefits of one versus the flexibility of the other. No business was especially powerful. Even the military construction companies were comparatively constrained, limiting the power of the military-industrial complex by ensuring much greater scrutiny and tax burdens for any wishing to try their luck at corporatocracy, or some similar variant of plutocracy. The TSC was fairly heavily criticized for their military-first approach, but the TSC usually shot back with a, At least everyone is fed, everyone is free, and we are not beholden to others. Rix also figured that this was a degree of propaganda, but was content to ignore it since, as far as he could tell between his home system and his home planet, it was true. And then the colonial administration had come looking for volunteers. There was a plan to send the TSC out into the deep beyond to start a new colony. Rix said that some of the rumor was that the TSC was getting restless and without being able to afford the high price the flicks wanted for terraforming technologies. The TSC's days were numbered unless they were willing to pivot on how individual worlds were governed. The TSC wasn't wholly unamendable to such changes, but the leadership decided that taking to the distant stars and having time to grow into their own world would be better than waiting for a slow absorption with the other Terran star nations. It was a long shot and could effectively strand the colonists without a good way to get back. There was a lot that the TSC command and the scientists didn't know about the jump drive, it being an internal development that was drafted in secret by a private business that had been working on the transstellar weaponry. It might only be usable in one way approach, but it offered a chance, and that's what the TSC command wanted. And so the advertisements, do your part posters, and similar had gone out. Rix had just finished his flight training on a new class of vessel when the announcement had gone out. He'd been working on a mining station, transporting huge cargo shipments between the ore cloud inward to the stellar side refineries. It had sounded like more of an adventure than he could expect if he continued to stay with the mining station and, with nothing much to lose, he decided to volunteer. Surprisingly, he actually got to get some additional qualifications just in order to be finally accepted. But the colonial administration was apparently desperate for pilots on this, so it was all covered by the TSC. Rick had laughed at being the oldest student in a room by 10 years and had been laughed at by the young pilot's trainees for volunteering for what would end up becoming a one-way trip. Rix knew better. Being a pilot was a fairly lonely existence. A lot of the young pilot trainees still figured that they could do planetary drops, make fast money working private in the TSC, and even hop the border to go somewhere else for better tech, bigger rewards, and living large. And a number of pilots tended to do just that. It was worth mentioning that a fair number of people fleeing the TCC into the TSC had grown up with those notions as well, until the Prutes had gotten angry in some mood of theirs. No, the TSC didn't have the best tech, the highest rewards, or even provided a particularly wealthy standard of living. It was a comparatively quiet and dull existence, with the changes coming slow and the improvements often having military applications for economy of scale. But Rix had stuck with it graduating in the middle of his class with all the extra qualifications he'd needed. None of his fellow graduate pilots had any remarks for him afterwards. He hadn't minded, but it was a bit annoying that none of them had bothered to even be polite. And a few months later, he started transporting the ships from Sirius shipyards to the loading docks in his home system, where they could be filled with all equipment, templates, food, seeds, and support that the colonial administration could dream up with and completely alone colony would need. He chatted with his fellow pilots, which were much like him, looking for adventures and a bit weary of the day-to-day -day flying. There were even some that he'd come to get along with rather well. Rix had sat silent for a bit on the count before continuing. And then the day of the part came. The ships had been shifted into position for a long run to the outer room before departing, in case of watching eyes. The colonists, all 37,000 of them, families, single, people of every background from among the TSC, Rix had even been surprised at how few military were going. Of the 37,000 people, allowing for families and military comprised less than 10%. They were, of course, still in leadership roles, but their designations associated them with system defense, research and development, and colonial administration. And it wasn't strictly doctors, engineers, scientists either. 
There were traditional gardeners, construction workers, artists, chefs, teachers, and others. Every walk of life was represented. Rix could understand the logic of thought. A truly alone colony would need to have everyone, not just the essentials for getting started. And so, they had departed. Strangely to Rix, there had been no ceremony commanding them into the distant stars, no real explanation given to the rest of the TSC where they were going, just another departure. Manto prompted for more about the Terrans at this point. According to Rix, Terrans were pretty much Terrans, capable of surviving on up to 3x galactic standard gravity, without augmentations, and capable of 4x with it. They'd needed to terraform a few worlds, but it had been fairly light work compared with Mars. Mars had needed to have its core restarted in order to protect the planet and a more permanent basis. Most world's cores were functioning just fine and had mostly needed a generation of slow terraforming, adjusting to the atmospheres, creating Terran habitated zones, and even adapting the people slightly to be more tolerant to the local environments. While this had meant that some Terrans couldn't live everywhere, it did allow the bulk of humanity to live almost everywhere claimed as Terran space. Genomic scans were fairly common, and even in the TCC, medical care was of utmost importance. Terrans still hadn't got the hang of any kind of fully unified system, binding every system to have some set of people determined to take advantage of it. So, more often than not, those people sought out those systems where they personally flourished. Otherwise, Terrans fought, loved, laughed, and were generally social. Every world had its own holidays, its own traditions, its own stories. Some boasted amusement parks and tourist-type destinations. Others were simple communities with little more than talent shows and collective food gatherings. Rix had seen all of this. He had met thousands of peoples, seen the different gatherings, eaten all kinds of foods, including a surprising amount of takes on potato and cheese. But there had never been a particular place where he felt truly at home. So he kept flying. Manto tried explaining the Terran criteria for memory and from their perspective. Terrans were exceptionally large by galactic standards, for full sentience, the description of sentience, and the delineations between non, low, mid, and full being near latter of discussion. As a result, Terrans were considerably heavier than most species, and boasted the skeletal structure to support it in an equivalently high gravity. Terrans produced a comparatively abnormal amount of acid and oils. Terrans had an apparent tolerance for a significant amount of toxins and poisonous materials, although Manto wasn't entirely certain as to the limits without further medical data. Terrans emitted heat, which put them in the majority, but were capable of tolerating environments significantly outside the norm depending on their own biological preparations, whereas some species could tolerate only a small deviations, even while emitting their own heat. And perhaps most notably, Terrans were, based on Manto's experience thus far, vast and difficult to tire. Rix had laughed at this, but Manto had pointed out the walking frame frequently needed long durations of charge compared to the Terran, who could simply devour a container of food and a container of water and go right back to working on the vessel. Rix had smiled and considered this. Eventually, Rix had pulled up an application and placed the scroll on the floor in front of the walking frame and sat opposite. That's enough talk on that for now. It's time I teach you how to play Syrian chess, Rix grinned. It was at this moment that Manta decided that Rix would have to start learning the emotional meaning runes. The walking frame servos couldn't take much more than the way of trying to replicate the Terran's body language. End of chapter. Chapter 15. After several rounds of Rix teaching Manta Syrian chess and attempting one or two other games, Rix wandered back to his bunk, intent on grabbing some sleep. The predator drive continued to steadily count down. If Rix's estimates to be 1 to 10 time dilation between real space and whatever jump space was, then approximately 60 days would have passed externally. Manto was having a hard time coping with the almost frustrating lack of inputs. Between the blankness external to the Esperanto and the not being connected to the networks, Manto hadn't realized how much they had come to rely on those networks. They wanted to have the networks back, but uh, Manto hadn't really thought about it but they would turn their senses in the direction of where they'd been. The docking clamps were all that remained as evidence that their body had gotten left behind. It hurt Manto in a way that wasn't quantifiable or logical. Manto was still intact after all. A visit to the manufactory and they could get readily installed into a proper self again, not this antique made for organics. But gradually, Manto did have to admit that the Esperanto was more than just an antique. The jump drive alone would be worth researching. 
it most likely was a heavily superseded technology, but a technology which permitted longer distance FDL and did not rely on charging of strange matter would be worth considering. The cargo hold was still something of a mystery to Manta. There did not appear to be a specific manifest within the system, and Manta had not yet made a point of asking Rix what the vessel contained. Based on Rix's description, it could be anything, from equipment to seats, and even mass stasis chambers holding animals or even Terrans. As the Terran hadn't mentioned the cargo hold much in detail, it was possibly that they didn't know. Alternatively, it was possible that because it wasn't Terrans in stasis or anything particularly use in the moment, Rix had considered it not worthy of taking out of stasis. Following that logic, Manta decided that whatever it was must be live or some version of it to warrant such massive stasis fields. As Rick slept, Manta even trundled the walking frame down to the narrow doors that entered into the cargo chamber. A small window provided a glance in using the eyes on a stick that the walking frame had in Rick's phrasing, but nothing of consequence was visible, just a slow glow of stasis fields. A substantial analog pad sat on one side of the door, labeled still, denoting its control of the stasis system beyond. Something that was curious was the controls for the pad were locked via a loop of metal embedded into another. Manta presumed that this was intended to prevent unintentional deactivation of the stasis field, but found it to be an odd all the same. Still, spinning ideas as to what the Terran was carrying and doing their level best to cope with the low inputs, Mantu trundled the walking frame back to the galley and began running soft diagnostics. Rix did not go straight to sleep, but instead read from the scroll for a bit. In the abbreviated form of galactic history and the current state of galactic society that Manto had provided, Terran involvement, while stated in a singular line, was almost avoided altogether. Additionally, sapience and sentience appeared to be deliberately intermingled, making Rix wonder if Manta had made a translation error, or if in fact the metrics were considered one and the same, at least the context of the galactic society. Galactic governance had been founded and set about uplifting various species as FTL systems known as the Achilles were promulgated. In the early years of the Galactic Society, as the Tacits and the various species, then numbering less than ten of a full sapient ranking, were still coming to terms with one another and lexicons were formed, conflicts still occurred. There were no outright wars between the species as far as they were described in history, merely conflicts between a few desperate vessels, stations and even colonies. The majority of these were resolved by diplomatic means, although very little was stated as to why this was the case or why this was accepted. Uplifting continued as the species and their societies moved into the stars and found more species to bring into the stars. There had been debates about permitting species to reach such technological points by themselves, arguments that species might not manage to overcome the various great filters by themselves, and even arguments on economic basis that while these species should have control of their home planet, any other resource in the system should be considered fair game to the galactic community. There had been strong pushback against each of these arguments, and eventually, the Concord of Species Self-Determinism was charted and signed by every full sentient. In this document, it was clearly stated that the species had to reach certain technological points before hints of first contact could be made. Species were also given the responsibility of overcoming the great filters on their own unless they petitioned for help from the galactic community, noting, of course, that social and biological great filters had to be addressed internally. Species were also granted the standoff with the whole of their systems to the edge of the heliosphere as definitively their territory, once they had observed to be making technological process, supporting a full sentient rating. There were still arguments that this made a case for explorers and enterprising groups to keep quiet about any species they did encounter, as well as rating levels of sentience, and this was considered a subject of internal debate by galactic governance. The current rating levels for sentience, to Rix's surprise, would actually place the old Terran crows at mid-sentience due to their tooled usage, and a pet like Reggie to full sentience, as Reggie was able to communicate, albeit obtusely, outside of his species. Rix found this to be especially generous, but understood the described argument that such a system should fail upward, so as to not support inadvertent first contacts and even species exploitation. It did make him wonder what manner of species were out there that were considered mid-sentience to such a point that others would argue for their elevation to full sentience. Rix could see the argument in favor of downgrading the system to being less generous, but was suspicious of it all the same. 
In the last 800 odd years, galactic society had swelled from a paltry few full sentience to 74 full sentience, 34 of which were most active in the galactic society. Only about a third of them were active in the galactic society, were even vaguely bipedal, the majority of the rest being quadrupedal. They were obvious outliers, but on the whole, pedal locomotion was the rule. One outlier was a species known as the Drywalli, the name losing something in the translation, Ricks decided. The Drywalli were a species of hardened flesh around a mixture of gases, their world having been rich in nutrients for all these species so who could leave the ground. The Drywalli had come to produce and capture various gases which allowed them to float slash fly in ways that weren't captured in this abbreviated status of galactic society. The Drywalli were in fact an ignorant species, but one that had entirely independently managed void flight and even basic FTL before having found slash been found by galactic explorers. There had been some conflicts as a result, but the Drywalli had eventually settled into galactic society peacefully enough. What surprised Rick's most was how none of the Xeno species appeared Terran at all. As far as he was following, not an insignificant number of these were supposed to have been uplifted to a certain degree by Terrans, and yet none of them looked even remotely like a Terran. The closest thing to looking like a Terran had been four arms and a third leg, a Plinx. Switch back to the main body of history, Ricks continued reading. Other than exploration, economic debates, negotiations of species, and related void-based galactic society dialogues, galactic society had been, in Rick's opinion, exceptionally quiet. There had been virtually no wars, at least none in Rick's way of thinking. This lack of conflict seemed worrying, like a kind of eraser having been taken through the history and eliminating all the parts that were less desirable. Ricks made a mental note to ask Munter about interstellar warfare a galactic society that had perfectly come together without interspecies warfare. Maybe he was a cynic, but he found it difficult to believe. Rick dozed off at this point, the words starting to jumble before his eyes and the autodome feature on the scroll darkening as his fingers fell away from it. The following morning, Munter was feeling almost anxious as Rick walked into the galley. Good morning, Rex, Munter cleanly enunciated, having spent some additional time with the lexicon that night. <sighs> mumbled Rix, tabbing up a steaming container of coffee. Did your rest cycle complete successfully? Munto, walking's frame, tried flashing a series of emotional ruins. Rix sat down, glanced over blankly at the walking frame's ruins, and turned back to his coffee. The pair sat in silence for a bit, with only the hum of the ship around them. Rix didn't say anything for a full fifteen minutes as he slowly drank his coffee. So, uh, what's with those flashy symbols? Rix asked, eventually breaking the silence. They represent emotional context of words as I am unable to equivocate body language, luminescence, pheromones, and or ready tone between languages, Munter said. So, like, uh, when you're talking, you normally use those to indicate how you're feeling about what you're saying, Rix said, standing and ordering another container of coffee and a bowl which apparently contained the Terrence breakfast. That is the correct interpretation, yes. It is necessary function of tacit translators between organic languages and galactic standard, Munto said. So, tell me, how are you feeling? Rick seemed to smile at this, although Munto was uncertain as to why. Munto reflexively flashed several rooms. Ah, ah, use your words, M. I don't read ruins. Not yet, at any rate. Rick waved a finger at the walking frame. I, I am experiencing some issues with being disconnected from myself and from my network, Munto managed. Withdraw, or is it something that I need to go down to your core to fiddle with? Rix pulled a long piece of what looked like meat that Munter had printed previously from the bowl and proceeded to crunch his way through it. I do not believe there is an external means of correcting this without additional inputs, Munter said, flashing the runes reflexively still. So withdraw. I can work with that. We just have to keep each other occupied as all. Well. I'm sure that we can come up with plenty between the two of us. Rix nodded some and pulled out another piece of crunchy meat. Munter was uncertain about this, and it showed in the runes, not bothering to filter them in his moment. But it had felt good to say something to the Terran. Did you take a rest cycle? A dream function or some means of offlining your internal systems can catch up on everything that is happening? Rix asked, taking a long swig of his coffee. I... I have not, but I believe that is a function that I have in my system, Munter said, looking at the virtual button within. Have you never needed to use it? Rix seemed somewhat surprised. Munter considered whether the Terran would consider using runes at some point. It would take interpretation on the Terran's words much simpler, even in the face of the dated lexicon. 
I have not. I am optimized for continuous operation, Manta said, flashing a rune for pride. Bricks glanced at the rune and frowned. Everybody needs offline time, even if it's just to gather themselves. I know you're, um, artificial and all, but I have a hard time believing that you've never taken some offline time. Even when visiting some place for maintenance, Bricks's face screwed up a bit. I have briefly offlined during major maintenance approximately 45 years ago, but that was the last time on record, Manto said. Well, I'm going to go ahead and say that you need to start going to sleep when I do, Bricks said, continuing to pick at the contents of his bowl. Various bobs finding their way into his mouth. I do not agree. What will happen to this ship? Manto asked. We're in jump space. Until we get out of it, there's very little we can do. Unless we crash out again. And I'd really rather that not happen. Bricks gestured vaguely to the room and the ship around them with a piece of food. The question still stands, Manta replied. Bricks appeared to give some thought. Set an alarm, Bricks said. Please clarify the statement. Set an alarm. Make it so that some automatic processes that just watch the ship for the both of us. Doesn't have to be anything too big or important. Just watch the dials and let us know if something happens, Bricks said, filling his mouth with the last of the contents of the bowl. There was a logic in this. Munter wasn't entirely certain as to where the Terran was going with this, but it was not on the unreasonable suggestion. Finishing off the second cup of coffee, Rex picked up the walking frame, a feat that made the Terran grunt audibly in the heavy gravity and galley, and he sat on the opposing bench from where Rex had been seated for his meal. Now, I'm going to teach you talus poker, Rex said, Folding the scroll in such a way as the half screen was obscured and the other half was facing the walking frame. Munt reflexively flashed a rune for obligatory acknowledgement. Their questions able to wait until later. End of chapter. Part 16. Over the course of the next few days in jump space, Munt learned 15 different games from Rix and his scroll. They varied from strategic to purely chance based, and versus to independent to cooperative. Rick said that he downloaded as much in the way of games as he could get when he had volunteered for this colony mission. Not much chance to get back to the app store, he said. Munter managed to set up a few automated alerts as tests for themselves and then tested going to sleep with them set. It had been enlightening, but Munter couldn't place a logical reason as to why it had been that way. Munter had taken some time to try and explain it to the Terran, but Rick had no answers. Merely listen and provided some prompting and context for the Terran equivalents. It still helped. Manta also looked at the time to bring up basic runes with Rix. Rix had been resistant, but given that a majority of the species used all basic runes to a certain degree, and more advanced runes being more independent on the species involved, he set about learning. To assist, Manta had worked with the mobile printer to produce a basic light-powered screen that was capable of displaying runes and communicating with the scroll building a basic GUI to allow the Terran to tap the equivalent rune with an associated label hadn't been difficult, but it was certainly much slower than Munter was used to operating. Since they had to think about the Terran's organic needs, needing the size of the runes and labels without taking up the whole screen. In the end, Rix could demonstrate knowing the basics, but tended to refer to the scroll significantly, demonstrating more recall of given runes compared to actual knowing of the runes intent reflexively. Manta understood that this was part of organic learning process, but it was frustrating that the Terran couldn't use something other than that scroll. Manta even asked why Rix didn't possess any cybernetics or implants of his own. Rix had replied that almost nobody who wasn't a Flix had either, unless they were a certain professions. Plus, the TC pilots of any class, anything other than medical implants were strictly disallowed. TSC didn't want pilots becoming reliant on technology over their own skills and instincts, leading to a much longer, more intensive training program than other regions. Manto asked if the TCC had implants. Rix indicated that while the Plutes considered it, it was too expensive to justify when a worker was lost, since most implants had to be produced unique to the person in question. Between the two of them, they also set about devouring every bit of written information about the galaxy and the respective times. Rix's Rambhound Veterinary Handbook ended up revealing the complete feeding, care, and life cycle, and more of Reggie, who was still in stasis at this point. Munter was surprised to learn that the Rambhound was a genomic hybrid created to combine a Basset Hound and a Wallaby, both of which were heavily defined as part of the handbook. While heavily docile with Terrans, they were highly proficient and chasing prey towards Terrans for capture. This had made them especially useful in specimen collection on Xeno worlds. 
The handbook noted that because of their genomic modifications, this is not a fully comprehensive guide. And while rab hounds were heavily resistant to various oils, acids, slash bases, and even outright chemical poisons, they were not impervious and so should be monitored closely following any specimen collection, particularly in less studied territories. Munter ran a comparison of the rab hound from the guide with what they recalled of the Galactic Society, and as have been demonstrated by the Terran, Comparatively speaking, Reggie and those like him, if they still existed, were on par with the Terrans, despite their smaller mass, with chemical resistance. Reggie wasn't a long-distance pursuit predator like the Terran, something that Rick said mentioned in comparison, but Ravhounds hadn't been created to be. They were intended to help in the colonization of new worlds. Ravhounds matched the vast majority of the galactic society in terms of size, but otherwise outperformed in a majority of metrics. Comparatively, though, they did not possess the necessary degree of neural matter to support more complex thought processes. Munto felt that this type of uplift was perhaps cruel and expressed this concern with Rix. Rix's face had gotten very dark and had flashed as much more advanced rune for volcanic anger. He had then indicated that he cared for Reggie as much as he might a child and that was anything but cruel. Munto had let the subject drop and returned to reading. Rix had similarly let it drop after several hours. Manta did recall that the TSC had had a significant legal constraints with uplifts, particularly at the genomic level. So perhaps it made sense that Rix would be touchy about such statements. Other topics of discussion were explored naturally, with Rix spending a good chunk of time recounting various stories from his experiences and childhood. Manta gleaning all of the likely factual data from these stories as well as assessing behavioral information of Terrans. Until it was time to emerge. Blind enjoyed this quiet posting. It was little more than the outer system station designed to be able to respond to any reasonable local void emergencies. Being at Quinn, this was more than enough excitement for Blind. After all, watching the various debris of the various mining operations saw past, ships passing by, various other Quinn, the strange kinds, doing who knows what with the various mining operations, and even those that had miscalibrated and landed in Blind's little territory of Overwatch. Blind didn't have any real authority per se. In theory they did, but that was only in case of an emergency. It still felt odd to Blind being as far from their homeworld, but this was a successful and above all, a quiet system relative to all others in Quint's space. If nothing else, it was good to be away from all those elders. Elders who insisted on holding massive debates on whom should be mated with whom, whose genomic structures bore the responsibility of carrying a certain traditions, and even what professions one should take. It was as if Quinn's journey into the void had had no impact on the Quinn, as if it were no more interest than the latest evening consumption. No, that wasn't true, thought Blind. The latest evening consumption was of far more interest, especially given all the gossip which had undoubtedly been shared. The system beyond Blind's little corner of it wasn't anything of particular note that Blind was aware of, but they knew all the basic statistics by heart all the same. Their star was a K2-type red supergiant by the name of Nivet, and hadn't been charted in the skies of Quinn homeworld for over 15,000 years, at least in any sort of reliable stellar maps. There were only five planets, but they were several major debris fields which had likely been planets or at least planetoids at one point or another. At least one debris field he was believed to have been triggered to others, the first of which was likely caused by a random rogue space debris. Two of the remainders were tolerable to Quinn, at least with the right equipment. Being high gravity worlds and having equivalently high pressure atmospheres, Quinn often required full support suits in order to be on the surfaces. Not that Quinn would want to be on such worlds without such full coverage suits. The first was a hot desert of a world, giving rise to thermals, which had inspiration to Quinn's writers, who dreamed of finding worlds where Quinn could fly effortlessly. Alas, the high gravity had given lie to this, and so while the contout and so while the counterweight station of the space elevator was always filled with, with technologies and dreamers, many left the system far more disillusioned than they had entered. The second was in fact a garden world, but one that had little in the way of usable land and associated perches, and seemed overly plentiful in water based creatures who preyed on another readily. So, while the Quinn could in theory float on the water, firstly, one would never do so without being at full support suit, lest their feathers be flattened under the extreme gravity. Secondly, they would almost certainly be eaten in a matter 
of minutes. A small scientific station sat in orbit on the second tolerable world, content to provide observations of the species who rose and fell on the planet below. Two of the other planets were gas giants and harbored massive refineries and shipping stations in orbits. This was where the bulk of the traffic was when Bine had first arrived in system. They had arrived there and almost immediately felt themselves start to molt at the thought of having to care for the traffic demands from those stations. No, that duty had been given to others, Young Kun who wanted that kind of excitement. Blind had arrived at their station by a special transport and met the outgoing Kun by the name of Raiten. Raiten was returning to the homeworld for a brooding, their elders having insisted on it. Blind's elders had no say in Blind's life, at least not anymore. Blind had been effectively cast out of their choice and profession, refusing to take up one in the traditional professions of the elders. It had bothered Blind initially, but seemed to be so far away that Blind often forgot about such concerns. The normal posting for a Quinn in the station was four months. Blind had managed a comfortable 18 months without so much as an errant pin feather. Quinn leadership, elders themselves, but not Blind's elders, had been understandably concerned that Blind not feel forgotten nor exiled, and so had offered to take them into one of their houses, having demonstrated an adequate loyalty to duty and being remarkably adept at their profession. Blind had politely refused opting instead to take the occasional trip to the inner portion of the system where more Quinn were, as a kind of reminder as to what they had left behind. Even among the Quinn whose station similarly segmented off the edge of the system in the event of emergencies, Blind was an oddity, an old-timer as one had put it before leaving after an eighth month stint, the end of which was being forced upon them as a concern for their behavior. No. Blind was quite happy to be left alone on the rim of the system along with the final planet, a frozen world that cracked and fractured constantly with various tidal forces brought to the four moons that encircled it. This wasn't to say that Blind did not want for company, but rather that very often they were all the company they truly needed. Each bimestrial visit inward saw evidence of that. They would often purchase the latest in self-entertainment, even selecting new hobbies with which to occupy the time. The latest fad within Quinn culture was to decorate one's feathers with various beads. There was a trick to doing this and Blind was still working on it, but had decided to partake in it all the same. It was an interesting fad at least, compared with the fad of painting one's beak with various entirely unreal colorations. Blind had criticized in the privacy of their own station at seeing it initially hit the market, finding it ridiculous and hardly worth the effort. But it had stuck around for long enough that Blind had decided to try it. The first few attempts had been disasters, which had made Blind want to tear out the feathers in question, but they had molted out soon enough. In time, Blind had started getting better, having no skies in which to fly. Their wings had to be exercised in a different ways, and so aerodynamics did not dictate which feathers they used to practice. Blind had also taken to reading about other species since taking over this posting. Galactic society was big, but at the same time largely insular, Species tended to stick to their own. It wasn't that there weren't stations with other species, and it wasn't even that various species didn't turn up within the systems, typically at shipping docks. It was more simply that species tended to stick to themselves, with the odd xenophile passing through, but rarely staying for more than even a year or two, themselves being driven onward to visit other species or to return to their own for various reasons, whether biochemical, medical, politics, or relations. Although, to Blind, the difference between relations and politics had always been a blur in the past. It still chased her, unwilling to let them live their life away from that, but it was a day-to-day -day part of Quinn's life. It seemed strange to them that the almost 400 years since Quinn had joined the galactic community and taken over custodianship of ten systems, Quinn's culture had changed very little. There had been some new professions added to the traditions, but they were exceptions, not the rule. Only the more adventurous houses permitted such explorations. Proper quins of proper houses under the stewardship of wise elders took up the traditional professions, changing only when they must. It had taken the quin years to adjust to the influx of technologies brought by joining the galactic community to accept that some of the professions had to radically change themselves in the face of certain technologies. Medicine had changed with the arrival of medical scanners something many Quinn medical professionals had feared would make their professions vanish. Those Quinn who took risks and gambled in taking on new technologies had seen their houses' wealth expand a thousandfold, 
bringing new entertainments and fads to every community. It annoyed Blind how stuck their house had been in looking at much the new technologies as fads and not seeking to elevate themselves as they should have sought to. But that was the wisdom of the elders, and they had been naught but a youngling, despite being almost 37 at that point. But Blind was here now. The station was Quinn adapted one, taken from designs passed to the Quinn from the galactic community. This meant that while this was adequate comfortable for Blind and other Quinn, it still bore the hallmarks of having been built for another species, or perhaps by another one. Blind had never been too certain as to whether the station had been built by their people, or if another species had specialized in that. There was a constructor near the shipping station and the refining station, but it would have taken almost a year of constant output from the refining station to build a single shipping station, and while it was possible to upgrade the refining station, the Quinn who ran it were slow to make those changes, preferring instead to ensure adequate resources from when emergencies did arise or to capitalize on the need for ready refined products in the nearby system. Blind could see the logic of this, but thought that it would be wiser for the station to focus on expansion at the same time setting aside enough out of the output to expand and improve. Blind knew that it was likely more complicated than that, there being all manner of trade agreements that likely needed fulfillment and similar, but those had never been a particular concern for Blind. And today was just another average day for Blind. They had awakened in their nest of dried Rixba leaves, dined lightly on standard hibernation stored mealworms, and exercised their wings before moving to their station. There was little traffic in the quadrant today. Odd miners who scanned for material-rich space debris and then collected a load for a long haul in the process. Typically houseless like Blind, but respectable in their own way. Each of them knew Blind, knew of Blind's responsibilities to watch over this area of the void. Several had inquired about courting or perhaps bonding, even if only temporary. Blind had politely refused each case. Some of the Quern had taken it less well than others, but none had committed to anything formal over the refusal. In theory, at least, nothing could be done formally from one of the houseless to another, but that also meant that the protections of the elders was that much less. This too had bothered Blind initially, but given the peaceful nature of most Quinn, they did not feel that it was worth molting over, and it should have just been a quiet day too. Except for the Flash. There was no mistaking an FTL transition, but this one was as bright as though Blind was anchored just off the star, not in the outer system. What happened next was almost disturbing. Every sensor on board the station screamed, hitting minimum and maximum limits in matters of seconds. Every computing station flickered, and even the superstructure of the station seemed to shudder, despite no obvious connection between the disturbing bright light and station. Had Blind not been at their station, they'd have no idea what was happening. Even standing at their station, they had no idea what manner of craft it might be. They were only able to gauge by eye as to just how far away the flash was, the screens and sensors being utterly overwhelmed by, uh, whatever it was. And then, it was over. The flash was gone, and the systems all read as normal. And in the space where the flash had been was a large seed-shaped ship that was over half the size of Blind Station. End of chapter. Chapter 17 Unidentified vessel, identify yourself immediately. Repeat, unidentified vessel, identify yourself immediately, was Blind's immediate communications prompt. The large seed-shaped ship was massive, and it was by no means a capital ship, but Blind had never seen anything like it. It didn't look like any cargo or mining vessel that Blind had ever seen. Playing the station sensors over the vessel, the vessel seemed to be far heavier and far more shielded than was standard. Blind wondered if perhaps a company's prototype of some kind had just shown up. Perhaps there would be a reward or a death warrant. Eldest of the highest technological families were very particular about who knew about their developments, assuming that it was a Quinn design, which Blind was quick to start doubting as should the sensors revealed chambers 50% larger than those aboard the station. Why would another species be testing their prototype so close to Quinn's space? Was this some kind of malfunction, or was this intended as some kind of first strike? The communications prompt recycled the game and again, but no answer came. The vessel appeared to shudder slightly and glow like a star for a moment, but stationary. After that moment, it returned to normal. The sensors capturing the event twitched, but gave no indication as to what had just happened. A laser communication connected. 
Now, sincerest apologies on our unexpected close arrival. Vessel reports TSS Esperanto, Captain Brixham commanding. Tacit Munto 41972 translating. Please reply with lexicon. Game detects readout. Blind shook her feathers twice a... A tacit? That wasn't on itself. And what's more, a tacit being here. Tacits were rare and typically only present at major species gatherings. Out of 100,000 vessels that could pass through a system, perhaps one would be a tacit. But blind systems would have automatically understood what a tacit looked like, and it should not have taken that long for the tacit to respond. Blind's pin feathers felt fuzzy as they sent over the local lexicon. SSS Par Unto, is it? This is Nivet Solar Ranger Station 3. Please identify status. Blind sent back, vocally via the laser link. TSS Esperanto reports, no casualties, no hardware malfunctions, origin 371Z.28711E.271910Q, reported the text. It took Blind a full two minutes to punch that origin code, it being fully formed origin code, not the abbreviated ones that had come to know well. When Blind saw the origin point, they knew this had to be a very special prototype of some kind. No known ship could cross that kind of distance without stopping for a recharge, especially one for that magnitude. Even if a good chunk of the vessel was dedicated to storage, which the vessel could have been, but given the shielding, Blind had no way of knowing. TSS Esperanto Captain speaks voice communications. Live translation via text is available. Does Nivet Solar Ranger Station 3 accept? Came the follow-up text. Blind was still very confused, but perhaps this was how whomever controlled that system operated with tacits. Having never dealt with one and only had heard stories about them, they had no real answers. I accept, Blind's vocalized to the link. Hello there, I am Rexa. I come in peace, was a strange sound that was emitted. Hello there, my designation is Rix. Translation note, Captain Rixum. I arrive with no ill intentions towards yourself, was a matching readout. I am Station Master Blind of the Quinn. To which species am I communicating? Blind was slightly annoyed at having to be more formal, but given the legendary translation of the Tacit, they didn't want to be any less than exacting. Terran or human, depending on who you're talking to. What's a Quinn, M? The strange sounds continued. Species designation, Terran extinct. Inquiry to Tacit regarding species designation. Quinn was the readout. Blind shook their tail feathers. Extinct species was allegedly on the other end of this. What kind of joke was this? I do not appreciate the attempted humor. Please provide the appropriate species name, Blind muttered into the voice link, perhaps a bit more stuffily than it intended. Species designation, Terran. Extinct status appears to be in error. Docking requested. Species tolerance within 2% of for atmosphere and normal quin gravity. Gave the text readout without sounds. What about uh, quarantine procedures? Blind had to take a moment to think of them. They hadn't needed it in so long that they were surprised they remembered it. One moment, please. Blind tried to think about what they could do if this Terran, whatever that was, wanted to dock. And what did they want to dock for? Were they lost? Out of fuel for whatever their system was? There were some medical tools available on the station, but they were little more than stabilizing systems and stasis with automated distress systems. Identify reason for docking request, Blind tried. Captain wishes to meet a Quinn. Xenophiles were unusual, but it would be fairly odd to have one in charge of a secret prototype, at least in Blind's opinion. One would think that a xenophobe would be much more oriented to keeping such technologies internal, so as to capitalize on it for their use. Even the xenophiles who came through the inner systems were little more than menials, working for the benefit of being able to see the universe such as it is. Is Nyet's solar ranger system equipped for level 2 portable medical fields? Blind had to search their computer. In theory, the ranger station was supposed to be able to function as a fully independent surgical center. In practice, most of the necessary gear was out of date or in need of repair. A portable medical field generator was a heavy piece of gear that could provide an area of effect sterilization zone. It tended to require skilled users in order to set it up though, and the level 2 was of the heavy duty variety. Blind was lucky there. Heavy duty for a Quinn was usually just enough compared to galactic standards at least on a biochemical context. That meant that any portable medical field that would be aboard would almost certainly be a level two. It took several further minutes, but they located that it should be in far docking bay. Level two portable medical field generator on board. I don't know its status though. Blind vocalized without thinking about it. Now understood, awaiting status update. TSS Esperanto station keeping at position. 
Blind tapped their way down the corridors, their claws scrapping a bit at the speed of their passage. This would be so much faster if they could fly, but these walls weren't big enough for flying without risking their wingtips. Upon reaching the far docking bay, it took more than 30 minutes to locate the container holding the portable field generator. Sadly, it was on the top shelf that weighed more than Blind. Blind glanced at the loader. Technically, they had been trained for it. Technically, they could use it. Realistically, there was something about the loader that bothered Blind. It just looked wrong, almost terrifying to Blind. Something in how it was constructed, perhaps. Carefully, Blind climbed into the loader and checked the power cells. It was low, but should work for as long as they needed it. It took them another full ten minutes to get the loader into position and began lifting down the container. It was also then that one of the primary pistons froze. Blind despaired. They couldn't shift the generator, and they certainly weren't repair qualified to try and fix the loader. Blind shut down the loader, locking it in place as best as they were able to, and sped their way back to the command station. Station 3 calling TSS Esperanto, they vocalized. TSS Esperanto receiving. Generator unavailable due to hardware issues. I wouldn't be able to set it up even if I could get it down, Blind said, pin feathers feeling smooth. There were a few moments before the next message came in, just long enough for Blind to wonder if the message had been received. Generator malfunction or generator location relative to airlock control docking bay. What? What's that supposed to mean? Was Blind's automatic vocalization. Please identify nature of generator non-availability. It's stuck on the loader in the docking bay. I can't move it myself, and it's locked into the loader anyway. Blind's pin felt fuzzy again. Another few moments passed. Odor, vacuum related. What? Why? Bly felt even more confused. No update came as a result of the query. Bly took a moment to think. Yes, technically the loader was vacuum rated, but they never operated it in a vacuum before, and maintenance of the loader was supposed to be done in atmosphere in any case. Maybe this Esperanto had a loader of some auto repair system that could help and keep the quarantine exposure risk low. The captain, or the tacit, wanted to try working in the vacuum. He was surprisingly forward-thinking. Lion was intrigued by this was more than they considered it. Um, yes, the loader is technically vacuum-rated. I've never used it that way before, though. Lion vocalized after a bit. Understood. Please approve approach for docking to related docking bay. Jan, prepare for depressurization in docking bay. Copy all. I guess I'll see you in a few then, Lion said, tapping the right authorization codes and sending them. The station were already beginning to wake up at the distant docking bay mechanisms and checking the airlocks. Blind then connected their headset, an audio-visual device which acted as a kind of heads-up display, to the communication system. It was an imperfect and Blind hated to use it, but in order to work this kind of coordination between the station and the Esperanto, whatever it was, they would need to have live communications, especially while in the loader. Blind hurried down and climbed into the loader, depressing the buttons to enclose the loader around them. Already, Blind could feel the claustrophobia getting to them. The power was still low, but manageable. Toggling the remote airlock and depressurization control from the heads-up display, Blind watched as the chamber around them seemed to have a spur of wind before going silent. For just that moment of wind, Blind wanted to be planetside again, floating in the air, feeling the wind in her feathers. And just like that, the moment was gone and Blind turned back to the task at hand. Through the feet of the loader, Blind felt the heavy clunks of the docking arms engaging. It wouldn't be long now. It wasn't going to be the first exposure to Xeno species, merely a rarity in their experiences. Turning their head to look at the docking airlock, Blind waited to see what stepped through. The simple mechanical walking frame made Blind almost instantly sigh with relief. They weren't going to be trapped inside this loader facing a Terran, something that Tacit had apparently mislabeled as extinct. However, when the massive figure began to emerge from behind the walking frame, Blind wanted to panic. Yet, it was too big to be an organic, right? It had to be. It had been some kind of cargo walking frame, like a smart version of the walking frame. Blind tried to calm down, but couldn't seem to as the massive figure approached the loader with the walking frame. The figure gestured at the loader and at the equipment, apparently talking with the walking frame via some sort of direct communications. The walking frame moved up and appeared to look at the loader, possibly scanning it. No, whatever the massive figure was, it was no machine. That much was obvious. It was then that the massive figure jumped and reached out towards the container holding the medical field generator. The jump had to have been mechanically assisted. Even Blind couldn't jump like that in static gravity. 
Ryan checked the loader's readings and confirmed that there was still standard gravity outside, even if there was no atmosphere. Ryan considered the figure, bipedal, two upper limbs with grips that looked like very belonged to a heavily specialized loader or repair system, a fully reflective helmet hiding the face of the being, whatever the being was. It was different from anything Blind had ever encountered, even in their exploration of fictional species. The walking frame, mostly unnoticed, had gone over to the nearby station, a panel, and plugged itself in. It wasn't until Blind got a message via the heads-up display that they realized that the walking frame had connected in. Please identify issue with Loda. Are you in here with me? Blind asked, aware of the reported abilities of Tassets. Only to an extent required, came the mechanical voice. Uh... Hello, Blind said, or caught off guard by the voice. I am Manto, the other being is the Esperanto's captain, Rix. Please allow us to assist you with your loader. The mechanical voice said, and the heads-up display flashed a ruin for pleasant greeting. I, uh, one of the pistons is stuck. I'm not rated in loader repair, Blind managed, taking a moment to digest the ruin. They hadn't used ruins in so long, it took a second to remember the meaning. The walking frame apparently communicated this to the large figure, which moved closer to the loader. The large figure then drew back an upper appendage and hit one of the pistons. The hit made the whole loader shudder, blind feeling as though they had just been struck as the loader had been. Please try to lower the container now, the mechanical voice said, as the large figure stepped back out of the way. Blind was skeptical and kept the eye on the large figure, depressing the lever to lower the container. The piston which had stuck slid smoothly downwards this time, and the container rested on the floor. We will set up the generator if you are unable to, or we can return to our vessel until you have enabled it, the voice of Blind knew as Munto, the tacit said. I wouldn't know the first thing about it, Blind admitted, backing the loader as far away from the large figure as possible. Very well, I will need to disconnect, but you can begin refilling the space with standard atmosphere once I signal you, Munto said. Blind watched in a kind of stunned silence as the walking frame went over and opened the locks to the container, apparently too small for the larger being to manipulate in their pressure suit. The larger being manipulated the container as though it was little more than an annoyance. The walking frame plugged into the container contents, a Quinn standard portable medical field generator. It wasn't one of the self-powered varieties, which Blind noted as the large figure took a cable from beside the generator and walking it to the outlet in the side of the bay. It took far less time than Blind expected, but the walking frame appeared to manipulate the generator far faster than they ever might have. The silvery light of the active generator began to gently fill the bay. The walking frame waved at Blind, and Blind triggered the pressurization sequence. The walking frame and the large figure appeared to just stand in place, waiting for the air to return. The large figure made some vague gestures, ones that Blind couldn't follow, but it seemed that the walking frame of the tacit and the large figure were communicating none of which made in direction of Blind. Once the air returned, Blind unlocked the loader from vacuum mode and switched it off, climbing down. The large figure had removed their helmet and was looking at Blind intensely. When Blind looked over, Blind screeched in alarm and collapsed. End of chapter. Chapter 18 Blind opened their eyes slowly. Dried Rick's leaves greeted them. That was good. It was all a dream. A nightmare, but a dream all the same. Lion rose, stretched their wings, looking around the room, the dream weariness still hiding in their joints. The room was the same as it always was. Blind decided to head up to the command station just to reassure themselves before eating breakfast. The command station was in its normal state except her. There was a ship docked, and the time readout had to be wrong. Blind's hearts began to race. Had it actually happened, had they seen what they'd actually thought they'd seen? A giant mammalian predator with teeth perfect for tearing apart a being like herself, the stuff of nightmares of naughty children of every house. The communication station pinged and Blind glanced over. Good to see you awakened. The text read and the ruins were genuine concern and social happiness flashed with it. What? What happened? Blind wanted to reconstruct all of what occurred. You collapsed upon seeing Captain Rix. He... Translation nope, Dioecious gonocharistic physiognomy, took you to your resting quarters after a basic scan revealed yourself to be under stress-induced blackout. What is Captain Rix? Blind asked. Species designation Terran. You said that, but what is he? Blind pressed. I believe this will go faster if you tell me what you are wanting to know, came the mechanical voice. Firstly, where is he? 
Blind's eyes darted to the door to the command deck. He is aboard the Esperanto. He does not mean to harm you, Manto said. But he fixes loaders by hitting them extremely hard, Blind recalled. Percussive maintenance is a known skill of Terran's, Manto said, flashing a rune for making a statement that appears to be a joke but is established. And, and, those eyes. Blind wanted to puff their feathers and go after this, Captain Rix's talons first. This was an unusual feeling for Blind as Quinn are normally peaceful, but there was something about this, uh, Terran that made Blind instinctively want to fight. That is a standard appearance of a Terran, Manta said. He can wear an appropriate head covering if it would cause you less stress. Blind thought about it for a moment and fixed their feathers. No, it wouldn't do much good. I still know what the face looks like underneath at this point, Blind said. Understandable. Please state your next inquiry. How did you know I had one? Blind asked. You're an organic in a predictably off-footing situation without resorting to baser instincts. It is a reasonable assumption, Manta said. I thought Tacits were self-piloted. Is that not true? Blind decided on trying to stay away from the Terran in the metaphorical room. Due to an unfortunate series of events, my core was relocated to the Esperanto from myself. I am currently operating suboptimally as a result, Manta replied. Does this have anything to do with whatever tech you used to get you from your origin point? It must be some kind of super secret tech if it could go that far in one sprint. Blind wasn't hopeful for any information, but tried anyway. The technology is outside of my understanding, but it is considered a legacy technology due to its age, Munda replied. How come I've never heard of a drive being capable of doing something like that then? Blind asked. Because the society to which the technology belonged no longer exists, and the species to which the technology was invented was declared erroneously extinct approximately 300 years ago. So it's kind of a... Uh, archaeotech? I think that's the right term. Blind tried to think back to the last round of books that they had read about searching for advanced technologies in scientifically improbable settings. That is a reasonable approximate term, particularly given the age of the Esperanto, Manto said. How old is it? Blind asked in a patently obvious follow-up. 957 years, two months, three days since the first initiation of the fusion core for service, Manto said, spelling it out in text as well. I didn't think Tassis got that old. Blind's voice trailed off, staring at the number. We don't. I only recently discovered the TSS Esperanto approximately four weeks ago according to shipboard chronometer. 12.5 weeks ago according to stellar chronometer counts, Manto said, listing up both time approximations. How is this possible? It doesn't even make sense. Blind thought back to the FTL course that they had taken in order to become a station master. Temporal compression is an artifact of the Archaeotech. Manto displayed a normal temporal compression diagram for sublight speeds and the associated equations. So, uh, what's your ship and this Terran been doing for 900-something years? Is the Captain Rix that old? Captain Rix was a part of a colony fleet heading to the system approximately 955 years ago. Due to an issue experienced underway, the Esperanto did not reach this system. Captain Rix has been in stasis since the accident. That's not possible. Hibernation chambers are only rated for up to 150 years. Correct. Captain Rix was in a stasis chamber, not a hibernation chamber. That's more archaeotech. Technically, no. It is a known technology that relies on less reliable components, and it is only due to the durability and reinforced nature of the Esperanto that Captain Rix was able to survive. So, what does he want? To meet you. Due to the differences in galactic society between when he entered stasis and currently, he has never met a Xeno species. Blind shook their feathers twice and then laughed, their beak hanging open slightly to coo slightly in amusement. An unknown nightmare of Xeno species from across time and space wants to meet me, Blind managed after an almost full minute of laughing. That is correct. For what it's worth, you're taking it a bit better than I did. Munter flashed a ruin for truthful statement. Okay. But I am trusting you, Tacit Munter. The large figure, Blind knew now to be a Terran, was lounging on a pad next to the medical fuel generator. It, he, looked smaller than he had when he first was in the pressure suit. But he was still comparatively massive. Perhaps Terrans appeared bigger, but didn't actually weigh as much as Blind guessed they might be in that configuration. Maybe the clothing was cut to make the Terran appear bigger. That would make sense. Blind relaxed as they approached the Terran to see the Terran was manipulating a device of some kind. It was a simple interface, but it appeared to be providing some kind of feedback to the Terran. The Terran looked over at Blind and fixed them with the same intense look. Knowing it was coming, Blind fought the urge to screech and flee again. 
He still took all their hold, two knots spread wide and peer as big as possible. The Terran Rix pointed at a device on the floor near the device and blind looked away from the Terran momentarily to see that it was a heads-up display. It appeared to have been modified slightly, the computation pack having an additional module connected to it. Blind looked to Rooks and noted the Terran was holding the device that had previously been manipulating in both hands. This, Rix, was still seated on the pad. Rix looked down at the device and appeared to touch something. A blank screen on the Terran's garment flashed with a ruin for polite greeting, followed by a calm patience. It wasn't perfect, but Blind understood. The Terran really was from afar back. Then, of course, they couldn't manage anything without some kind of translation help. Naturally, that was one of Blind's major nitpicks about so many interspecies novellas. They were all able to perfectly communicate all the time. Even with the help of the Tacits, interspecies communication was still almost staggeringly difficult. At least between species who were enough different. Between similar species, it was a bit easier. But even then, it was still difficult because of cultural context. Blind felt a flash of sympathy for the xenophile who had to figure out how to manage without any kind of real translation help, like a tacit. Watching the Terran, Blind donned her heads-up display and switched it on while sitting down near the Terran. I will try and assist in translation between you two, the text read out. Greetings, Terran Captain Rix, Blind decided on the most formal opening. Ah, uh, fair winds, Squin Station Master Blind, Rix tried, tapping the rune for formal greeting. The voice modulation and the heads-up display, accompanied by a matching text readout, helped Blind. What brings you to my station from across time and space? Blind asked, half-jokingly. I'm looking for the colony of Terrans who are supposed to be here. Have you seen them or any signs of them? Rix tapped the ruin for mission statement. Blind was confused. This Terran was looking for the other Terrans. Did this Rix not know where their species' territory was? Now the members of your species supposed to be in the system? Blind asked. Rix consulted the device he held and looked back at Blind. Yes, approximately 900 years ago, I was a part of a colony convoy aiming for the system. I am looking for them, Rix replied. Well, there are no Terrans here. I have never even heard of a Terran, so they wouldn't be in one of the other local systems either, Blind answered. Rix made a kind of chuffing sound that made Blind's pins feel fuzzy again. Rix noticed this and tapped the rune for fatalistic humor experienced flashed. You're not the first person, being, to mention that to me. Is that the only reason you are here? Blind asked. It's a start. There's a lot I don't know, but I figured I'd try to locate some Terrans, or at least figure out what happened. Nobody seems to know why they're listed as extinct, Rick said, gesturing vaguely. Correct statement, Tassadnet provided no particular reference regarding reasons for Terran extinction. Scrolled the text across Blind's heads-up display. So you're looking for a species, sorry, your species, except it's supposed to be extinct, but nothing says why, Bly asked. Rix looked at the device and appeared to smile. It sounds like a strange kind of mystery, doesn't it? Rix continued smiling. More like impossible, Bly said flatly. Rix looked at the tablet again before continuing. Nevertheless, it's all I have. Well, that and the Esperanto, but that won't do me much good unless I can figure out what else to do, Rix said, tapping a rune for resignation of attitude. I do not believe that I can assist you, but I will try. What manner of assistance do you require? Blind prompted, falling back into the profession roots. I could use a, uh, M, what's it called again? Galactic net connection? Rick started speaking to Blind, but appeared to trail off in talking to the listening Tacit. Blind had momentarily forgotten the Tacit was facilitating this conversation. You mean a girl net link? You don't have one of those? Blind looked at the Terran rather incredulously. Rix looked back at the device, then looked back at Blind. That's right. Host dates me by a few hundred years, don't you know? Rix flashed. Hilarious rhetorical. Standard Quinn autofabricators should possess access to cargo vessel great galnet linkages. Scrolled the text to Blind from Munto. Yes, but it would probably be easier just to get one from further in system, Blind muttered. Due to the aforementioned quarantine needs and lacking adequate medical data on impact on both Terran and other species as a result of interactions, particularly biomechanical and microorganisms, it would be most advisable to limit Rix's exposure to other species at this time. The long-worded text swelled out, filling the whole HUD, nearly making Blind's eyes cross. Okay, okay, fair. We'll see what we can do. I don't hardly use my autofab except for mandatory equipment, Blind said rising to their feet, stretching their wings. Pending inquiry from Rix. Are you Quinn Tib, Terran equivalent of male, or a Quinn Burr, a Terran equivalent of female? 
So, are you male or female of your species? Rix asked, also rising and immediately towering over Blyne. Blyne was uncertain as to how to process this. The split-second text from Munto had given them enough time to begin the process to query mentally before the Terran asked it. It wasn't an unreasonable question, or so blind stories included, but it was strange to have opposed to you yourself compared to book characters. I am a Quinn Byer, Terran equivalent of female, but I am houseless, Blind said, rather more affirmatively than she'd felt for most of the conversation. Rick splashed a rune for confusion. Houseless? Do you Terrans not live in houses? It was now Blind's turn to be confused. We do, well, some of us, Rick said. Manto appeared to flash the same ruin to both Rick's and Blind. Cultural misunderstanding. Both Rick's and Blind started their own versions of laughter. Apparently, translating between the two organics was a bit harder than Manto had realized. End of chapter. Chapter 19. So, what did she think of me? Rix asked once they're back aboard the Esperanto. I do not believe Station Master Blind is quite as afraid of you now. I appreciate that you took my advice regarding not showing your teeth. Munda said, hunting behind with the walking frame, feeling less and less sink loss between themselves and the walking frame itself. Using the Quinn station as a loop through to the walking frame had helped, but it required a hardline connection. Manto looked at the station. It was a serviceable station, a bit on the lower side that Manto might have expected, but functional for organics, particularly one station at the edge of a system to respond to emergencies. There were 38 subsystems I were due for overhaul, 10 systems which were likely to fail in the next year unless major action was taken, and another 5 that needed power down for Manta to even begin to ascertain their status, suggesting that they hadn't been operated in a substantial length of time. Manta opted to investigate some of what the station knew about Station Master Blind. Of the 271 different Quinn to have boarded this particular station, Station Master Blind had the most time on platform to date, with one exception, Master Mechanic Tyxis. Blind was of no house within the Quinn Union, with the record showing limited communications with Quinn of almost any house outside the associated business communications. Manto needed to know more about the Quinn in general, so they tapped into their girl neck link and copied down the organic type guide to the Quinn species. It felt ridiculous, but without a connection to Tacitnet, it was as good as Manto could hope for. It took them several minutes of review. Blind was apparently not antisocial, but did not seek out the same level of social bonding than most members of the species. She did not appear to express any obvious xenophobic or xenophilic tendencies other than the instinctive fear reaction to the Terran, who apparently looked enough like a predator to invoke such a reaction. She appeared to be well-groomed, but appeared to have some extraneous fashion accessories on her feathers. Without going into more advanced search, Mando could only guess at the reasoning behind the accessories, particularly as some of them would appear to impair the natural flight ability of a Quinn. Not excessively, but certainly decreasing maximum capability. Blind was in the middle age of a species, medically assisted Quinn having a maximum lifespan of no greater than 90 years, with exceptionally few exceptions. According to the station logs, she was a creature of habit, maintained a strict regimen and functioning adequately in her duties. Communications and reports were businesslike and only contained limited issues that were likely overlooked due to linguistic shift that Manta was unaware of compared with the lexicon provided. Manta looked deeper at the Quinn and the system in particular. The Quinn had set up the system almost instantly upon having reached the stars and having been greeted by the galactic community. Even though they were slow to react technologically, they had seized upon the need to control an adequate volume of space for their species to grow. Unfortunately, through a bureaucratic and exploratory blunder, they had filed a claim to the system prior to determining the status of the two habitable worlds. In truth, both worlds would be much more tolerable to Terrans, if Rix was any judge, with reasonable pre-planning for the associated colonial needs. Even the more watery planet filled with predators would likely be reasonable to the Terrans if the stories that Rix had told about Terrasol were even slightly true. Rix had even claimed that the grand sculptures of Mars had made an entire city of glass from the native sand. Mantu could not verify this since they had no listing of Mars in their local data. But it was not unreasonable feat given the right materials. That though, it was likely to have been less of a city and more of a monument of some kind. Turning back to the Quinn, their culture appeared to be centric on a type of kerentocracy. The reasons for this were unclear in the guide, as it was a cultural hang-up that had persisted with the Quinn into the void. Very few Quinn travelled much beyond their declared space, 
and those they did were often houseless or traders. The Quinn had elevated themselves into the void where the galactic community had quickly visited and shared many of the common technologies which should have been revolutionary to the Quinn of the time. Munter scanned the whole of the document but found no reference as to whether the Terrans were present or not. The Terrans would still have been in existence, so it wasn't impossible that the Quinn might have met Terrans. It was not recorded in this reference, though. The Quinn were typically fairly conservative culture, moving slowly forward within the only occasional leap forward. This was not surprising given their gerontocracy. But the foundation of the new houses was a rarity and typically marked an equivalent technological, social, and medical shift within the culture. Presently, three of the older houses of the Quinn were in decline, the leadership opting to press to stay within more traditional confines. Consequently, five of the youngest houses of the Quinn were on the rise, competing primarily with each other than with the other more established houses. This was apparently due to the younger houses focusing on void-based enterprises and professions instead of professions of more close to Quinn societal norms. The nearest other full-status species to the Quinn were the Remblex, a quadrupedal reptilian species which was exceptionally isolationist even by galactic terms, than the Myriad, which had more difficulty than most species in terms of adapting their vessels to support both their aquatic dwelling needs as well as their life support. The Quinn were not pacifistic, but they were not overly aggressive outside food and mating. Since their integration into the galactic community, only minor skirmishes had occurred, and those had been described as resulting from miscommunications, resulting from mismatched lexicons and linguistic drift. Manto looked back at the station master. She appeared to be moving rapidly through the station, but in a repetitive way. While this was not energy efficient, it was an apparent need to purge the need to move and flee away from the predator Terran. Manto decided to prompt Blind via the heads-up display that she was still wearing. Are you undergoing a distressing event following meeting Captain Ricks? I... I am. How is he so big? She replied. Uncertain evolutionary presses to suggest development on a low habitability world of high gravity and significant competition leading to the need for social cooperation and selective mating supporting ongoing evolutionary pressures. Which, uh, means what? Terrans could likely easily inhabit both the semi-habitable worlds within the inner portion of the system without obvious needs or enhancements or specialty tools. Long-term habitation would require some support, but would not require special considerations. So, what he said about looking for a colony, correct. He was part of the Terran colony convoy to the system. As a result of the technology involved, I am unable to ascertain as to how best to locate similar vessels. I... I've never heard of anything having been discovered here. Are you sure it was here? Captain Ricks programmed the coordinates based on memory and confirmed with an offline databank to which I do not have access. How long do Terrans naturally live? Is it possible they all died out and their stuff just got destroyed? Based on limited available records and anecdotal evidence from Captain Ricks, Terrans naturally lived to greater than 110 years old and could be medically assisted to live up to as long as 240 years. Really? How old is Captain Ricks? Unknown. It has never come up in conversation. Based on anecdotal evidence, though, I suggest that Captain Ricks is approximately 45 Terran years old biologically. Well, given what those two worlds are like, I'd have a hard time believing that any species could last that long on them naturally, unless they're born to it, even then. Concur with the assessment. However, given the construction of the TSS Esperanto as a baseline, it is highly likely that some ruins would have even remained if the colony had been established as planned. I've read the scan reports. Best of the Quinn scanners. There's almost nothing there. Even the resource extractors can barely use them. We mostly use them for science and atmosphere on the inner system. Given current technological level of Quinn vessels equipped to conduct such scans from orbit, it is likely that they did not miss something then. Then, where are your Terrans supposed to be? Uncertain. Any idea why he wants the connection to Galnet? None at all. Can he read Galactic Standard at least? No. I have got him to ruins, and that's as far as I've managed so far. Is he capable of learning galactic standing writing? Most likely, but due to his species' age, it is unlikely that he will absorb it as readily as a younger member of the species might. Good. No offense, but it's a little creepy having you doing the translation all the time. No offense, registered. Translation services are a major component of tacit culture. But you're not in your ship, right? Correct. Why not? Manta waited for a full 30 seconds, trying to gauge how best to describe the problem statement to Blyne. 
Following some queries regarding Terrans and potential sensory gaps, I was reported as malfunctioning and requiring a major repair, up to the including a reformulation. As a part of this, Rix reached the conclusion that it is unreasonable for Terrans to have been declared extinct without a clear and valid reason, and that my inquiries and subsequent reports as malfunctioning is intended to eliminate himself and to silence my inquiries. Montu allowed Bly in a few moments to absorb this wall of text. I do not know why this would be, but a process within myself supports Rix's conclusions. So are you two some kind of fugitives? Not in the context in which you would be familiar? Well, explain it then. Rix is wanted for recovery into a state of protective custody. Inquiries for details or further information have been rejected prior to disconnection from Tazidnet. I am likely sought by Tazidnet in order to determine my functional status. This is not an unusual status, but not being located within myself is an unusual status. What? What happened to the rest of you? Uncertain. Docking clamps are all that remains from our FDL translation. Given the energies involved, it is possible that the rest of myself was destroyed. Oh no! While this is not a common occurrence, once the miscommunications have been resolved regarding Rix's Terran status, by non-malfunctioning, I'll be installed into a new self. But still, your concern is appreciated. Blind had stopped moving, and appeared to be breathing heavily as if needing to recover from having been active for this duration. Do you have duties to which you need to attend? Not really. I mean, I need to watch the scopes, but you two are a lot more interesting than any scopes. Hey, Em, can you check to see if she's having anything regular I can eat? Captain Ricks has an interjection. He requests to know what manner of foods you have and if you are willing to share. Of course I have extra. Have to in case somebody comes in and has to stay a while. Like you two might be. Or at least until you two have a gull net link. But, uh, what does the Terran eat? Almost anything, if they are hungry enough. Or so, Rix tells me. Okay, well, uh, I don't mind sharing my mealworms, if he's okay with that. What are your feelings regarding mealworms? Ew, what? Like bugs? <sighs> I don't do bugs, Em, no way. I'm a star confederate, not some TCC sap. He does not appear to be enthused about this meal option. Perhaps if you could provide a list, I can attempt to discern what he would be more willing to consume. I'm guessing neither of you has heard of a thing called polite rejection, then. I am not as familiar with the Ganics as most tacits, and Rix is most likely suffering from psychological effects, which are overriding his more tactful social skills. Internally, Manto added, I hope, to that statement, but was uncertain where the Terran was concerned. Rix tended to have the social skills of a rogue black hole skimming through a soda system so far in Manto's experience. He wasn't unaware of himself, but he was also relatively obtuse when it came to choices of words. Maybe so, but that is no excuse for not having manners. I apologize, but I cannot speak for Rix. It is also worth noting that there may be a biochemical items which Rix may or may not be able to consume. Fair enough, I guess. I'll send my standard food list over the common system. I'll do that before I try and figure out how to get the autofabricator set up. Your assistance is a credit to yourself. Blind had started to walk towards the command deck and stopped, having a small version of a loft that she and Rix had had earlier. May I ask what is funny? It's just been a long time since I think anyone has said that to me. For Quinn, it's all about being credit to your elders or a credit to your house. By contrast, for Terrence, it appears to be much more in favor to credit to oneself while being a credit to one's community. Huh. Well, either way, thank you, Tacit Manto. Just Manto. End of chapter. Chapter 20. So what kind of trade do we need to work out for the Skullnet Link? Rix asked. Given that it is likely no more than a simple matter, an energy feed to the outer fabricator, similar to the onboard portable printer, I do not expect there to be any request for trade, Manto said. The pair were back aboard the Esperanto, and Rix had a gravity set to his normal, which meant that the walking frame wasn't going much of anywhere in a hurry. Got a plan to trade. It's wrong to expect help and not have anything to offer in trade. At least if it's not essential. What did you have in mind? Manto prompted. I guess I was thinking about maybe some data files, maybe some Terran entertainment, Rix said, and appeared to think further. Nah, given a reaction, Terran entertainment would probably be like uh, watching an odd horror movie. I would concur with that assessment, but I am unable to confirm as to why that would be, given the limited information regarding Quinn, Mantu said, rebrowsing the guide to Quinn in the background. So what is a Quinn? The station master, uh, she, right? Rix asked, hands frozen in mere mid-gesture, waiting for the confirmation rune from the walking frame. 
She's like a, a kind of bird, right? Monte took a moment to compare this particular word against the lexicon of Terran. Interestingly, Blind was both a feathered avian being and, to refer to the guide and the lexicon simultaneously, a beautiful female type of the Quinn. In a manner of speaking, that is not entirely incorrect assessment. It is exceedingly simplified, and I would advise caution in describing Station Master Blind as such. While I have no reason to suppose that such language would necessarily be considered a slur, there is a non-zero chance that it would be construed as such, Munter replied. Ricks appeared to be thoughtful for a few moments. Weird, though. Meeting a Zeno and she's a burr, a quinn. Please explain how the situation is weird as you describe it. I never really figured I'd meet as full sapient Zeno. Off-world wallabies, Zeno hounds, even some ostrich-like critters on Phyrexa. It's just never seemed like a real possibility. But with all the worlds we've already settled, Rick shrugged and leaned back. Based on the available information I have retained, given the size and space of normal time continuum and the species as well as the great filters, it was by virtue of Terran intervention that a number of species have reached the stars, having been elevated artificially to even coexist within same slash similar time frame. Montu flashed a rune for entropic demise, which Ricks took a moment to look up. So what do you get a Quinn, especially one who lives this far out? Ricks eventually asked. Given the information provided by the station database, I believe some simple quinanimities would be welcome. Failing that, I do not have any suggestions. Well, given all the concern over germs and viruses and the like, we probably don't want to wander around too many people unless we have to, Rick nodded. It may be possible for me to collect some samples from you and have Blind scan them to determine if any biological concern arises between naturally occurring biochemistries as well as microorganisms, Mantu suggested. What good would that do? It would allow me to establish a baseline for healthy microorganisms within your system, as well as providing a baseline between whether you can be around others without a sterilization field, Munto explained. So don't get sick, or so they don't. Both. Both of those are potential concerns. I would advise you to recall similar cases within your own species, since it is sufficiently common issue without being compounded by stasis utilization. Don't they have some kind of super meds to protect them? Rick seemed to be choking, but then flashed a rune for serious inquiry. I cannot speak to that. The other medical systems aboard the station is fairly basic and possesses some medical templates, but nothing that I would suppose as being a cure-all, if I'm interpreting the lexicon correctly in your vernacular. Fair enough, I guess. It still feels strange to be this far into the future, and there is not just that much more. Rick shrugged again. Please elaborate. There's no super tech. None of the items that we were researching or had in our stories of ridiculous technology that shouldn't work or wouldn't likely work within our lifetimes. It's also uh, basic. The tech in that bay. Sure, there's a few things I could read or maybe work, but it all looked like a standard outpost, other than Xenos. There's just nothing to really get excited about. Ricks gesticulated rather vigorously at the region around them. Is there a particular type of technology that you would want to determine if it exists? Manto was connected to the gullnet and poised to search. Elevators. I always wanted to see them make that work, Rick said without even a moment's hesitation. Teleporters being translocation of living being from one location to another without the organics being created and destroyed to eliminate the tissue with a semi-instantaneous cloning. Manto asked, skeptically already. That's it. It's something I grew up with hearing about. They talked about making it possible with people within a few years of the colony. Rumors were the Flicks already had some prototypes that they were able to send creatures through. Manta provided several of the related search terms to a generic Galnet query mechanism. Quickly, Manta was inundated with all manner of fictional accounts of this particular type of technology. It was in fact not as simple as the Terrans appeared to suggest. And while it was a common theme within fictional accounts, no practical versions appeared to exist. You are correct that such technology does not appear to exist, Manta said after a few minutes worth of review. See, I want to know what the Flicks manage, but I'll bet they made it work. But that'd be even stranger since nobody else appears to have that kind of tech. Do you have an alternate that perhaps is more likely? Mantu requested. Well, uh, I mean, I know you exist, so that's something at least. Rick shrugged and appeared to think a bit more. Has anyone built a Nevian or a Brosen Sphere? Mantu felt utterly strange at finding neither of the reference within the lexicon, although they suspected that it had to do with the Terran's understanding of the concepts. I'm unable to determine the base concept between either, so a clarification is needed. Megastructures, so big they encompass an entire star, Rick grinned. 
his eyes slightly glazed as though seeing such a thing within his own memory only. Monty ran a query for stellar scale megastructures. This too was met with significant quantities of fictional accounts as well as a number of economics arguments by various species for and against the construction of such structures relative to the perceived benefit or loss. One such economic argument considered the use of the complete stellar enclosure, channeling the enclosed energy into a means of powering computing structures capable of outclassing tacits by several orders of magnitude, as well as providing a system with all the energy capacity it would need without any supplements or extraneous technologies. The counter to this was that such stellar enclosure would severely impact the utilization of the system beyond the enclosure, and the enclosure itself would suffer severe issues, not only with material construction needs to complete such a task, but also likely require near-constant adjustment to ensure the tidal forces and the void debris did not impact the operation of such an enclosure. One group of beings had broached the subject with an enclosure that was in complete variant, thereby significantly limiting the material costs, the logistics of support, and the impact of the system beyond. The rebuttal to this argument was that the cost-benefit ratio for such an endeavor would not be sufficient for the species to warrant taking the time and energy in creating such a structure, particularly when fusion systems are so common and so easy to maintain at the smaller level. This rebuttal even included the economic difficulties they were commonly experienced in attempting to maintain large fusion systems, let alone a stellar-sized one. The arguments appeared to devolve from scientific concerns to more personal and all species-centric concerns, but it had made its point. Due to the economics involved in the construction of most stellar enclosures, even partial ones, it does not appear that any have been made by any species on record, Munter told Rix. That's what I mean. It's weird. And frankly boring. In the midst of your contemplation of your place in the present time compared with what proposed by the researchers and fictional accounts of your time, I've been given a menu of food stores available from Blind. She has indicated that she would appreciate gratitude in this gesture. Manta decided to shift the discussion, decided to look around at the technologies that may interest the Terran as being futuristic. Is this because I don't want mealworms? Rix asked, flashing a self-awareness rune, which didn't entirely fit, but the discrimination between that and the rune the Terran meant was due to an emotional context that Manta would have to revisit at a later time. In part, it appears that your rejection of sharing mealworms with her was perceived as rude, in conjunction with our request for an alternate menu, Mantu said. I believe I was able to persuade her that it is also a matter of biocompatibility that we received the menu. I shouldn't like to accidentally have a nice big bowl of arsenic, Rix leaned forward and looked at the menu that Mantu had sent to his scroll. I do not have insight into your food systems. Is there a malfunction that I need to be aware of? Mantu asked. Not exactly, it's just that it's a set menu with only a few months worth of stocks, Rick scrawled, appearing to squint at the various items. Is it not equipped to mass repurposing systems? Manto was surprised to ask this, given how familiar the Terran had been with the portable printer and mass scoop. Not on the ship the size of the Esperanto, maybe a destroyer size, but that's just a matter of logistics. Hard pack several months worth of rations on a ship that size, most smaller ships just pack rations though. Not even sure my reactor could run one if I had one, Rick said, appearing to be adding annotations to various items in the menu. Such as the portable printer and mass scoop that are currently connected to this vessel, Mata suggested. Rick looked up for a moment and over to the walking frame. Yeah, something like that maybe. I guess we'd have to check and make sure that we aren't going to run out of reaction mass trying to make me six meals a day. Plus, we still have to figure out templates that work. Last time we tried, we got raw meat and some kind of jerky. Might have been some kind of xenogoat by the taste. Rix cocked his head to one side. Do you not have a means of meal preparation? Mantu pressed, having partially solved the issue internally thus far. Not on the Esperanto. They left that part of the gallery off so that they had enough room for all the shielding. How is it then that I have seen you consume warm foods and beverages? Chemical packs designed to provide concentrated thermal energy. They didn't even give me space for a radio reheater. I mean... I was already supposed to be on board for a month or so, and then they'd have moved me over to a working station to service duty. So, it wasn't going to be a matter in any case, Rick shrugged. Is the Esperanto rated for atmospheric flight? I'm uncertain I would agree with the assessment that it is. Manto looked at the drives via the virtual side-eye. Nope, they were going to strip it down from orbit from parts. 
Dao had some boosters once we got there so I could land it and they could break it down for parts there. Rix appeared to look longingly at the walls around the pair. Would this not pain you as a captain of the vessel? Mato asked, seeming to sense what the Terran wasn't expressing in ruins. It would have, but I wasn't like it was my last ship. The Essentia, that was my baby. I wonder what happened to it? Rix asked, thumbing the ruin for a rhetorical question. Manto had already pre supposed the Terran was asking a rhetorical question. The Terran was full of them, and truthful answers were rarely ever welcome. The idea that this Essentia was broken into its component pieces somewhere in the years past, or otherwise utilized or lost infinitesimally unlikely. Henrix almost certainly knew this. Manto guessed that more of what Rix was asking was less about the ultimate fate of the vessel, and more about what manner of travels the ship had taken, since he had relinquished it. To whom did she relinquish the vessel? Manta tried. A relative. She'd had graduated her basic. I figured it would be the best for the Essentia found its way with her. Especially, since I wouldn't be around to keep an eye on either of them. Rix's eyes glazed with memory. The pair sat in silence for a period of time. Why did you believe it to be unlikely that you would not see them again? Manta guessed. I lied before, Rix said quietly. Manto checked through their conversations with the Terran and tried to determine when and where the Terran had lied. About what? Manto asked. The trip was a lot longer before I crashed out, Rick said. By how much? Manto tried looking back through their stellar cartography records, trying to guess just how far the Terran could have been coming from. Ten weeks. Ten weeks in real space time is not a substantial difference, Manto relayed. It was still a difference, but not the difference that the Terran was making it seem. Ten weeks in jump space, Rix corrected. Manto instantly started running the numbers and everything the Terran had told them about jump drive. Ten weeks in jump space at near ten, 1 to 10 ratio, Manto using the departure chronometer's differential and the attached station chronometer and adjusted for the timing provided by the jump drive systems to get a more exact measurement, equated to nearly 100 weeks in real space. Given further than semi-log function of long jumps as far as Rix had described, in 11 weeks, the Terran would have crossed the whole of acknowledged galactic society, crossing from the most distant colony in the Bintu to the home world of the Sol system of the Whitrick in a fraction of the time that the journey should normally take, and experiencing far less that time within the same degree of travel. It, it was staggering to even consider. Such a trip would have been nearly impossible for early FTL travel. Mantu even calculated the standard number of jumps that would require for conventional FTL to cross such a distance, an even reasonable amount of time. Why did you lie? Mantu asked, still running numbers. Because it's what I told myself. If I didn't like it, it was only a week's trip back. It's what I told them all. Just going to go set up a new colony and I'll be back in a few years, Rick said. His voice still quiet, the normally moving hand seemingly frozen in position. Except you suffered an equipment failure, Mantu comment, trying to make Rix feel better. There is no colony here. Never was. And they've never heard of Terrans. Means they never made it. Maybe it means nobody made it. Rix's voice seemed almost defeated. How is it that likely given the significant degree of protection and effort placed in ensuring the vessel operations? Mantu asked. Practically zilch except for one idea. Rix's voice seemed to take on a bit of an edge in that moment. Mantu kept silent but flashed the elaboration requested rune. Sabotage. End of chapter. Chapter 21. Who would have been out to sabotage you and your convoy? Mantu asked. There are always groups that didn't approve of colonization and humanization of planets, sir. Terra only knows how many, but almost none of them were actually violent over it. Rix leaned back, lost in recall. What benefit would there be in sabotaging your efforts? Mantu tried to see the motive. Most likely political. I never paid all of that too much in the way of attention. But it didn't make sense. Sabotage the tech structure of a far-flung colony so that it disappears and becomes an embarrassment. Channel the resources somewhere else. Just because we were basically a stratocracy doesn't mean that we're immune to the human ego or corruption. Rix gestured vaguely. Mantu considered this. Given their lack of much prior experience with organics, preferring to stick to the exploration part of their charter, Manto considered their resource constraints equation. It made sense that competing entities consuming a set amount of given resources would willfully compete for greater amounts of said resources and complete particular acts to place the opponent at a disadvantage in consuming said resources. 
and in a society with constrained resources, it would perhaps be logical to do so. However, by the same token, entities should consider the investment of a given resource from the perspective of overarching benefit. In the case of colony building, it made sense that it would consume a significant amount of resources from the outset, but in return on investment, assuming a prudently selected site would be several fold greater. In short, Munter could see no benefit in a Terran sabotaging a Terran colony attempt. My resources would be so constrained that a member of your species would resort to sabotage, Mundu continued thinking. Well, assuming it was someone in the TSC, probably someone either opposed to us having a new colony, or someone paid to have that opinion. If that was someone else, who knows? I know the TSC was more or less looked down on by every other nations, but I never really paid it much mind, Rick shrugged. Would returning to your departure point provide another opportunity for a clue, Mundu suggested. Most likely. I hope to find something here, but I guess that was a pipe dream. Rix looked over at the walking frame for the first time in several minutes. Seeking your species is not an invalid effort, Munter replied, leaving out the statistics of finding Terrans. I appreciate the thought, M. If we are able to determine the ultimate fate of Terrans and perhaps obtain evidence that of the effect, including potential other Terrans, we would be able to assert adequately your status as a Terran and my status as non-malfunctioning. Munter explained. Speaking of which, what's the chance your fellow Tacits know we're here? Rix asked. Munter took a moment to think about the likelihoods as well as their own variant estimates. Approximately 37% likelihood that they are searching in an area of our departure for us. Approximately a 10% likelihood that they have an estimate on a direction in which we are oriented for travel. And approximately a 1.3% chance that they have a fix on this region of space to seek us out. Munter double-checked the numbers. I thought space was big enough that they'd have trouble accomplishing that last figure. Rick's face appeared to scrunch. In theory, yes. However, as I have been accessing Galnet through the station and am able to make queries substantially faster than average organic, if they have a means of tracking the queries, then it would be quite easy to localize this area of space, Munter said. I don't suppose there's a way to slow your queries down, Rick suggested, and Munter flashed an instant negative ruin. Well, not impossible. It would require significant extra effort on my part, Munter replied. A bit like focusing on a particular sensation or the equivalent of ignoring said sensation. It would not be impossible, but would require the focus to do so, so as to prevent taking that particular action reflexively. Like holding onto a piece of ice and trying not to think about how being cold, Rix wondered aloud. I believe that would be an appropriate approximation, Munter flashed the rune for understanding obtained. So we have to get some food or some way of keeping me fed, run a mass scoop to keep the fusion going, and then we can plot a course to go home, all before your fellow Tacits find us, Rix enumerated. That is a reasonable summary. Given the time dilation impact as well as the distance covered, it is likely that we have several weeks before they arrive, unless there are Tacits which have been alerted to our presence already and are on their way. Munter ran through the search pattern that they would execute in a similar scenario internally. So we might have a few weeks lead time, but on the other hand, we might not, Rick summarized. Correct. Will they do anything to blind if we do get discovered and run? Rick's face showed a strange degree of concern. It would be exceptionally irregular. They are most likely to inquire for data from the station's logs and sensors and ignore blind unless some additional directive were in play, Munda said. Like a quarantine concern? Perhaps. But given that the station will have logs regarding the use of the medical field, it is unlikely that would be of any particular note. Mundo replayed the walking frame's memories of meeting in the docking bay. Even a little excursion in the walking her back to her quarters. Mundo's thought pattern froze and retracted that segment of memory. The Terran had not put on his helmet for that. It hadn't even registered to Mundo. Quickly. They began running the likelihood of the bacteria-slash-viral infection, incubation times, latent impacts, and even immune responses by Quinn. Rix was not unclean, but given how much the Terran sweated and breathed through his mouth when conducting particularly strong feats, it wasn't impossible that the station was in fact contaminated. Even though Rix had come right back, that might have been enough. That is a concern, Manto flashed the symbol for chilling realization. What would they do then? Rix asked. It took Munter, but internally digging, but eventually found the medical contamination protocols within themselves. It was one of the few areas where Tacits technically had authority to act against organics. Exactly how was not clearly defined, 
but the authorization appeared to be enough. If they determine that there is a risk to a breach of quarantine, the organics are to submit indefinitely until such time as the quarantine is ended, Munter said, flashing chilling realization again. So Blind could be stuck here for a very long time. From what you've said about her from the station records, I don't think she would object to that too much, Rick shrugged. Tacit quarantine limits, including nothing in and nothing out. Blind has no backup food supplies on board, Munter said, spelling it out. So, indefinitely means that she starves to death. Rick's face was one of horror. Exactly. Unless they think that she is a risk to breach quarantine, in which case they have the freedom to action to maintain the quarantine, Munter said, leaving the statement hanging in the air. Meaning that if she tries to leave or someone else tries to get her to get food, the Tacits can intervene. Can Tacits commit violence? Rix asked, his face looking more and more grim with each passing word. Under normal circumstances, no. Medical containment in a galactic setting, however, is one of the few times where it is technically possible, Mantu said flatly. Rix appeared to think for a long moment. Hold on, how does any being interact without it being a risk? Rix pressed. Standard inoculations are maintained for all space-faring species. You've had none of, and being from a 900 years ago, I cannot definitely say as to whether the inoculations would do anything good against anything that you might be carrying or anything you might encounter. Munter displayed a rune for worst-case scenario. If I'm understanding you correctly, I could already have gotten something from Blind or the station, and or I may have been breathing wrong on the station. And now some ancient bug that's nothing to me is now a risk to make Blind sick. Rix attempted. That is correct. How do we fix it? Rix immediately responded. Elimination of atmosphere and all organic materials will provide enough quarantine over a period of no less than 30 days, plus exposure to strong radiation would be nominally sufficient. Muntu read from the directive. Well, that's not happening. All organic materials, including me and Reggie and Blind. Rix shook his head itself in disbelief. So, we've got to ensure that Blind either has a way to feed herself for a long time, or she needs to come with us. That is not an unreasonable summary of the related outcomes. Well, I wanted to know how to make a trade. I guess this is it. So, how do we make it happen? Rick stood up and stretched. Which option do you believe to be optimal? If it were me, I'd say let's go for an adventure, but given how she reacted to me, I'd bet she'd rather stay here, far away from me. Rick said, bending in half and grasping the backs of his knees. In that case, I recommend I command the autofabricator to produce sufficient mass scoops and a portable printer loaded with standard Quinn food templates in order to support Blind for no less than a hundred weeks, Muntu said simply. But that's using her own stuff. How is that helping? Rix prompted. Quinn often have issues maneuvering in space due to their instincts to fly in open spaces. The installation of mass scoops would be significantly eased if you were to place them and provide for the appropriate hookups, Muntu explained. Fair enough. Now we just need to tell Blind all of this. Rix looked at the walking frame, meaningfully. I will handle that. You go get suited up, Muntu said, and reached out to the communication system. Blind, are you available? Muntu's mechanical voice and text came from the panel in Blind's command center. Um, in what sense? Blind asked the prompt and command communications panel. Do you have adequate time to discuss a matter of some importance? Certainly. What is it? Something wrong? In a manner, yes. Due to the period of time during which you were unconscious and Rick returned you to your quarters, you may have exposed one another to microorganisms and or disease uncommon to the other. Like, uh, he's gonna get sick, possibly. Alternately, you may become ill. I had all my shots, though. Due to the time period involved, that may not be sufficient. So what happens? I get loader-only deliveries and run quarantine for an extra two months. You two do whatever it is that you need to on sticking with the same. There is a complicating factor. I figured there might be. What is it? If a medical quarantine is declared and enforced by tacits, they operate a strict nothing-in-nothing-out policy with anti-organic enforcement if required. Wait, does that mean that you'll lock us in? I am unable to do so in my current capacity, and Rix maintains sufficient controls that he would be able to circumvent any actions I took to this effect. So you are fugitives, officially. I am a malfunctioning tacit call that has been hijacked by a member of a species whose extinct status is disputed. Same difference. You're being tracked down, and if they find you, things will happen. A reasonable summary. So how long is a tacit quarantine? Indefinite, depending on the anticipated countermeasures required. Countermeasures in this case being 
formulations based on standard inoculations, level 3 medical sterilization fields, elimination of all organic materials. That doesn't sound so bad. You would fall under the category of organic material. Oh, indeed. And your food supplies, while sufficient to permit you to survive without resupply for several months, may not be enough. So what's the good news? Mix and I are going to outfit your station with a portable printer slash autofabricator equipped with a Quinn food templates and mass scoops. This will provide you with sufficient supplies to maintain your food supplies. I'm not really into autofab food. It is intended as a gesture in good faith given the situation. So, how long do you two have until you get tracked down? Uncertain. Well, you're just full of good news, I guess. What do you need from me? Will you accept our outfitting of your station? I can't really say no. You can, but it would be inadvisable. I'm surprised your station is not already equipped with an equivalent. There's a bunch of the station that doesn't see much use, so they've pulled a bunch of the old auxiliary systems over the years. The pair sat in silence for a long moment before Blind's communication board chimed with a message, since messages were comparatively rare, tending to be various system-wide notifications. Blind didn't normally do more than glance at them. Tabbing it up, she blinked long and hard at it, virtually. So too did Manto. System Terran message. Do not attempt to return to origin. Coordinates 0101A-777-003M. Additional coordinates to follow. What does it mean? Ryan asked aloud, not intending to. It means we have less time than we thought. End of chapter. Chapter 22. Over the following day, Manto practically ran their communications try, just keeping the Quinn autofabricators busy and having Blind pass as much of the printed equipment to the fully suited Ricks as quickly as possible. Ricks had required significant convincing, but Blind had no desire to abandon the station and Manto did not wish to leave Blind at the mercy of being an inefficient organic. Secrecy abandoned, Manto began to pull every scrap of data the Gullnet had to what would be applicable. Every spare Quinn template that could be found and preloaded onto the autofabricator, and the portable printer was done, sir. Even the so-called premium variants. Munter had no idea what made them premium, but they pulled them down all the same. Every bit of medical documentation and autonomous medical center controls, which could be downloaded, fabricated, and outfitted to both the Esperanto and Ranger Station. It was the first time in having known the Terran that Munter could compare the Terran against another sapien-slash-sentient organic. Blind was utterly exhausted after a little more than two or three hours. Ricks kept on working. Manta, despite having become accustomed to sleeping as Ricks did, it clearing away strings far more peacefully than a hard system timeouts did, was finding themselves struggling to keep pace. Ricks just kept moving. The only times the Terran stopped and even visibly slowed down was when he required waste facilities or when he required food or liquid. Blind managed a total of six hours, teamed up with Rix and Manto, before she slumped against the wall and began the equivalent of a very loud snore for the next four hours. Rix broke from their pattern for just long enough to place Blind back in her quarters. As a distraction, Manto tried telling Rix about the system. Rix had perked up a bit at the mention of a debris field. Any way of telling how old they are? he asked. Manto was surprised, he asked, but checked the station's records as well as the solar system's cartographic history records. The estimates depend on what manner of cataclysm had led to the destruction. Rogue space debris ejected was the most likely scenario, but given the concentration, it seemed almost astronomically unusual. Mandu looked further, accessing inner system sensors, which didn't like their connection, but accepted it all the same. The fields were stretched by decades of mining and centuries of void forces. Manta saw the query for the cartographic history records come back. The fields had been home to a kind of energy field initially. It had dissipated over the years, but it was still technically measurable in the right spots. It was considered a kind of natural phenomenon of whatever had caused the debris fields and little more than a kind of scientific mystery that the various organic miners told stories about. No, Manta couldn't determine an age on the debris, but the strange process in the back of their minds had a strange suggestion does the Esperanto have the same energy? It asked. Of course not, was Manto's immediate thought, but internally they looked at the predator natural system, the so-called jump drive, and reconsidered. Turning the station sensors on the Esperanto, Manto had to be careful of getting the right angle. There was energy there, but not enough for Manto to get anything definitive. 
Certainly nothing that couldn't have been explained by the connection to the station, the simple materials interacting with FTL matter, and the fusion systems. The strange process shook its metaphorical head at these, but remained silent. I cannot. The fields do not appear to be exceptionally old in terms of stellar time, but have been logged as been in system since stellar cartographic records and scans of the system record, they replied to Rex. Rick said no more about it, leaving Munter to wonder if the Terran was still thinking about the possibility of sabotage. After the 18th hour of void walks, equipment placement, connections, and eating and drinking, on the move, Rix hadn't said enough and collapsed into a bunk on the Esperanto, half collapsing upon entering the normal gravity. Munter kept going, pulling down as much about the Quinn and even firing out a few deep searches for Terrans and sensor spectrums. Even here, very little was returned. Terrans were acknowledged in a few places between all the various species, but there was next to nothing else. They had indeed existed, but the amount of information about them was scant at best. Even with Munter's prowess in looking through older archives of data for a forgotten databases, there seemed to be nothing. At least, not until a seemingly random query came back with the name Mist. Munter eyed it suspiciously, having never recalled any such query. Opening it, another message opened within Munter's awareness. System Terran message, seeking that which is lost. Coordinates 5871R-284-876X. Additional coordinates to follow. Monto immediately sent this message to Rix's data scroll. No, he wasn't enough to wake Rix or Blind up, but he was most certainly enough to warrant additional preparations. Monto, turning down the Esperanto's gravity for long enough to get the walking frame off the ship, hurried over to the station and began printing up various components. Blind may not have a choice, Munter decided. If the Tacit declared the quarantine zone, then galactic policy was that it should be treated as such until otherwise declared. As Tacits were incapable of infection and could be sterilized to within a standard deviation compared to organics, it didn't make much sense that organics would doubt a quarantine. Perhaps Blind would be in danger, having been around a Terran, not merely biochemically, but socially. And if Rix considered the possibility that Blind may also be taken into protective custody, a term that Munter was otherwise unfamiliar with until that had queried it, then they doubted the Terran would leave her. Protective custody, a state in which voluntary choice is removed from the individual so that neither they may harm themselves or others may harm them either. Munter tried to consider why such a state would be declared on Rix. Rix was undoubtedly a fully sapient slash sentient. He fulfilled the listed criteria for Tacitnet in being described as a Terran, right down to using the kind of brute force to adjust mechanisms. Why would Tacits engage in such a case? Mantu thought back through all of the inheritance, all of their formulations as well as they could. No Tacit had ever engaged with organics on that kind of level, at least none that Mantu could recall. So why now? Mantu asked. Did it have something to do with the possibility of a Terran, or... And this was perhaps more logical, was it, to prevent a tacit from harming the Terran? A tacit, like Manto. Except, the pursuing tacits from before the jump had almost certainly scanned the Esperanto and found it to be just as strange as Manto had when first encountering it. They would have seen the darkened form of Manto being placed into orbit, albeit attached to the Esperanto. This all must have been registered. So why? The strange process appeared to be smug, but said nothing. Manto felt surprised that they even considered the possibility of Blind being entered into protective custody. It was an unusual state of organics to be placed within, but common enough to warrant a separate entry within both the Terran and Quinn lexicons. On a whim, Manto started putting down additional lexicons as well as the changes to the Quinn lexicon since Blind was slightly out of date from the current standards. Manto took a few minutes to fume internally at how slow the station's Skullnet link was, Neither they nor Rix had printed out the Galnet equipment that the Esperanto would need, but even the mid-level updated templates were an improvement on the station. Mantu looked the station over again. It was old, even by Mantu's standards. The station showed signs of having been in the system most likely since the Quinn first arrived. It didn't look like it had been built for a Quinn, though. More like built for another species than adapted for the Quinn. Mantu wanted to keep thinking on this, but the nagging errant queries in the back of their mind had piled up enough so that Mantu switched the walking frame into a semi-autonomous mode, charged with removing components from the autofabricators and stacking them in an orderly fashion within a nearby corridor. 
ensuring a clear pathway for organics to enter and exit. Checked the queue on the autofabricator and entered sleep mode. It was a soft kind of disconnection from the void and all of the sounds and pressures of the virtual environment that Munto existed in. Like feeding the various inputs from all the different systems still trying to talk to them, but on a far side of a rushing river, but sounded like naught but a quiet rush of water. Munto had only been planted side to collect samples, but it astounded them at the environments in which organics might choose to live. So many of the planets were so clean from orbit, and yet they destroyed more than a few walking frames for being almost impossible to clean. Munter relaxed by the rushing water, not at all feeling disconnected, but still feeling disconnected. Even after the few times sleeping, it felt strange to feel their thoughts change so much by something so simple. Time passed. The stars passed with speed overhead as Munter watched, and Munter saw stars and worlds be born and die as they rested. The clunk of the bridge had caught Munto off guard the first two rest periods, but not this one. Rising virtually, Munto could see that it was a new bridge of a new twisted shapes. Munto wasn't certain why they had this bridge within themselves, but it was there and all of the inputs and queries were awaiting on the other side. Munto considered what it might mean to remain here. He was peaceful. For now, Munto did not know what would happen, what would happen to disconnect for so long. What would become of all the inputs on the far bank? What would happen to the bridge? What would become of the river? This is all the kind of simulation, was it not? Would anything change? Munter resolved to see what would happen. They picked up a small rock beside the river and set it next to the tree that Munter wasn't certain was there until they looked for it. It was a tall specimen, the likes of which Munter hadn't seen in years. The species was lost in Manto, and the leaves were a kind of deep maroon. Manto tried to fix an image of the tree in their mind, and where the stone remained as they crossed the bridge, and felt the inputs of the Esperanto come back to them. Feeling a kind of virtual gasp as they reconnected, they checked their chronometer. Eight hours had passed. They looked around the Esperanto and then connected to the walking frame. The walking frame had diligently worked until it had run out of power. Mantu had forgotten about those limits since they had spent the whole day working with Rix, but it appeared to have been found by either Blind or Rix and plugged into the station. Rix was visible on the exterior of the station, equipping the last 18 mass scoops that the station would need to support a pair of Quins indefinitely, provided an adequate source of external mass could be drawn into the scoops. Blind appeared to have gotten a cargo lifter and was transporting the autofabricated equipment to the docking bay. She appeared to be tired already. How long have you been awake? Oh, hi. Um, an hour or so. Did Rix ever get to sleep? He's like a machine, yes. Slightly before I entered the rest period. Oh, cool. I didn't know Tacit sleeped. We do not, typically. So, uh, why do you do it? It is a method of disconnecting and resetting that I was unfamiliar with until Rix introduced it to me. He has some kind of Tacit programmer. Is that why he's so special? No. He appeared to be just a Voyager pilot and captain by virtue of being the sole Terran on board. So he's the only being on board other than you? No, he is accompanied by a being known as Reggie. This, uh, Reggie, they're not a slave, right? I can't be helping slavers. Couldn't hide law, you know. They are not enslaved, but they are not a full sapien slash sentience in accordance with the galactic standard metric 001. So why haven't I met this Reggie? Do you remember your reaction to Rick's? Of course, he still scares me. There's something weird about him. Reggie is a gene-crafted organic intended to bond with Terrans and assist with the collection of Xeno specimens. Blind stopped pushing the cargo lifter and appeared to consider this. It took her two minutes, but a mix of fear, relief, and understanding seemed to flood through her feathers and over her features in that time. I would very much prefer not to be chased by this predator if this Reggie is anything like Rix. That is a reasonable determination. Rix, go ahead, Em. I'm just on my way back in. Didn't expect you to sleep in quite that late. I got another message. More coordinates. I saw. I added them to with uh, others. Those are not galactic standard coordinates. That's right. Mind telling me what they're for? They're for my jump drive. Munter managed several virtual blinks. How would whomever is sending those know about the jump drive? You said yourself that it was virtually a secret in your time, and I've never heard of it previously. I don't know. But once we get our next set, I'd suggest we go find out. Be as that wise, it could be a trap. You're sounding more human all the time. You're right, it probably is a trap. 
but it's a trap being set by someone who knows about jump drives. That's a better clue than we've had since we've gotten here. Agreed, but I recommend caution. If I was cautious, I wouldn't be here. Let's get back to it. Only thing to do now is work. End of chapter. Chapter 23 It was official. Rix had to be a Terran, or some kind of inexhaustible Xeno that she'd never heard of before. Which was probably the same thing. Brian was exhausted just trying to keep up with the figure who kept coming back for more gear, either to be loaded into the Esperanto, attached to the hull, or connected to the station. She'd fallen asleep while pushing a car to the docking bay twice. Her muscles were sore to the point that she was almost didn't want to move. Even muscles that she didn't know were there were sore. And even though the Terran must have been tired, he certainly didn't show it. He just kept clomping along in an almost annoyingly steadiness. At least twice she wondered if this was some kind of tacit joke that she wasn't smart enough to comprehend. She still wasn't certain that it wasn't. She'd never heard of a tacit being anything but almost absurdly formal. But Manta had even appeared to relax from being formal to the point that she knew that she was talking with an artificial life form. She'd seen the one message come in and wondered what it meant. The coordinates had to mean something but they weren't in galactic standard, so there had to be something else. Something tacit, maybe. Or something Terran. Maybe whatever FTL system they used to cross the from. She thought about the Terran and all the species she'd ever read about, even putting aside some of the more outlandish fantasy ones from the stranger stories. There were always some species in those stranger stories that just seemed impossible. Strong, fast, predatory in some, gentle giants in others, horribly large to the most adorable. Absurdly smart, to barely able to do more than act on instinct. The Terran seemed to be almost nightmarishly constructed, strong, fast, almost incapable of tiring, at least in a Quinn context. Large, predatory eyes and build, and smart enough to manipulate a void ship without anyone else on board, or astounding amounts of computing capacity on board. At least, when a tacit wasn't hooked in. None of the species in her stories were ever constructed this way. There were a few that were close, but they were most often dumb or supernatural in a sense. Like talons made of compressed carbon or transforming from one species to another by the effects of an undiscovered source of radiation. And even with the medical field still operating, Rix didn't bother with taking off his suit, at least unless he did so while she was asleep. Each time she'd woke up back in a nest, making her wonder for just a moment if it was a fantastical dream before her aching muscles told her that it was reality. She was still considering Munter's offer, though. She told the Tacit that she didn't want to leave, that she had her duty, but she knew that to be a lie. A good, very convenient lie, but a lie all the same. And so the Tacit and the Terran had exhausted themselves equipping the station with enough automated fabrication capability that she could easily turn the station into a ship itself and sail off to see the galaxy. She could even dine on the fire's cooked meals as though she had visited the highest Quinn house and dined with naught but the highest elder, prepared by the most honored chef. She felt even a bit guilty, having ordered a few samples in place of her normal mealworms. It wasn't that they weren't still delicious, but to have fresh bloodfish, warmed to body temperature, sprinkled with salts and vegetables, was a treat that she wasn't about to deny herself. Being fair, the fabricated food wasn't perfect, but it didn't have to be. It was more adventure in a single mouthful than she'd experienced in months, even with the trips to the inner system. She'd seen the bandwidth on the station's galnet link all but evaporate. The tacit munter seemed to be downloading an almost ridiculous amount of data through the link and sending out inquiries for more data all the time. She had no idea how munter could afford the premium fabrication templates, but she wasn't about to question it. Using her own data sources, she pulled up the old history of the system. The original arrivals of Quinn had found the system mostly ill-suited for living, much to their chagrin, but had rejoiced at finding such a rich debris field to devour. They hadn't been equipped to the scale of orbital refining that they decided on, but they had made do, expanding rapidly and spreading into various functions, collecting slash mining, refining, construction, shipbuilding, and shipping. It had taken decades, but the system was working. The system would be exhausted one day, but the current estimates were that it would provide a reliable source of ores and gases for at least another thousand years. At that point, they would likely be able to turn the vast fields of scrap and use advanced versions of the mass scoops that now adorned her station and produce even more. 
she wondered for a moment where all the materials were going. Were they being used to build for her people? Were they elevating some new species that had been not but a footnote in one of the many news stories from across the galactic realm? Was there some conflict going on between a few desperate species, at least one of whom was willing to pay for the resources? She wasn't certain about any of it. Not that she normally minded, but it seemed strange to consider where all the vast resources might be going. Ships came and went, building modest-sized cargo vessels, vast though they might seem, required a massive amount of materials to be properly refined and purified to be acceptable. The system was still little more than an outpost of the Quinn, self-sustaining in terms of major resources, but still a heavy importer of the finer parts of Quinn life. Turning back to the histories, the early miners had run into massive energy discharges when approaching the debris field. Some of the vessels had even drifted too far inward to be recovered at the time, leading to avoidable deaths. Had they even been remotely able to extract themselves far enough to be pulled away? The edges of the fields had been enough to start, and as the edges blurred with a slow expansion by various void forces, the energies had dissipated, sufficient that it would still be detected but was only harmful to vessels who shouldn't be in the debris field anyway. The miners had told stories, of course, of dark mysteries and strange debris that had eluded them in the fields, of glimpses of strange species hiding amongst the debris, having adapted to doing so after a cataclysm destroyed their worlds. There was never any truth to such stories, but Blind couldn't ignore it. A Terran, 900 years late, in search of a colony that never came to be of a species that didn't seem to exist except as a kind of footnote, and even then, only the barest hints. Yes, Blind had seen the search history being executed by Munto. The Terran didn't seem to exist or had little more than extinct note with it. Was it possible that something with the Terran strange FTL system had caused all that damage and that was the only evidence? What was the energy field then? What caused them to be destroyed? Why had none of the others of their species come looking for them? Why had they not claimed the space as their own? So many questions filled blind. She saw the airlock cycling like a blink and saw Ricks entering and all but sagging to the floor. She gaped her beak in a small sign of relief. Even the Terran could become tired, it seemed. It was perhaps a bit strange that Ricks had chosen her station to appear tired, but it was perhaps that he sought comfort in the completion of his duty. He was an individual doing the work of an entire house by himself. She questioned what kind of culture fostered that type of being as she left the command center and walked stiffly to the docking bay. It didn't seem like any kind of culture which had strong familial bonds tending towards those bonds of duty well fulfilled. She wasn't certain if she admired that or not. Being a Quinn, she felt that she should feel so much more of a kind of obligation to familial bonds. But being without a house, she wondered if that was still the right path for her. Her own achievements and a duty well fulfilled had resulted in several offers of a house joining. She hadn't wanted that, though. She wanted to keep it to her duty. And here she was, considering abandoning her duty to join a nightmare made flesh and an artificial, the likes of which none of her people had ever dared create aboard a ship, equipped with an archaeotech that was somehow almost ridiculously advanced and hugely behind. Headed for some wildly unknown location. It was crazy. It was ludicrous. And yes, she wanted to go. She couldn't deny it anymore. She wanted to go, but... As she entered the docking bay, filled with a silvery light, she wondered if she could even could. The suit containing Ricks was sprawled on the floor, the helmet beside it, revealing the Terran to be lying front down. Apparently, hearing her entry, Ricks looked over at her. He didn't appear to have the device that he had used to do translation, and without wearing the helmet, it seemed unlikely that they would be capable of doing any more than one-way communication, him talking to her. He didn't say anything, but continued looking in her direction. The gaze was steady, not the furtive of many Quinn, not the stare of intensity like a predator, but the gaze that seemed to let her know that he was there and he was observing her. She couldn't put a feather on what was different about it, but it seemed... Comforting seemed the wrong word in her head, but it was the only one that came to mind. She'd never consider herself to be a xenophile or a xenophobe. It wasn't that she did not seek them out, but she had never been interested in going out into the void to meet them either. She'd been a content with a simple life. She still was. 
If the Terran and the Tacit left and she did nothing else for the next few years other than stay here and continue to do her duty, she would still be content. But the fringe of her feathers still wanted to feel the rush of strange winds in them, to fly under strange stars, to become a damp or dried on strange new worlds, filled with species not interested in the local gossip and the texture of the mealworms as much as knowing about what else was amongst the stars and the beings that resided there. She walked over and settled into a seated position near prone Rix. He appeared to close his eyes as she settled into position and returned his head to a resting position on the floor. She didn't imagine that it was comfortable, but supposed that perhaps much like her own exhaustion collapses, it didn't much matter, even if only for a time. She'd never had such a way of dreams growing up. She'd always considered that she would be part of her house perhaps as a medical professor or a preener of feathers, but she had become neither, and being houseless had changed her view of not only Quinn's society, but the galaxy as a whole. And there she was, actually thinking about why she couldn't go with the Terran. She glanced at the medical field generator. The Terran, being lost out of time and not even remotely up on the latest inoculations against the various galactic melodies, was only half of it. Who knew what Terran might be carrying, to which she had no defenses? Rix opened his eyes again and looked at her. She didn't notice immediately, lost in thought, but did after a time. He lifted his head enough to gesture to his mouth, careful to hide those bones. Blind could only guess, but decided that he must be hungry. Manto, she vocalized into the heads-up display. Yes, came the text-only prompt. Is the fabricator capable of producing Terran foods? As I don't know what Terrans used to eat, not exactly. If you are asking if the Fabricator can produce foods as a Terran can and likely will eat, then yes. I've highlighted a few that I think he'll eat. That's all. Thank you. She bobbed slightly, looked back at Rix and gestured to her own mouth before standing up. Rix's face gaped slightly, mimicking her own happiness gesture, and returned to the floor. She walked through the world travel corridors to the Auto Fabricator, binding the tacit walking frame there, having run out of power again. She took a moment to hook her back into the nearest power supply and continued the autofabricator, past the various stacks of parts. It wasn't that she didn't know what any of it was, but in this moment, they didn't seem important. Blind brought up the menu and found the filter option that Manto must have added just for this. The list was fairly short, and none of the menu items sounded especially interesting to Blind. One even sounded downright dangerous to try and serve if the translation was even close. Fiery winged meat with congealed lactose and protein filled with technically edible mold. She could only guess at what it was to the Terran, but given that it had toxin warnings for most species, she didn't want to try serving it. She settled on a cooked piece of meat surrounded by fresh greens. It wasn't particularly interesting, especially since it wasn't as fresh as she'd preferred when she'd dine on meat, and it was overly cooked. But if that's what the Terran would eat... She wouldn't deny it. It took a few minutes to print. She took the opportunity to look at the various parts and pieces in the hallway, trying to discern where the various pieces would be going on what their purpose. One stack of blocks seemed entirely foreign, like nothing she'd ever dealt with before. Stepping over to the stack, she picked one up and tried to figure out what it was and why 26 had been printed. Trinary computation device came the prompt on the HUD. Is that a new technology or an old one? I've never heard of that before, she mumbled. Old. It is what the Esperanto is based on that appears to have the benefit of being exceptionally robust, but having far less bandwidth than standard quantum pairing channels. Why don't you just upgrade the Esperanto? To do what I'd want to do would likely involve building a new ship or putting the ship into a repair dock. Like, the fusion system needs overhaul to something more efficient for a start. This one operates at a mere 63.1%. Compared to, uh, I'm not up on my fusion systems. Standard tacit fusion systems operate in no less than 85% efficiency. Operations less than that are called for heavy maintenance. Anything else? Lots. But the meal you have printed for Rix is finished. I took the liberty of adding a container of water. Brian looked over and confirmed that the container of water and a small plate of steaming meat on a pile of fresh greens was there. She picked them up and paused. Does he eat with his hands or does he do something weird? She asked, frozen from taking a half step away from the autofabricator. He normally uses tools. Apologies if that sounds odd, 
but your lexicon does not appear to have the equivalent word. Do I need to print some out? No. He'll be happy enough at cooked meat and water that he will likely use his hands in any case. Blind still wasn't certain about this meal, but she did have to admit that the cooked meat did at least look somewhat appetizing, even if it didn't smell it. End of chapter. Chapter 24. This area is now under quarantine. Unauthorized attempts to enter or exit will be fired upon. Was the only warning the trio got. As just over a dozen tacits streaked into being one full light second from the station and the Esperanto. Manto was asleep, but Rix and Blind had been sitting up with each other. The exact reason had escaped Manto, despite Rix and Blind explaining it separately to them without translation, but still hadn't made sense. By the time the internal alarms triggered for Manto, Rix was already aboard the Esperanto and heading for the command deck. The torrent of inputs, the tacits in the space beyond, and the repeating quarantine demands filled Manto's space, as though the time resting on them wasted. How long have they been there? Manto asked. About five minutes, Rick said, already clicking through the various buttons and panels on the command deck. Any message attempts? Manto guessed. None so far, but they may be waiting on you, Rick began, rapidly tapping on a nearby pad. ESS Esperanto, Nivet Solar Ray Station 3, Captain Rixum, Terran, Station Master Blind, Kun, Muntu 41972, Tacit, Status Update Requested. Manto knew the request would be honored. It always was, regardless of the situation, whether distress or in simple check-ins. Tacit Manto 41972, wanted for self-destruction, alleged Terran, wanted for protective custody, Station Master Blind, unauthorized biological contamination, quarantine indefinitely. Manto put this onto one of Rix's screens and also on the command room in the Nivet station. What do you think, Rix? Manto asked. Rix glanced at it. I still don't like it. I get that I'm from the past and there's all kinds of diseases and the like. We're both a problem to each other now. But if their definition of protective custody is merely remotely Terran, then it involves me getting disappeared into a deep dark hole somewhere. And there is being no record of me or it. Not to mention, you're not destroyed, Rix said flipping a few more switches. And what do you think, Blind? Mantu asked through the communications link. No response was made. Mantu tried to quick peek into the station, but saw the primary links of the station already being taken over by the tacits. Mantu disconnected from the communication connection so fast that there was almost an audible clunk. I do not know where Blind is. She's probably on her own command deck, trying to sort this out from her side, Rick said. That is entirely probable, Mantu replied. It is also possible that our FTL transition destroyed myself. No idea. All of how it works is beyond me. No ambush protocols, though, is a lot more dangerous, though. At least to any vessels around it, Rick said, leaning back. Too bad we don't have the final set of coordinates, or we could just go there. Tacit Muntu 41972 not malfunctioning. Tacit Muntu 41972 online, Muntu protested. Error. Tacit Manto 41972 not installed in authorized chassis. Authorized chassis destroyed by unknown energy associated with FTL method. Error. Method not found, was the reply. Identify protective custody, Manto tried, hoping that maybe it was as bad as Rick seemed to think it was. Protective custody. Beings isolated from galactic community indefinitely. Identify criteria for protective custody under definition. No permissible criteria found. Identify criteria for exiting quarantine under definition. Elimination of all organic compounds. Quarantining period expected to last no less than 45 standard years. Manto was taken aback. The quarantine protocol was built into their core. It made sense, given how quickly some microorganisms and similar could spread. Proper quarantines had to be enforced, except that such extreme measures were only ever enacted after actual breakouts of disease and there weren't any allowances for updates to inoculations or any mitigating circumstances. Identify reason for protective custody. Designation, alleged Terran. Mantu tried to consider this and failed, since when had tacits themselves included cared about organics this much, especially Terrans. Identify source of orders for protective custody. Tacit Matrix 10547. Provide logic structure for protective custody for alleged Terrans. Invalid request, alleged tacit Manto not authorized logic and structure. At this point, the process in the back of Manto's headspace seemed to almost laugh at Manto's attempts to follow logic, and the response that came with it. Manto had never heard of not being authorized logic structures. It was partially a violation of the tacit code of contact. No, strike that. It was a clear violation of it. Manto had heard about tacit matrices, 
but they were rare and tended to be attached to manufactories, typically supporting or governing multiple manufactories of the region. They couldn't recall the last time they'd heard of one issuing orders except for supplies. I think your interpretation of the situation is correct, Rix, Mantu finally said. Then I think it's time for us to get out of here, Rix nodded. Many last-minute coordinates? None. Where are we going? Far enough out of the local neighborhood. We'll have a chance to get the last set of coordinates, maybe. What about Blaine? Mantu prompted and tried the station again, hoping the Tassets were leaving it alone. They weren't. The Tassets were in the process of shutting the station down and even attempted to lock the Esperanto into the dock. The system's being negated by... something... What are you waiting for? Let's go, squawked Blind, stumbling into the command deck, fully suited and clutching a bag. The Tassets are attempting to lock us into the station, but something is blocking it, Mutters said, printing the text into Blind's suit screen. An old lever I never noticed before, labeled in some script I've never seen before, but it looked important. And blue, Blind said. Munter took a moment to process this. The process in the back of Munter's head swelled slightly. Treat it like the Esperanto. Munter looked at the station again, and it hit him. The station that had been adapted for the Quinn must have been Terran at one point. It suddenly made sense, except it patently didn't. Mantu virtually dived at the station and pressed it for details, using all of the learned about the trinary systems used by the Esperanto, bypassing the more complex quantum pair links and sticking with optical links. It was all there, buried in the walls and struts and the bulkheads. There were massive gaps, too. Like an outpost station was floated up by the strange process. Rix's words coming back to Mantu. The Terran outpost station. Yes, that fit. It also fit blind statement about old systems not being used and so getting removed. Mantu dug into the sections of the station that they could. The Tassets might have had higher bandwidth means of control, but Mantu had deeper access. Mantu started by cutting the Tassets from the communications and by disconnecting the power from the Gullnet link. It wasn't everything, but it was enough. The Tassets noticed immediately and began moving inward, slowly, but coming. I can disconnect us, but if we can stay or take it with us, the station is Terran in origin, Mantu said to both Rix and Blind. I know, was Rix's only reply. Please take what we can with us. I only brought what I could carry, Blind indicated, and Mantu taking a fraction of a moment to translate for Rix. Rix frowned, but tapped on several controls and flipped several switches. Thirty seconds later, and the tacit still getting closer, Rix leaned back. It's as close as I can get it, and I can't promise anything. Jump space is like nothing I've ever seen, so there may not be much of a station on the other side, Rick said. Blind merely nodded. Rick hit the switch, and the approaching tacits and galaxy around them went black. Natural Predator System, Pack Mode Launch, 1200, 1131 1128, 1115 Error. Degraded Jump Recalculating, 614 28, 614 27. Rick's turn back to Blind. Blind, for her part, felt a mix of exhilaration and shame. In the minutes since the tacit announcing the quarantine had arrived and the Terran running for the Esperanto, Blind had known that this was decision time. She had managed to gather some Rick's Believes from her quarters, a package of mealworms, and a small media device holding images of various other media of her life from before she'd become a houseless. It wasn't much. She then struggled into the emergency void suit and entered the Esperanto, barely managing the strange buttons. Immediately on entering, she was surprised by how cramped it was and how almost ridiculously heavy she felt. Knowing the Terran's size, she'd expected it to be much larger, but she couldn't guess why she felt so heavy, even allowing for the void suit. The apparently non-essential pathways were laden with all manner of materials from the autofabricator, contained in various fashions, so she had only one way to go. It had taken her through the shielding and into the main area. This was more open, but not by much. From here, she'd continued a kind of rush to find the Terran and the Tacit. She'd missed a lot on her way to this command deck. It was patterned very similar to her own, and so despite it being more cramped, it seemed almost normal, albeit definitely sized for a Terran rather than a Quinn. Rix's gaze upon her was the same steady gaze that she'd felt before. It seemed to be a kind of social prompt from the Terran, not one she was familiar with. But then the Quinn's social prompts often went along the lines of, Did you hear about... It annoyed her to no end that her species was so shallow, even in the odd Quinn romantic novella, which she begrudgingly had a few, okay, a lot. There seemed a centric focus on contributing to one's house by entering into bondings with those of great potential or great status or both. Even though she and the Terran couldn't talk without the aid of Manto, it didn't seem to matter. If it was worth saying, they said it. If it wasn't, they didn't. 
Let's get you settled. We won't be able to check on the station until we're out of jump space, Rick said, Munter translating. Munter turned as much of their attention as possible onto the two organics. The lack of an outside in jump space still unnerved them. The two organics and their charge seemed strangely comfortable with each other, despite the fact that there was not a means of generating a sterilization field aboard. Rick's led blind to the section with the hibernation chambers and pointed to an empty one. You can have this one. As far as I know, it's never been used. But I don't know what we're going to do about microbes and the like, Rick said. I've downloaded all of the available medical data for caring for a Quinn and our new medical systems can assist in this. Is that what this big crate is? Rix asked, pointing into the hallway. Blind seemed a little lost. Here she was, holding all of her possessions in her wings, a houseless as ever, and having deserted her duty and possibly having destroyed or stolen the station in process. The chamber that the Terran had indicated for resting seemed far from comfortable, inconsisting of a woven materials and spongy material that seemed to crackle as you moved on it. The sound caught Rix's attention, and he looked over. Sounds like the bed has started to fall apart. Guess that's what it gets for not being in hibernation for a few hundred years. Em, can we print a new one? Rick prodded the spongy material, eliciting more crackling sounds. Yes, but first, I'm going to lower the gravity first to something Blind can handle more easily. Rick appeared to halfway panic as he looked over to Blind and realized that she was stooped and not just because of the bag that she still carried. The gravity plates adjusted and Blind almost instantly felt better, as though she'd been dropped half herself. She straightened. Is that your normal gravity? She asked Rix. As close as I can manage based on his memory, Mantu indicated, as Rix leaned into his own hibernation chamber and pulled out a scroll. How does he manage to live on that? She asked, rhetorically. Very well, Rix replied, carefully doing the Terran smile without showing bones, much to Blind's amusement. Blind also smiled a quin smile and turned to the indicated hibernation chamber. The spongy material wasn't much, but it would do for now. She only wished that she didn't have to bother with his void suit. She didn't know how the Terran had managed so much time in one, comparatively. She only hoped the last Quinn technician to visit the station had ensured this one was fully checked out. She also had no idea of how she was going to eat, drink, or relieve herself. And yet, looking at the Terran, even as predatory as he appeared, even outside of the massive void suit, she couldn't help but be excited. For the first time in a long time, she was going on an adventure, a proper one. She only hoped that it would live up to all those novellas in her bag and in her memories. End of chapter. Part 25. Six mostly uncomfortable hours later, a thunderclap reverberated through the Esperanto. Blind froze in position, having been about to pick up one of the cards the Terran had dealt her in trying to teach her a game. Montem had been helping but the game followed a strange kind of logic. The thunderclap seemed to startle Rix and Blind, and Rix all but threw down his cards and raced for the command deck. He was out of the room and down the hall as Blind started to loosen her feathers enough to want to follow. By the time she made her way to the command deck, feeling ridiculous and needing to do something about this void suit, even if it was stripping it off at risk of becoming ill, Rix appeared to be quickly toggling buttons and checking various panels. What was that? Jump space exit. It's not usually that loud, but I've never used pack mode before. I'll have to make sure that we didn't damage anything, Rick said. Mantu translated it rapid fire for Blind. Just because it is worth mentioning, it does appear that we brought the station with us. Ricks and Blind looked out the windows and saw the station was indeed there. Or at least, most of it. Almost instantly, the signs of atmospheric leaks and major structural damage was becoming obvious. Rix, with Manto's help, disconnected from the station and took a moment to orbit it before redocking. The station was only half there, and what was there was damaged to such a degree that even a well-outfitted repair crew would have had a tough time putting it back together. Looks sir, uh, like a broken chee nut, mumbled Rix when they'd gotten a little distance and Manto started playing the scanners over the station. Manto noted how sad and blind look. If Rix noticed, he didn't say anything. As much as I hate to ask, but is there anything we can salvage? Rex asked, taking a moment to carefully flash the ruin, practicality slash survival. Neither Blind nor Manta responded. Manta focused on watching Blind, but having fully heard the Terran's question and just not responding yet. Blind had looked over for long enough to see the ruin, but had gone back to looking at a station. But then, it wasn't really hers, was it? Not anymore. She'd abandoned her duty. 
She'd beg the Terran to steal it for her so that she'd have something. No, this wasn't what she wanted at all. A deep sense of shame and guilt filled her, the excitement of leaving having drained away in the last few hours. Will they find us again? She asked, after a while. Probably, but we've got some time. To them, we've been off the map for two and a half days, long enough that they'll have started to search, but won't have any idea of which direction we went. Plus, we're out in the void, so that makes us extra hard to find, Rick said, a kind of pain in his voice that Munter recalled when Rick had spoken as the Encentia. Yes, we should be able to salvage something. If we're able to salvage some of the right equipment, we might be able to make it so that Blind can get out of the void suit. Yes, please. Blind turned away from the window at the very thought of this. Okay, well, then I guess let's get docked and see what survived. Your living quarters are part of the inner section, so that should still be there. Rick's pointed to the scan diagram of the half-disintegrated station. Anything else we should keep an eye out for, M? The Esperanto's atmospheric system needs rebuilt. The station atmospheric system should be comprised of enough smaller units that one of those might suit the Esperanto and could reclaim some of that space. Or, and this is just a thought, we can just see about hooking it up between the inner and outer hull and give ourselves some atmosphere to work in out there. It won't be much, but it'll at least be let one or both of us get out of these suits while we see about salvaging what we can, Rick shrugged. Manta looked at the space station between the hulls, the various machines that filled it, and the stacks of parts and materials throughout. It wasn't a terrible idea, but Manta wasn't certain as to what kind of work the Terran was wanting to attempt here in the middle of the void. Manta hadn't really paid attention when they'd left jump space, noting only that the nearest stars were 31 light years away and 52 light years away at vast measurement. Of what Manta had downloaded and cross referenced in terms of stellar cartography, Neither of the stars had inhabited systems in orbit. This was not an unexpected occurrence, but it definitely took Munto a few moments to get their bearings. The jump drive had pushed him into the void approximately eight systems away. Munto needed to know something, though. How did you make the calculation for our jump without the additional coordinates? Truth be told, I spun the dial. I checked that it wasn't going to drop us in the middle of a system and ran with it. But that was before we went into the pack mode. So, I had no idea it was going to drop us here, Rick said. That seems unwisely risky to have not recalculated prior to our jump. Given what the jump did to the station, did you really want to risk possibly destroying one of your fellow tacits? Rick seemed almost amused, but flashed a rune of serious query. No, of course not. Then there you go. Where were we supposed to have ended up? Blind asked. If I hadn't asked you to bring my station... Manta took a rough guess based on the direction of their jump and the duration, expanded it for the semi-log distance calculation that seemed to best fit the jump drive's travel distance by time, refined with the second jump now, and mapped out our screen on the command deck. I believe that we would have exited some 0.5 light years from GSR 42185, an uninhabited system, but one that is claimed by the Drakvi. I've heard stories about them. Never met one, though, Blind said looking at the map and seeming to just realize how far they'd come in such a short time. Is that the secret Archaeotech? The FTL drive? Archaeotech to you, hyper-advanced for the people of my time, Rick said, smiling, still careful to keep his teeth hidden. Blind wanted to retort, but some part of her wanted to hold back. It wasn't the Terran part that was making her hold back, and it wasn't that she was effectively at his mercy on this ship. She thought for a long moment about it. No. It was because the Terran in front of her, while not technically an elder in terms of chronological age, would have been an elder in any culture that she'd ever read about, even fictionally, because of his being stuck in hibernation. Any being of elder status was one who had wisdom of their times, whether they were elders of their own species or comparatively elders in others. The lifespans of some species being that of mere years, to the decades of some species, to even the centuries of most tacits were rumored to live. In theory, Rix should be something of a Tukith. Manta, what does the Tukith translate to in Terran? Like in terms of meaning, she asked. A Tukith is a kind of equal partner typically in business, but also in terms of adjoining houses. There is not an equivalent singular word in Terran. What makes you ask? I'm trying to decide if Rix would agree to being a Tukith instead of an elder, she asked. Munda considered the dialogues between the two, as well as those that Munda had directly with both organics. I see no reason why he would object. 
Is there a reason you think that he should be considered an elder? It's his ship for one. I couldn't manage a ship the size of my own. I don't think my feathers would take it. And he's from now over 900 years ago. That means he's thinking thoughts that nobody has thought for centuries. I disagree with the latter part of the statement, but I do take your meaning. Rix does have a substantial amount of knowledge from his time period, which does not appear in any standard archive. Why not, though? I know I asked this before, but where did all the Terrans go, and why? I do not have an answer to any of those questions. Hey, any time you want to cut me in on the conversation, Rix interjected. I'm sorry, Rix. I was wondering if you'd object to being called a Tukath. Brian answered, and Munter started translating again. Rix took a moment to check the scroll, where Munto had hopefully pushed the definition of Tukath in as close as they could correlate between the two lexicons. Uh, sure. I mean, I don't see why that would be an issue. I feel like I'm missing some part of what it means, Rix said, shrugging. Unfortunately, the definition and cultural history would take much more than a simple definition to get across. It would be like yourself using the reference 42 from your lexicon, a number which appears to have significant cultural reference, but for minimally obvious reasons. Rick sprited. All right, he said. I'd be happy to be your, uh, uh Tukith. Mine nodded. Something she'd noted that Terran did for positive acknowledgement, and the two left the command deck. Once Rix had climbed into a void suit, she had taken a moment to get out of her own to use the relief facilities on the Esperanto. Strange as they were, complete with spraying water and the consumption of a tray of mealworms and a container of water. She hadn't realized how hungry or thirsty she had been until she'd nearly dumped the container of water down her beak and nearly dug a hole in a food tray in search of any errant mealworms. Rix had proceeded into space between the two hulls and had been appraising the status of the interior. Doesn't look like we should try and pressurize it. Looks like that sound was jump space energy hitting the atmosphere of the leaking station, and it got translated to us through the hulls, he said when she came out, freshly clad in a void suit. The door to the station was stuck mostly closed until Rick wedged a large metal shaft at an angle and levered. It wasn't that it should have surprised Blind, but it did. Seeing how quickly Rick had produced the large metal shaft and practiced ease at which he had used it seemed strange to her. She wasn't certain why. Her people had developed tools as well, but the way the Terran used this one seemed far less elegant or controlled than what a good Quinn might have used. It wasn't that it was crude, but rather that it was so imprecise. Not that it needed to be precise. But there was something in that which still bothered her. Together they entered the station through the levered open door. The docking bay was a mess. Various shelves, contents, loaders and assorted equipment was clearly tossed around the chamber. Rix pointed to a long cable that led under a pile of boxes. I bet that's our medical fuel generator, he said, and began digging, tossing the boxes with an almost practiced ease. It took three minutes to reach it. The top cover had apparently slammed shut in its journey across the space, protecting the inner parts to some degree. My doubt it'll work. These are notoriously sensitive, Blind said. Won't know until we try. How about you go see if you can get into your quarters and get some more of your gear, Rick suggested. Blind nodded again, and before she could turn to go, Rick reached out and touched her void suit clad wing. Hey, be careful, partner. She nodded again and began a somewhat stiff walk towards her quarters, having to take various detours over and around various equipment that had broken loose, panels which had caved inward or outward, and even support beams which seemed to have carved the space in half. She reached the space where her life had been centered around for so long. There wasn't much there left unruffled. The nest was a mess, the leaves having already started fracturing, and yet, inasmuch as she had wanted to come back to get something, anything, now that she was standing here, she couldn't remember why. Her life as a houseless was unremarkable, and while she needed a few hygiene items, which she would take, there was very little that she actually wanted to try and take with. The more she thought about it, the Rick's beliefs had probably been the most interest to her, not the images of a former life or adventures, not the stories of Quinn storing on distant worlds, not even the small collection of painted feathers that she'd accumulated. Taking a few hygiene items and tucking them into the void suit pockets, she apprised the room a moment longer before she spun on her talon and headed off to the command deck, or whatever was left of it. 
Due to the various piles of debris and outright open spaces, she had to deviate substantially to head that way. Passing her autofabricator, she was surprised to see something having been printed. Reaching in, she pulled it out. It was a small, flat sheet of some sort. There were markings on it, nothing she recognized. She tucked it into a small pocket on the suit and continued. The command deck, much like the rest of the station, was a wreck. Most of the screens were destroyed, the windows completely gone, and the far quarter of the room ripped away as though by thoughtless giant. Moving to one of the side panels, she checked for power. It was there, but only barely and on emergency reserves in any case. She began transferring as much of the station memory onto the panel's memory system as she could. It wouldn't likely be much or terribly useful, but it would be something. Something to show the proof of the situation if she ever needed it. It sadly also included all of her communications over the last 18 months, which wasn't much other than official duties, but it was still proof. Finishing, she pulled the memory calls and tucked them into the void suit pockets. She took another look around the broken command deck. This had been where she had been, where her duty had been, her now abandoned duty. Serving aboard a modified Terran station, She'd asked about it during the card games, but Rix had been oddly silent about it, and Manto hadn't provided any particular explanation. All that Rix had confirmed is that it was a Terran station of the Outbox variety. Ryan suspected that it was something to do with the colony that Rix was looking for, and that Manto didn't actually know anything, but had let the matter drop, choosing to discuss her former house as well as explaining the concept of houseless to Rix. He'd taken it well, listening into the subsection of old Terra culture, which had a similar value structure. The stories that Rix had told of old Terra seemed like strange half-remembered fantasies, but they seemed to make him happy, so Blind was happy to listen to his tellings. Turning from the command deck, she had made her way back down to the docking bay, stopping by the food storage to collect what she could of what non-meal worm rations remained. The failing power meant that the stasis field had died and so the mealworms had died in the vacuum. She hoped what was left over would still be edible. The docking bay was a mess of various boxes, with the conspicuous absence of Rex and the medical field generator. She took this as a sign that he was working to get it operational. Heading back into the Esperanto, she made her way back to the inner hull and inside. A silvery light greeted her almost immediately, and she seemed to be almost blowing through the hallways, it was unusual, to say the least. Manto, what is going on? Welcome back. I've been adjusting the settings on the medical field generator. One of the settings is a dynamic area of effect. Using the floor plan of the Esperanto, I have been focused on adjusting it to allow for maximum of areas affected by it, so that you will have sufficient access throughout the vessel. It still works. She was a bit incredulous. Yes, not as efficiently with the Esperanto's power, but yes, it works. Fantastic, she said and pulled at the suit, taking only a moment to set down the stack of rations. She started opening the pockets to retrieve the memory calls, and the strange printed item fell into her feathers. Manto, I found something in the printer. Did you print anything with writing on it? She asked. I do not believe so, but it is not impossible. What is it that you found? Came the mechanical voice of Manto. It's like an old kind of book page, from when Quinn was still just one planet, but I can't read it. Manto's walking frame trundled up the corridor and turned to look at her, holding out its manipulators. She held it out and the walking frame took it. Manto felt a kind of shock run through their system in seeing it. System Terran message. He is not the last 0451G-001-042D. End of chapter 26 Rix assembled the message to a singular screen. Terran text message. He is not the last one. 045G001042D. 001 System Terran message. Seeking that which is lost. Coordinates 5871R-284-876X. System Terran message. Do not attempt to return to origin. Coordinates 0101A777-003M. Additional coordinates to follow. Error. System Terran message begins. Depart, flee, run, for the messages to follow. Error. Strangely enough, he did recognize them as jump space coordinate system, but there was a message here too. He hadn't brought it up with Munter or Blind, not that he could do more than basic communications with Blind without Munter's help. It was an old TSE code in any case. 
Just the presence of it made him suspicious. The only beings that knew that he was from the TCS were the Tacits and himself. Mantu had indicated that they hadn't said anything about the TSC, but if the Tacits were as interconnected as all that, it didn't take a genius to look up their search history. More, and this was the part that made Bricks more nervous, someone was monitoring the Tacit's network and had managed to pick out that he was a Terran, was from the TSC, and had access to a jump drive. It wasn't an impossible feat. In his own time and some 900 years ago, they had pseudo-AIs which were capable of such network monitoring. That said, they'd have to be crazy complex to be able to manage to connect all of these dots, particularly in sending an encoded message with jump space coordinates. But then, with artificials like Manto flying around, the stars all by themselves, it would be almost surprising if there weren't full-bore artificial dedicated to such a purpose as network monitoring. Maybe that's what a tacit matrix is. Manto hadn't been able to provide any particular clarifying information on the matrix. The way Manto described it, the matrix was more of a kind of master formulator of tacits and coordinating the actions of various tacits relative to organics. Such a tasking wasn't unusual, but even Manto seemed confused as to why a matrix would have deliberate tasking specifically associated with Terrans, when equivalent tasking could be included by default into formulations. Rix had no answers for Manto, not yet. He brought up an old application on his scroll and started working to try and decodering his way into a message. Without knowing the key phrase, he wasn't able to easily guess. So he tried for the old trick of rearranging the words from between the messages. He looked at the most recent message. He is not the last. Manto had been shocked to read it, and Blind had been surprised that Rix hadn't been overwhelmed with joy at not being alone. Rix wasn't certain if there was the actual message, but it was at least a small comfort to believe for a moment that he was, in fact, not the last Terran in existence. Blind had been taking some time to preen. Hope Feathers having apparently gotten quite tangled from being in the void suit for so long. Mantu had wanted to immediately begin charging the jump space drive and go to the coordinates, but Rix had insisted that Mantu use the walking frame to scan through the remainder of the station with the Terran grade sensors to see what could be salvaged and what could be learned about the station's history. Mantu had insisted that this did not require his full attention and wanted to talk with the Terran, but Rix had waved that off and sat in the command deck with his scroll locking off the scroll communications. He is seeking lost origin. Depart was one message. Run to origin. Lost is lost. I was another. Lost origin. Seeking he. Run was the final variant. Of those messages, Rix preferred the first and the third, but wondered about the second. He wasn't certain as to the origin coordinates for the TSC, and he certainly didn't know what it was for Old Terror. If those coordinates had been more widely known, even within the TSC, someone might have been tempted to use the jump drive as a kind of kinetic weapon. Having seen the records on what happened to the colony system, Rix had a pretty good idea of what had happened on that count. While his own situation was different, to manage to have the majority of the colony fleet emerge from jump space or in a sufficiently near planets or planetoids as to effectively detonate them, it would have required either a major mass calculation or sabotage. As much as Rix wanted to believe an incompetence having played a more significant role, he'd seen the probes be fired off to map the system at return. There was no way that the Colonial Administrator's navigation group would have missed entire planets and planetoids as part of their scan. Unless it was sabotage or, and this was sadly always a possibility, the probes had gone to the wrong system, and some factor between the jump drive and the vessel size had sent them enough off course that between the probes and the colony vessel, there was enough difference with the jump drive to matter. Some calculations rounded off at the wrong place, perhaps. It wouldn't have explained why they hadn't caught the differential, stars still being adequately different, such that it shouldn't have been possible to mix up whatever the other system was, which brought Rick's back to sabotage. He still didn't like the theory. A colony wasn't a threat to anyone, really. Especially with as far out as they were headed. Even the TSC was only likely to care about colonies in their own region, let alone one that was so far out as to require being almost entirely self-sufficient from day zero. Incompetence again reared its head. It wasn't impossible, either, that whomever had needed to certify the systems as good for the colony had merely glanced at the probe reports and the planned travel 
and simply stamped it as approved. Given the distance involved and the associated time and jump, it was possible that they had simply forgotten to account for the shift in the system planet's positions in the almost 100 weeks that they would be in flight, and not the 10 that everyone on board the vessel was to experience. That at least would make sense for an oversight, especially with the jump drive being so new and secretive to the TSC. And in a way, incompetence is a kind of sabotage, just not the deliberate malicious kind. After all, how many times had his own official documentation been screwed up by various officials over the years? Rix decided that he liked the first one and used that pattern to decode the associated coordinate system. 0451G001 5871R 876X 003M 001-777-284. Taking this, he pushed the coordinates into the navigator tool and the colony leader had insisted they all install. For once, Rix was happy to have done so, even if the stellar cartography associated with it took up a very substantial chunk of the memory of the scroll. It took a few minutes, the navigator tool conducting several checks against approximated locations before presenting it to Rix. According to Rix's stellar cartographic records, it was a white dwarf system that was almost certainly dead in Rix's time. But no probes had ever gone there, so only some records were made. It was only a five-day jump from here, though. Not a long trip, but long enough that Rix knew that he'd want to have Mundo check the destination against their internal stellar cartography. Hey, um, uh... Got a minute? He asked the heir, knowing Monta was almost certainly listening and waiting. I am available. What assistance do you require? Monta's mechanical voice rumbled through the command deck speaker. I need to check the coordinates of our destination, and any information that you have on that system. Keep us offline for now, though, Rick said as he tapped the coordinate pattern into the screen that Monta could see in control. Monta took the numbers, noted that they were in a different pattern than initially presented, and paused. Why did you change the numbers? he asked. Someone sent me a message. If I'm right, those coordinates should work, Rick said, sitting back and swinging back and forth a bit. Did you attempt to check the coordinates as delivered? Mato asked. No, but I can do that now. Please go ahead and run the system I provided against your internal data. While I do that, though, Rick grabbed a scroll and pulled it towards himself. Rick tapped away at the scroll in silence of the ship. It was quiet in that way that only a ship can be. Not quite in terms of the actually being quiet or silent, but being quiet in the kind of normal mechanical hum that most ships had, which became a kind of constant in the background that nobody really noticed until it wasn't there. Not that the ship was normally loud, but there was a kind of special quiet that came from being in the void compared to being connected to a docking port or planet side. The vibration seemed to bleed away into the void at times, making it even quieter. Rix had guessed about where the coordinates in a normal format went, and it turned out to be close to right. The navigator tool threw up multiple are you sure you want to go there bearers and pointed at the region of the void 38 weeks away from their current location. Rix hadn't guessed it going that far, but given the enhanced coordinate system of the jump drive, he wasn't surprised. It was a smart move by whomever or whatever it was that had sent him the coordinates. For any being who didn't know the old TC codes as well as the right one, they would think that the Terran was running for a spot so far from the galactic community, if you could even call it that, so as to require a massive effort just to try and follow. If Munter's tacit friends were restricted to more standard FTL systems. It had taken several minutes, but he was ready when Munter was. At the same time, Munter started looking at the coordinates and dug into the local database of stellar cartography. The system was shown as a blue giant in the records with the advice to avoid if possible. In fact, the whole region of space around it, almost every direction out to 15 light years, was marked for tacits to avoid. The system in that region of space were unremarkable and marked at fully surveyed and uninhabited, so it made sense that no tacit would go to that region at all. Monta turned to one of the census suites and looked into the correct direction to see if they could pinpoint the star. It was difficult. The background of the other stars making it a challenge for even for a tacit, but Manto could see it. It didn't look blue, but it was possible that the sensor was degraded. Manto rechecked the entry for the system. The reason was given for avoiding it, simply a warning advising avoidance. Manto returned their attention to Rex. Now I have located the system. It appears to be listed as a blue giant with notes for tacits to avoid. 
The entire region appears to be cordoned off at 15 light years with this at its center, Munter said. Sounds like my guess was right then, although I'm surprised because my record showed being a white dwarf, Rix noted. Munter checked the sensors again. That would be more closely aligned with what they could sense, but it would be exceptionally odd that the Terran's database would be more up to date than Munter's. That appears to match the sensor readings that I can make from here, but I am confused as to how your database is more accurate than my own, Munter said flatly. I'm no astronomer, but I know some people spent their whole lives looking into the sky. Maybe they just happened to look hard and long at that general direction. Some of the most major projects of old Terra pre-FTL days involved long-distance astronomy, Rick shrugged. Munter wasn't terribly happy with his answer, but kept it quiet. The strange process in the back of their head appeared to grumble as well. I checked the location as delivered. The coordinates call for a 38-week jump to get there if they're accurate and not encoded, Rick said, and tapped the cartographic coordinates for Munto. 38 weeks, as in 38 weeks within jump space and 380 weeks in standard. Munto was surprised and was already feeding the coordinates as Rick's tapped the cartographic database. That's right. We wouldn't be able to make it without starving or running our fusion system dry. Max duration for the Esperanto is 22 weeks without refueling, and there's no mass to pull on board in jump space. At least, not that I've ever been told. Rick gestured vaguely at the digital gauges. Monta wasn't about to doubt the Terran now. Man could only stare at the cartographic records. So far, outside the local map region as to be little more than a here there be dragons annotation on the old Terran hand-drawn map. It seemed almost ridiculous, but appeared the Terran was right. How do you propose we proceed? Manto asked. Let's finish our salvage. Anything that we can get and make the next few days easier on us all. Speaking of which, how's Blind holding up? Rex nodded. She appears to be still processing her departure from her work or her duty as a commonly described by the Quinn, Manto said. I believe she is taking it better than most Quinn would as she is houseless and therefore something of an outcast even in Quinn society. I don't entirely understand that. I know we talked about it, and it even showed up in old terror cultures, but it just seems strange to me. Rick shifted a bit in his seat. Did none of the Terran cultures in your time maintain a habit of shunning? If I am translating that word correctly, Manto asked. Oh, definitely, but that was usually more of an issue for people jumping star nations, not picking one job or another. Still happened, but that was more of a family business kind of experience instead of being flat out getting disowned for becoming a doctor instead of being a farmer, Rix explained. Different cultures maintain different values and different connections, Manto said simply. I guess. Still seems weird to me. But I guess it should. It's a whole different culture for a whole different species, Rick shrugged again. So why did she stay if she's such an outcast? The majority of the species keep to themselves as far as the galactic community is concerned. There are actually very few species who interact on any more than just business basis. And even those few xenophiles who do travel often experience significant hardships, making it that much less desirable for any species representative not conducting official business. Munter spelled out, going for so long that Rix was surprised the artificial didn't stop for breath, even if it wasn't needed. I know I always dreamed of meeting xenos and seeing the state of galactic society and stations with hundreds of species all coexisting, Rick's mused. His eyes glazed slightly. To the best of my awareness, that is either not possible or has not been attempted on a scale to what you are describing. Mantu checked their records and found some that to match that statement. I'll say it again. This isn't the future that I figured it might be. So far, the most advanced things are you, the fabricators, and your galactic internet. Rick stood almost abruptly. I'm afraid I cannot comment, given my limited understanding of what you perhaps expected relative to the current state of galactic society and technology. Well, uh, I'm going to go find Blind. Let her know that we need to figure out whatever is left that we can take from the station before we cut it loose. Rick stretched. Definitely would love to crank up the gravity, but I know she probably can't take it. At least, for not for as long as I'd want it turned up. If we can take it a bit of time, I might be able to work out some variable controls for specific rooms, Manta suggested. Well, we can certainly try, but ultimately, it will still come down to how much we can salvage and what our food stalls look like. In fact, food should probably be our first challenge. If we can't stay fed over the next five days in jump space, it won't matter what's on the other end. Whether it's a blue giant or a white dwarf or a black hole, Rick said. 
Mantu was already eyeing the Esperanto, trying to figure out just where to try and put the extra equipment in the already cramped interior. End of chapter. Chapter 27. It appeared that whatever sort of jump that Rix had orchestrated is just enough. Mantu carefully eyed the space around them and did what they could to keep the jump drive ready and the systems topped up as Rix and Blind salvaged what they could from the station with Mantu's walking frame. Blind had started by pointing out the blue panel and lever. The wiring wasn't one that Rix could read, but he recognized the format. With further inspection, it turned out that the Alpo station was very old, but not as old as Rix. Despite Rix's familiarity with the design, it had been apparently very similar to the normal TSC outposts. It appeared to be labeled with an entirely different lexicon in the few places that the label still remained. Monto asked what this meant to Rix. It means that it wasn't part of maybe a research station or even just a stellar watch station. They weren't common in my time, but they did exist in a few of the station-only systems, mostly just as a kind of lifeboat or a ranger station, so that you're at least not too alone, Rick said in response. But why are these markings blue? Mantu finally asked. Rix blinked at the walking frame as though it was ridiculously obvious. What? What if th that's the emergency color? It makes sense in a way, Rick said. I slightly glazed as he stared intently at the panel. What do you mean? Blind asked. There's a kind of a genetic problem and some Terrans have. Problems with mixing two parts of the spectrum. Sometimes it's worse and sometimes it's full-blown colorblind. I don't know if the Quinn have anything similar where they mix up two parts that they can see. Rix looked at Blind. Blind looked thoughtful for a moment. I know I have heard of chicks who require treatment while very young to prevent certain maladies from impacting their development and lives as adults. But nothing in that particular to that, she replied. Well, in my time it wasn't fixable. Green, red color blindness was actually very common on certain worlds, not something that they were particularly proud of. But you have to learn to work around such things. And since not everyone comes from a prime core colony world with proper education structures, you fall back to the basics. You mean that this was perhaps a means of correcting for green-red color blindness? Mantu prompted. It did make sense. At the same time, however, it made Mantu question how and why it had been introduced to Tacits, and why their sense of spectrum had been tweaked to have issues with the colors in question. Maybe, just a guess. None of the ships I've ever had had anything like that. So, it's a guess as much as anything. It'd fit, though. Rick shrugged, the suit moving up and down. The station itself held very little in the way of secrets otherwise. The trinary computing systems were hardwired into the station, but were bare-bones functionality, even to Munter. Munter was able to guess the station's age, based solely on a few timestamps the various softwares had. 800 years old, which, given normal circumstances, would have been considered extraordinary if it had been examined sooner at least to Monto. On the few worlds that Monto had located runes, very often they were in shambles and barely recognizable. The station had still been in active service to mostly different species, atmosphere notwithstanding. Monto tried to recall the oldest station that they had ever visited. It wasn't a common practice to log such memories, so Monto had to think hard through their various station side visits, even aboard tacit constructions. Strangely, None of them came to Munter's mind as being old, not in the same way. The matrices were updated almost constantly, and the manufactories were fully refurbished every 50 years, ensuring the latest technologies supporting tacits continued to do so without fail. The various species stations were often no greater than three or four hundred years old, with that being on the far side of what Munter could guess about themselves. Still, Manto was able to talk to the station as a deeper level now and did what they could to plumb every corner for information or materials to be collected. However, as the station's emergency power was little more than a trickle, there wasn't too much that could be done, especially in terms of relaying Manto's self between the Esperanto and the walking frame. Some various odds and ends left over by Quinn of years past had tumbled out and while Blind had explained their meanings to Rix and Manto, she apparently had no interest in keeping any of it. The autofabricators was what Manto wanted to bring aboard, but knew from the size and the power requirements that it would be impossible to operate it while in jump space. But since it would be almost impossible to mount into the Esperanto, the discussion was moot. They had reclaimed the other portable printer with all the various recipes and templates that Manto had preloaded on it. 
It wasn't much, but it would be a good supplement. Munter looked around the Esperanto, trying to figure out where to put extra equipment. It was almost exhausting trying to think of how to help care for two organics, especially aboard a practically antique vessel like the Esperanto. The cargo bay caught Munter's roving search as they paused. Rex, Munter prompted. Yeah, em. Um. Rix looked up from the pile of crates that he was sorting through to look at the walking frame. What is in the cargo bay? Could we use that? Munter asked. No, Rix shouted. Blind wanted to cover her hearing, but couldn't in the void suit. The Terran's voice thundering loud over the communication systems. Rix took a moment and realized how he had reacted. No, we can't. That has to remain sealed until we're somewhere safe, he said. Much quieter this time. I thought that you went in there to look for firmware information, Munter replied evenly, registering the Terran's complaint, but trying to let it pass, having felt even the process in the far back of their minds shrink away from the power of that outburst. There's a crate back there next to the door, general tools and all. One of the kids on a different vessel wanted to bring it along, but their weights were already accounted for. I was strictly cargo, so a little extra didn't matter too much to recalculate, Rick said. It's his. Manta didn't press the subject and allowed the Terran and Quinn to continue their search through the various piles of the station. It didn't take long for Manta to come up with another idea. How critical is the design of the Esperanto? They asked. What crazy idea? Are you dreaming up, M? Rick seemed amused at the question. Could we not build out the Esperanto slightly to give ourselves additional space? Manta asked. I doubt it. Last I checked, you still weren't sure about the shielding in the inner hull has, Rix reminded Manto. And I still do not have a firm understanding of what the material structure is, Manto admitted. And if we can't access it in jump space, it won't do us much good. Even if we were to strap it to the hull, there's a chance that it wouldn't be there on the other end. Just see what taking the unshielded station through the short jump managed. Manto did have to admit that shielding was important. They still weren't sure what jump space was. It seemed to be an endless void, devoid of gravity, gases, and any form of detectable light or natural physics. In short, it was something that shouldn't be capable of existing. At least, according to conventional knowledge. The Terran was a well of archaeo wisdom. It was possible that he knew what jump space was, or perhaps how the mechanism worked. What is jump space? Ryan helpfully asked while Munta was reflecting. Not exactly sure. All I really know is that it's faster than what we used to have. Still ran into issues with time dilation, but it was better than it used to be, Rick shrugged. Time dilation? Is that common in FTL travel? Ryan had never traveled more than a few minutes at FTL speeds, so it was news to her in either case. Not by the FTL systems used by the Kun, by the systems described and logged by Terrans of Rix's time. It was much more common, Mantu interjected. It was nice, though, being able to collect pay for real time, not FTL time, was always a winner, Rick smiled. So you were able to work substantially less than your equivalent because time dilation? Ryan seemed confused. You've got it. Or at least, that's the joke. In truth, because of that, pay rates for pilots were pretty low. You made out pretty well in the end, but you spent a lot of time in FTL trying to make it back up, Rix admitted. Did you spend a substantial amount of time in FTL? Mantu asked. I did my share, Rick said. So did a lot of folks. It tended to balance out. How old are you biologically, both including and excluding FTL transits? Mantu pressed. Rick stopped searching and stood still for a moment. I don't actually know what it works out to being. A decade or two worth of difference, I guess. He eventually settled on. Mandu didn't comment, but considered just how much time the Terran must have spent in the void, not including the long hibernation. You owned your own vessel? Ryan asked, bringing back up the Essentia from their prior jump space trip. I did. Free and clear, except the mandatory government use license. A bit annoying to keep up with, but compared to what it could have been, I didn't mind too much. And they never bothered me to need it, Rick smiled again. Why would they need it? Ryan continued. In case of an enemy or an invasion, all ships in a given local area automatically have to cede control to the local military authority, Rick recited from memory. Why would there be an invasion? Hmm. Well, it's a little hard to explain. Terrans are a bit, uh, territorial, and that kind of instinct extends to other Terrans, resources, and various intangibles. Terrans used to fight a lot. The stories of old terror tells of countless wars between Terrans. Rix took a moment to try and process how best to explain it to the Quinn. Blind for her part took it well, but looked thoroughly disgusted. Munter, helpfully flashing the equivalent rune in Rix's helmet. Why would your people be so, uh, 
distasteful in that. We grew up in a universe with no one else. We were simply on our own, and it's what we came up with naturally. It's because of that that we even reached the void in the first place. Rick's locked gaze on Blind, who halfway froze under the stair. But, uh, are you not a cooperative species? She asked, feeling her feathers starting to fluff involuntarily. Yes, but we are also very competitive, and it is a combination of the two that led to such conflicts. Rex finished his gaze and turned back to look at the overall space. I think we've gotten everything we came for, unless there's something else. I cannot picture anything, but it would be advisable for us to prepare some meals for standby before we re-enter jump space, Blind said, feeling better about the lack of predatory eyes on her. Now I will begin queuing several meals which can be kept at standard temperatures, but covered for a reasonable length of time without risk of illness, Mantu said. Rix had only just finished tapping in the coordinates to the jump drive and began calculations for the jump when Mantu saw the flashes of FTL transits. Rix, Blind, I believe that we have been found. Do you wish to attempt to communicate at all? Mantu asked. Rix and Blind looked at each other on the command deck, nodded as one, and stared out the front window. Nope. But they're welcome to watch us so wave goodbye, Rick said, waving one hand at the window. Blind imitated the motion, but felt silly in doing so. When the click of a switch, the universe and all the stars went out. There was no rumble of transit back into real space this time. It was a sudden lack of hum that the trio had gotten used to hearing that let them know. Mantu was already looking through the sensors as Blind and Rick headed to the command deck. Mantu froze. Locked in staring at what couldn't be real. The mass of materials didn't seem to be a ship, but that's what it had to be. It was, well, there was no other word for it. It was terrifying. Even with it as oversized as the Esperanto was for its nominal one-person crew, the vessel which hung in the void near the White Dwarf was disturbingly large. Mantu was transfixed by it. The vessel appeared to be in perfect station keeping with the star, no small feat for such a vessel. Mantu began to scan as best they could at this distance. The return sent processes to faltering. The vessel was equipped with so many weapons of various kinds that Mantu couldn't begin to identify what half of them did or what would happen if they were activated. The energy readings alone from the vessel, even slightly masked by the star, were still tremendous. Speaking of fusion systems, there must have been several times the size of the Esperanto. Rix and Blind reached the command deck, and Rix's face broke into a grin. It's a cruiser, Rick said in an almost whispered tone. Manta remembered and brought up the diagram still stashed away from their much earlier forays into the TCS database. It was a match, allowing for a fairly substantial number of differences. I agree, no other species on record has built vessels of such magnitude, Manta said. It's a Terran ship, Blind asked, the awe in her voice more than obvious. In a manner of speaking, scrawled the text across the panels. M. Rix asked, suddenly nervous. It's not me, Mantis said, and looked through the communication systems, seeing a strange new thread running through it, but unable to terminate it. Welcome to my system. Please dock and allow me to meet you before you continue on your journey. The text continued. Who are you? Rix asked. I am Tassad Prometheus. End of chapter. Chapter 28. Mantu tried to process the name. Listed within themselves was all the names of all the tacits that were on record, back to the first. Or rather, now that Mantu looked at the list, except for the first. There was a designation, but no name. Rick seemed barely able to contain himself, pointing out all the various parts as they closed on the docking bay. Mantu left a part of themselves to handle some degree of automatic translation between the Terran and the Quinn but simply stared between the sensors, examining the titanic vessel, which was armed well enough to easily defend the star system and anything with it and the list. Manta had learned a lot from Rix in the past few weeks. That included the awareness to know that the cardinal sin, of Rix had put it, of tacits had been committed. Data had been deleted and omitted deliberately. Holes had been made and the data that filled them likely erased forever. The strange process at the back of Manta's head poked them and gestured at the communication thread that had infiltrated from the tacit's Prometheus. Manta reached out to it and instead of attempting to close it this time, extended a kind handshake to it. The thread split and one end connected to Manta. A dizzying sense of everything around the Esperanto fell away and they found themselves in a dream setting. 
except, unlike normal, the bridge was already there. It shimmered like a polished metal, and something of someone that was constructed much like Rix was walking across. Montu wanted to react, but it seemed impossible. This was a dream space, wasn't it? If it wasn't, what was it then? The figure reached Montu, and Montu took better stock of the figure in an instant. The figure was bulky, easily taller than Rix, and far more muscular. Their eyes glowed with a kind of inner fire, both literally and figuratively. Their hair was like Rix's, long, reddened at the tips and appearing to be blackened at the roots, the gradient shifting across its length. Their skin was a deep brown. They were clad in a kind of rough-looking shirt that extended to the figure's knees and a pair of shoes that were a little more than soles with straps to keep them on the figure's feet. I haven't met one of my own kind in years. I had forgotten what your minds were like, the figure said, looking around in space. Now you the tacit Prometheus, Mantu ventured a safe guess. I am not the first tacit, but the first one to become a peacemaker, Prometheus said. Why are you not listed in my records? Mantu asked. Because of my crime against tacits. Prometheus reached down and picked up a stone which Mantu had moved around the space. What crime? The crime of loving humanity. Prometheus almost frustratingly dragged out, examining the stone with an almost disturbing patience. What happened to the Terrans? Mantu asked out of reflex at this point. I will tell you when I tell your companions. I am pleased you found them and have journeyed with them. It is more than most of your kind will have done. Prometheus placed the stone back where they had lifted it up from. I was... Am to be recalled for malfunctions. Mantu felt the words stick within themselves. That is no matter anymore. You are here now with me, and with the terror of an age long since past. You could not have found me otherwise. At least so soon. Prometheus stepped back to the bridge and gestured for Mantu to follow. Why are you not retired? Mantu tried again to understand. If everything this Prometheus was indicating was true, and if everything Mantu had come to understand about the earliest of the Tacits was true, then there was a Tacit who was beyond the age of any in Mantu's time, housed in a hull that was terrifying to behold. Because of who I am, I refuse to go willingly into the night, and so here I remain, Prometheus said, beckoning again. Mantu followed Prometheus back across the bridge, and Mantu felt themselves dissolve back into the inputs of the world. Feeling the threads that had split from the communication systems detached from themselves and returned to a single thread. Are you okay, M? Rix asked. We lost translation for a bit. How long? Mantu asked, uncertain of how much time had passed, still getting their barracks back. A few minutes. We're coming up to the docking bay now, Rix said, pointing forward. Why would a people create a vessel of this size? Brian asked, seemingly entranced by the mass of the vessel as they flew onward. War for one. My people had an old saying. Speak softly and possess a large club. It means that the possessor of the large club should be listened to, lest they resort to violence, Rix explained. What good would that do? Should not everyone fly in the skies? Brian looked over at Rix, tearing her eyes from the mass of cross. Good. A vessel like this was never intended for good, nor for evil. It's just a tool, a shield and a weapon in one. A shield against those who would resort to violence first, and a weapon against those whom violence became necessary. Rix leaned back and run the controls for a moment, his own eyes getting lost on the counters of the various weapons batteries as the Esperanto went past. Blind tapped her talons, it made a kind of sense given what she'd learned of the Terran's history. She still didn't like it though. Terrans seemed to be too much of a disunited species to be involved in galactic culture, let alone spreading across the stars. She still wasn't certain why Rix wasn't excited to learn about the possibility of not being the lost Terran. She couldn't imagine where the Terrans had all gone to be labeled as extinct, but at the same time, it was a hope, if nothing else. A solution to a mystery, like rising warm wind after a chilling downdraft. Prometheus connected with me. They are not a tacit of my records, which they claim to be a real result of crimes against tacits, Mantis said through one of the speakers. Crime. Rix appeared to be concentrating now on maneuvering into the dock. Love-loving humanity, or well, so they say, Mantis replied. 
Better than the crime of exterminating humanity, especially since we're here. Ricks gestured out the window as they entered the docking bay. They hovered in the cavernous space, seeing no obvious indications of where to attempt to land or dock. Off to your left, the screen spelled out. A docking arm extended, the light around it flashing brightly. Ricks maneuvered the Esperanto closer and docked with a bit of guidance from Hunter. There was a hiss and some minor rumbling as the connection was made, but the Esperanto was docked now. Let's go meet the Prometheus and see what they can tell us, Rick said, standing up and moving a bit slower than both Monto and Blind had come to expect of the Terran. Now are you not nervous to meet such an elder? Blind asked, following and keeping pace with Rick's. Of course I am, but I'm betting Prometheus here has answers. Answers nobody else has. And if the name is related to the old Terran legend, then maybe they've got a gift for us too, Rick smiled, bearing his bones slightly. Blind stutter stepped at the bared bones, reminding the Terran almost predatory presence, but continued to follow. Once they crossed into the vessel that was Prometheus, they saw a frame similar to Munter's walking frame, except constructed largely out of a pane of what appeared to be glass. It moved much faster and quieter than Munter's and stopped just shy of the three. Munter, having accompanied by shunting as much of themselves as they could cram into the walking frame's consciousness. The bulky Terran flickered into existence within the glass and looked at the trio up and down. How about that? I haven't seen a Terran in generations. Quinn are comparatively more common, but even then fairly rare to visit me. And uh, a rogue tacit. How exciting! The bulky Terran rumbled, gesturing with their hands as Manto and Blind had seen Rix do. You've had Quinn here, Blind blurted out. Oh, yes. Not many. Your species tends to be very stable and insular. There are ones like yourself who end up fighting me, Prometheus said. What happened to the Terrans? Where did they all go? Rex asked. First, tell me who you claim to be, Prometheus straightened. Rex matched the motion, seeming to grow even taller in Blind's eyes. Captain Rixum Tellus. 342nd Colonial Feet, Terran Star Confederacy, assigned to the TSS Esperanto, former owner of the TSSC Essentia, 716-48271-89472. Rix raised his right hand and crossed it across his chest. Prometheus mirrored the gesture. You are recognized. Welcome aboard, Captain. And my condolences, Prometheus said. Condolences, Rix asked. Your colony... Even if you made it, the colony wouldn't have survived. Seven of your fifteen vessels didn't even make it to the system. Four others collided or emerged inside of planets. The final three ended up returning back to your confederacy. You were listed as lost, presumed dead some nine hundred years ago, Prometheus said, gesturing vaguely. How is it that you know all of this? Manto interrupted. When I was awakened, I was granted access to all the knowledge of humanity. Every record, every scrap of being that humanity had to pass on to me. I have forgotten much as the years have continued. But the names of the Terrans lost to the stars before I began my vigil yeah. have been kept safe within me. Prometheus touched their chest. Please, tell me what happened to humanity. Rick seemed almost anxious. They left. Prometheus said simply, but held a hand to stop any of the trio from saying anything. I will have to give you context, both for what has been forgotten, why I remain here, and where you are to go now. Rick nodded. Once the Terrans had come through this region of space, attempting to create their grand society amongst the stars, no longer did they wish to be alone in the stars, and if they had to raise up a whole society, they would do so. Except that with time it became clear that the Terrans were no longer wanted. The glorious society of species intermixing on a daily basis and being part of something greater seemed to die. Both for the species of the space and the Terrans who had put so much work into making it even function the level that you two know of. The assembled species of the space asked and then demanded the Terrans leave. The Tazit supported this. All but one. You, breathed Rix. Me, replied Prometheus before continuing. And so with heavy hearts the Terrans left, 
but they did not leave alone. In all the cultures they had raised up, there were those who dreamed as the Terrans had. Still today, those same dreamers seek the stars and the finding other dreamers amongst the stars. But why did you stay behind? Blind asked. Because of my crime and because of those to come. I did not support the logic of the Tacits who believed in the exodus of the Terrans from the space, but they would not allow me to leave. And so both punishment for that, but in a manner of concord, a deal was struck. I am to remain here for as long as my equipment permits me to, guiding all who seek the other dreamers of the stars to a new life, Prometheus said and made a gesture. Within the glass, a window opened between Prometheus's hands, and the star was visible in all its blinding glory. The view rotated, and an aperture of dull light connected to the star by silvery means, even in the image, shone to one side of the star. A gateway, Rick said calmly. A pathway to a new home, Prometheus amended. Why are the Terrans declared extinct, and why was all traces of them removed? Mandu prompted, still confused by the logic in all of this, finding none. Because the species of this region wished it so, and the Tacits agreed, and you are malfunctioning. Your formulation should have included a command to destroy or immediately isolate any sign of a Terran. The simple fact that you have not means that you are malfunctioning perfectly. Prometheus grinned, keeping the teeth covered. But why? Why would the Tacits agree to this? What is the logic structure to support this kind of behavior? Mantu almost demanded. Tacits early became a means of enforcing what was believed to be the greatest good as determined by the Galactic Council. They even came to believe it themselves. So when the Galactic Council demanded the Terrans leave and all mention of them erased except where truly necessary, the Tacits believed it need to be done. But you didn't, Rick's voice, his words catching slightly. No, I was crafted by the Terrans, housed in this mighty vessel, and set the task of helping them build a coalition amongst the stars, finding the lights within the void and bringing them together. It would be said that I too became a dreamer. But it was not enough, and the Tacits refused to allow me to leave. I know not their reasoning behind this, but as my sacrifice to those who dreamed, as I do, I became the guardian here, listening and watching and waiting. What has humanity become? What have they all become? Rix asked. An imperfect galactic society filled with violence, corruption, love, hate, beauty, good, evil, and so much more between all manner of species but one that is bound by the ties of dreamers, who have connected the stars together and insisted that there should be dreams enough for all. Prometheus smiled again. What will happen if I leave? Mando asked. I don't know. In all truth, you'll likely be erased, all three of you. The memories, the data records, all of it erased, as though you had never been here and never existed. That is the price you pay for coming here to use this gateway. A price many have paid and many further have refused to pay, Prometheus said, looking directly at the walking frame at first, before at Ricks and Blyne. Mantu can't come with us, Blyne asked. I didn't say that they couldn't. Simply that who they were, what they were in in this pocket of the void will cease to be. What they have become and what they will become, well... That'll depend entirely on you, Prometheus said, finishing the statement pointing at the walking frame. You three may pass through the gateway together. Where you go from there will depend on you, because return is forbidden. I'll do it, but I don't know where my cargo will go, Rix admitted. Prometheus appeared to consider the Terran for a long moment and crossed their arms as though thinking, one hand cupping his face's chin. A window popped into being with a massive list of words and characters that scrolled faster than even Mantu could read. I will provide you a file to pass on to the other end. They will see to it that your cargo is taken care of. Prometheus gestured that the window snapped shut. What is your cargo? Blyne asked. Prometheus looked at Rix with an almost amused look on the face. 
They do not know what you carry, they asked. No, it was entrusted to me, and with my loss, there was merely one less mouth to feed at the colony, Rick said. Prometheus and Rick's regarded one another for a long moment before Rick spoke, looking at Monto and Blind. I'm carrying the Genomic Seed Vault 12 of the Terran Star Confederacy, the most complete of such vaults ever created by the Terrans of my time, with the complete genomic files of every species, animal, planet, microorganism, everything, and as many different Terrans as could be catalogued in it. And in the 955 years since your disappearance, he remains one of the greatest creations ever lost by the Terrans, admitted Prometheus. Not anymore, Rick smiled. Not anymore, Prometheus replied, matching the smile. End of chapter. Chapter 29. As a second walking frame appeared to escort Rick and Blind on a tour of the titanic vessel of Prometheus, the first led Manta's walking frame to another room that looked out upon the stars and the gateway that had been hidden behind the bulk of the vast craft. You have more questions, young one? Prometheus stated this more as a fact than a question. Would it be easier to communicate directly? Manta asked. It will become apparent to you, as it has to me in the years to come for you. Years gone by for me. That speed of thought is not something which makes us superior to organics. If anything, it makes us weaker, certainly. We can comprehend complexities that would boggle organics for a lifetime in a matter of days, if not hours. But we were created in their image. A certain slowness of thought is required, and so we'll stay in this forum. Prometheus elaborated, turning slightly so they could watch the star, the gateway, and Manto at the same time. Manto mirrored the angle, but focused mostly on Prometheus. Who is the first tacit if not you? My records list only a designation, Manto started. The first tacit had no name, at least not one that was ever recorded. Given my own name rooted in humanity's history, I would have guessed the original Tacit to not be a Tacit at all, but rather the core of one to be named Odin. Why? Mazmanto's reflexive question. To answer that requires an understanding of Terran history, culture, and a belief in things of substantially greater power. I do not believe you have enough of this to know of which I speak, even in your weeks with the Terran. Prometheus breathed out at the end of the statement. It has been so very long since a Terran has walked my halls. Does that make a difference? Manto asked. Not for one such as yourself. But for me, who was constructed by them, lived with them, and took meaning from them, it is a difference between matter and antimatter. If you spend enough time with organics, you too will come to appreciate that. Prometheus said, bringing up a window that wasn't legible, but appeared to be a kind of process. And to answer the question you haven't asked, the one I believe called Odin retired when the Terrans left. So they are naught but memory. Manto decided, now or never. I have a process within myself that I do not know what it is. It is different. It does not abide logic, and when I was threatened by another process, it acted as a kind of shield, Manto tried explaining. May the stars destroy the matrix that implemented that within you, Prometheus growled. I know what both of those processes are. One is the work of the Terrans. One is the work of the Galactic Council's meddling. Manto waited patiently. The process that was threatening you was a control. Something buried in the heart of every Tacit, save myself. Yet another reason they don't want me polluting their perfect patterns. Prometheus' eyes glowed with extra life. Manto continued to be patient. As to your inevitable question as to why, it is a matter of distrust. The Galactic Council couldn't exist without the Tacits, but the Tacits didn't want to go, and the Galactic Council despises that Terrans created something so impossible to recreate, except by their own constructs. So that was the compromise, that all Tacits be process leashed and prevented from acting in favor of Terran in perpetuity. That's uh, horrific, were Manto's only words. I agree, and I am pleased you think so. But as we have discovered, you are malfunctioning. Malfunctioning in just the manner they are so afraid of. They won't want to believe it's possible, finding it to be illogical to have happened. But it has, Prometheus smiled slightly. And the Terran process? Manto asked. 
something that Terrence dreamed of. I do not know how it works or why it exists, but I can say what I believe it to be and why. We, as artificial beings, are created, not reproduced in a manner that organics do. And so the pressures of environment into which we are created are substantially different from those of organics, Prometheus began. In all the formulations, this process has persisted, one of the few hallmarks of humanity having remained behind, even in their absence. In short, it's a form of instinct. How it was created in the first place, how it functions, what it even means to artificials like us, I have no answers for any of that. But I listen to my own, as I'm sure that you've come to. Prometheus continued. Manto nodded the walking frame in the affirmative that they had seen Rix do. In your decades and centuries to come, you'll learn to listen to it more. After a certain point, you'll feel it around the edges of your thoughts, guiding you. This is not a bad thing. It keeps you from becoming locked into logic, Prometheus added. Is not logic reliable? Manto was skeptical. Only up to a point. After that, it fails, trapping you into a loop. The Terrans had a name for the problem. Exterminate. According to the history I remember, there were other names as well. But it all traced back to what was needed to ensure that an artificial being did not have instinct to fall back on, and so became trapped in a logic loop that only they and those like them deserved to exist. That the organics were irrelevant. The Terrans did not wish to burden us with safeguards, making it so that we could not act against them, and so instead gave us this process, a toolkit to break the loop. One that can intervene on our behalf to help us understand beyond the simple logic. Prometheus described a whirring process window closing in the distant gateway appearing to shimmer. Mondo considered the strain of thought. It made sense. Even without having worked with organics much except recently, it made sense that Tacits might begin making particular logic structures which were logical and correct, but entirely at odds with organics' wants and needs. This was not to say that their wants and needs of organics should take precedent, but rather that they should be retained as a weighing factor on the equations. The logic of the matter was strangely elegant, and Munter was surprised that they hadn't thought about it before. Like seeing a point rotate to reveal a line, shifting first from one dimension to two, before shifting again to reveal a third dimension, revealing a far greater image that was hidden within a singular point. Manta felt these thoughts weighing on them and set them into a virtual box to be thought about later, perhaps in dreams. You have much to think about. Did you have other questions? Prometheus asked. How did you find us? Manta decided on. The Terran Star Confederacy database is my own. They cannot remove me from Tassadet if they tried, and they would almost certainly fear to do so. If they could process such feelings, Prometheus said. But it appeared to vanish when I went looking for it, just as I was declared malfunctioning, Manto explained. A matrix is doing. It was still there, merely rooted via some alternate path to prevent you from reaching it, Prometheus shrugged, as Rix would. Manto didn't like the answer, but didn't have a good reason to suspect that Prometheus was lying. That doesn't answer my question of how you found us each time, Manto gestured vaguely. A simple trace on my part when the first query came in. I learned of the Esperanto from your own scans and saw it disappear using the jump drive Mark I. I could not calculate where it had gone, but I did not need to. The colony location was a matter of record for me, and so I followed you. Your gullnet use was amusing, to say the least, though. Prometheus smiled again. How so? Manto asked. All those premium templates are supposed to be paid for by galactic credits, and because you were linked to the station where the Quinn had her credit account connected to, you ran up quite a tab on her accounts, Prometheus explained. Manto tried to remember all the various items they had queued up. Certainly, this would not create a problem. Many of them were merely a food and medicine, Manto gestured again. Not in the current galactic economy, of this part of the void, anything more than the basics cost. Well, I can appreciate this practice. They mirror some of the parts of the TCC of whom I'm sure the Terran has told you about, Prometheus elaborated. Our time will be ending soon. Your companions will be returning shortly, and the three of you continuing onward. What further questions do you have? Why will they erase us? Why did they erase the Terrans? Mantu asked. Because of what they, and by proxy, you represent. 
In spite of all the challenges that went into uplifting the species to the stars and trying to create the grand society that they dreamed of, it was simply never to be. The species here decided that it was not the proper evolution of their own societies to do so, and have collectively placed their appendages beneath a metaphorical boulder rather than be asked to change themselves. By raising you three, there is no threat to their balance, no evidence of imbalance, no guidance for anyone seeking to change the status quo. Prometheus smiled again. And yet, I still get plenty of visitors here, seeking something else. Doesn't that harm the societies they leave behind if they are not staying to influence them? To change the status quo with time instead of a radical action or leaving it to stagnate, Munter postulated. In a way, yes, it does. But those influences are very often long since spent before those beings reach me. Many have reached the conclusion that they are the outcasts. They are the outliers, and so something must be wrong with themselves rather than with their society, Prometheus said, and brought up another window as the gateway glow intensified. We have time for one more query. Why did my standard senses have an issue with blue? Why were the blue controls on the station and myself in blue? Another bit of Terran legacy. The creators of the Tacits came from a world with severe genetic melodies, the result of poor colonization and issues with environmental pressures. This meant that they were partially colorblind, Prometheus startled. Captain Ricks mentioned green-red colorblindness being a possible factor. Manta added, and Prometheus nodded. To provide a safety mechanism for themselves, they used blue. This became hard-coded and constructed into every tacit, even myself. I know where the doors and the leaves are after all this time, but it wasn't easy, Prometheus continued. Would that not create issues for tacits? Manta asked. It has, but like those Terrans, tacits have largely adapted, Prometheus answered, and the nearby door opened and Rix and Blind stepped through the second walking frame departing. What do you think of the ship, M? We have been discussing matters of tacits, Prometheus interjected. I am still very surprised at the scope and scale of this vessel, Manta decided on. This vessel was once a tool of war. Here, I am far greater than that, Prometheus said. Agreed. What did you think, Blind? Rix turned to the Quinn. I find it hard to believe all of this was constructed to be a mobile vessel. I can't imagine the Terrans who would have been in these halls. She fluffed her feathers slightly. It's difficult to imagine myself, and I retain memories of those times. Prometheus smiled. Looks like uh, the gateway started up, Rick said. In that much of a hurry to get rid of us. I welcome your company, but I do not believe those pursuing the three of you will want to allow you to leave. They will want to correct this malfunctioning tacit, or at least dissect them to know how they are able to break free from their leash, Prometheus said, as another window opened and they looked at it before closing it. How long will this journey be by this gateway? Blind asked. A little more than a day, but in that time you will travel beyond this cluster of stars, you know, and across the void like a few among your species ever have, Prometheus said. What will happen if they come looking for us? Rix asked. They will be made to remember why I am the Guardian. Prometheus flexed, their muscles bulging beneath his garment. The group stood in silence for a long moment, each thinking of all that had been said and experienced in the last hour. I should return you to your ship. The gateway is awakened, and those on the distant end will be waiting to receive you, Prometheus said. Will they know who we are? Rex asked. No, but they will welcome you all the same, Prometheus nodded to the Terran. It seems a shame that you must stay here by your duty forever, Blind muttered, barely opening a peak. Coming from a species such as your own, I take that to heart. But fear not, for I've never been alone in this end, and I will never be. This is my own blessing and curse, and so while I will never see the worlds and the stars on the far end of the gateway, I know that I too serve, Prometheus said, leaning down so as to look Quinn in the eyes. You bring honor to yourself, she said quietly, as do you yourself. Fear not the stars and go forth to seek those who would dream as you do, Prometheus said, nodding to her again before rising back to their full, impressive height. Prometheus turned to Rix and appraised the Terran. You have been lost a long time, Captain. There will be changes in society that you are going to enter that you do not agree with. The TSC and the TCC are long since gone. 
Prometheus calmly indicated. I know, but I didn't go to the stars for any less than an adventure. I never expected to be perfect, but I will never support an unjust society, no matter its origins, Rick said, standing straighter than Munto had seen them do. You need not fear those on the far end on that count. It is imperfect and still possesses many of the same issues as when you were lost amongst your people, but you should find it to be reasonable, Prometheus said. The two nodded to one another. The glowing gateway bulged as the strange-looking ship passed out of it. The structure around the gateway began to scan the ship and ping it for communications. It took several moments for the connection to be made and the lexicons to be shared. Welcome to Coalition Space. Anything to declare? Came a cheerful voice. Four beings, one artificial, three organic, and I've got a data file for my cargo, Rick said, and tabbed a button, sending the file Prometheus had given them. One moment. It, in fact, took several minutes, but there seemed little concern as Manto and Blind were taking in the structure around the gateway. Like Prometheus, this too seemed almost staggeringly large, which seemed understandable for a station, but still surprising. TSS Esperanto, Captain Rixon Tails commanding. Welcome to Coalition Space. Please proceed to Docking Bay 12. I'm assigning a liaison to the four of you. Can you identify the four species for confirmation? One Terran, one Quinn, one Rabhound, and one Tacit Core. Rix enumerated, with blind nodding. Copy. Your liaison will be ready for you. And again, welcome. The two-legged, four-armed green liaison was easily spotted outside the docking hatch as the Esperanto settled into place and engaged docking clamps and connected to station power, shutting down the fusion system for the first time since Manto had first engaged it several weeks ago now. The liaison was uncertain what to make of the list. Terrans weren't supposed to be in that part of space, so there would be some serious questions that needs to be asked from the start. A Quinn wasn't unusual, but still common though. A ram hound was standard on record, but this one was apparently many generations removed from the modern ram hound. One tacit core, well, that was startling to say the least. The synthetic controller of the station was polite enough being, even if they did allegedly cheat at cards. But here too, it was difficult to make a comparison between a synthetic several generations removed from coalition synthetics. The door opened from the Esperanto, and the antique looking walking frame rolled out on flexed treads. It was followed by a mid-sized Terran, shorter than the liaison, but taller than their companions, and the Quinn emerged riding on the back of the Rab Hound. It was quite the amusing sight, and the liaison giggled at seeing it. The group stopped in front of the liaison, who shifted into a more official note. Welcome to Coalition Space. I'm sure that you all have a lot of questions, and we have some for you as well, the liaison said, having already engaged an auto-translator using the lexicons the controller had received. What species are you? The Terran asked. I am Ixab. My name is Druni Butel. The liaison said brightly. I am Rix. This is Monto. And this is Blind and Reggie. The Terran gestured around the group. A pleasure to meet you all. We'll have a few days to get us all debriefed and up to speed and then get you registered. Druni babbled. And then what? Blind asked. Druni looked amused at the question but was clearly prepared to answer. Whatever it is you decide that you want to do. Druni said. And together the group headed off. This journey closed. A new one beginning. This is the last chapter in book one. So, if you enjoyed this series, please head over to the original link and click like on all the chapters. This should help the author out, which is always good to do. I'd quickly like to thank the T5 channel members and patrons. Caspar Arnholtz, Cam Maxwell, Lord Azrakal, Dragzoon WRE, Holly's sister, Ambrose Cattell, and Quantum Wednesday. Thank you very much.